Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to Something to Wrestle with Bruce Pritchard. Bruce, what's going on, man? How are you? Well, Conrad, it's StarCast week. How in the hell else can we be? Man, I am fired up about it. It has just been announced that not only do we add good old JR to Sunday's lineup, but we've just started to release day passes for StarCast. So by the time you're hearing this, StarCast is in full swing. And if you thought, eh, I don't know that I can really swing all four days, man, we have got you situated now at fight.tv. You can get a day pass for as little as 20 bucks. Go check it out. No way. I know. Right. So last night you and Eric Bischoff went toe to toe in the Monday night war debate. I was the moderator and you can go check it out right now at fight.tv and later tonight, Bruce. Your life is ruined forever. The roast of Bruce Pritchard. And man, I've got uh, some celebrity guests from your past and some professional comedians who are ready to roast your ass. Why do they want to roast my ass, Conrad? I'm a nice guy. I thought it would be fun. And hopefully you think it is too. Go check it out right now if you haven't already. It's fight.tv. I should mention too that uh, we had a little boo boo in last week's episode that everybody corrected us on. Actually, it was you. Because that's what no, you No, I had a boo boo. I misspoke. I, I And I even said when I talked about us, I don't know what the hell it was. But thank you to our audience who actually did the research and looked it up for me. And I, I'd commented that when we started with GPN. CW it was actually UPN that, and the WB man. network. The W W W W W B. Remember that singing frog? No. Yeah, was what was that again? Do that for me. It was a singing frog. The W W W W B. That's fucked up, man. No, I love that. How the hell could I forget that? Well, the W W W B went away and merged to the CW network, and that's where I came up with CW. So thank you guys for pointing that out to us, and uh, greatly appreciate it. And we're coming up in San Antonio, September 15th. WWE is hammering Hell in a Cell on all their programming right now, but that's not what you need to be focused on. You need to come see Bruce and I the night before September 15th tickets are available right now at brucepritchard.com you can also get all your t-shirts your autographs anything you want from Bruce Pritchard man it's available at brucepritchard.com and Bruce we have uh, just recently announced there it is get it we've got a uh, tour of Europe coming up you can check that out at ukstw.com or of course at brucepritchard.com and don't forget the rest of the shows this year, Los Angeles. How about early next year, the Royal Rumble? I don't think we've been talking about that one enough. The venue yeah. for the Royal Rumble show is like two blocks from the stadium. So you'll be able to walk there. This is an unbelievable location and stand up live. is going to make this a once in a lifetime experience because it's a super show. Everybody who's anybody is going to be on this Royal Rumble card. And of course, Bruce and I had to be involved. Our first trip through North Carolina and so much more, all available right now at brucepritchard.com. And today, Bruce, we're kicking it old school. We're going to do a watch along for SummerSlam 88. Of course, we've got tons of notes here, but man, there was a lot less information available back in 88. So we thought, why not pair it with actually watching the show? So Bruce, let's give them an old countdown here. And hopefully you've got it fired up on your end. August 29th, 1988 on the WWE network, SummerSlam 1988. Bruce, give us a countdown. All right, guys. Now remember, let the, let the first little WWE signature go and zero out on the very start of SummerSlam. And I'm going to count down. I'm going to say three, two, one play. And when I hit play, you hit play on your, uh, your little thing there. You ready to go Conrad? Yes, sir. Let's do it. Here we go in three, two, one play. And now you see the, the, the nice plane as it is just traveling along through the mountains and that nice little lake going through there. And you realize it's actually the WWF, the symbol of excellence. What the world is watching. Dude, this is my favorite open of all. This is the one I grew up on and that like music, it felt like it was very top gun and what a cool scene we've got here. Flying high atop New York City. A look at what it looked like in 1988, of course, with the Twin Towers there. And there's the most famous arena of them all, Madison Square Garden. And this was a big deal. We actually shot this. We got a guy to take us up on a plane and shoot that. You mean a helicopter? No, it was a plane. Really? Yeah, it was pretty cool. 
and uh, the music open with the mega, you see the mega power. No, well, those are actually the mega bucks. And referee against the mega powers. Man, let me tell you what was funny to me is I watched this this past week with Cassie Okia just doing some show prep, getting ready. And he lost his shit laughing that the first person, when the pay-per-view started, the first person you see is fucking Virgil. Well, yeah. It's just hilarious to us. You know, it's not Hulk Hogan. It's not Macho Man. It's not the Million Dollar Man. It's not Andre the damn giant. It's Virgil. And here we are. Uh, and and uh, they're calling it the Mecca Arena, Madison Square Garden. It's just fun to go back and do a little people watching here. And one of the things that I saw a lot of comments about when we first mentioned we were doing this show is the horrible commentary from superstar Billy Graham. Oh, come on. It would have to improve a lot to be horrible. Isn't it amazing though, that you've got some guys who are just a tremendous promo and superstar Billy Graham is certainly one of those. A lot of people would say, and you look at his like goatee here and you think, oh, Scott Steiner's ripping him off. But there were so many other people who were really borrowing from superstar Billy Graham, whether it was Jesse Ventura or Hulk Hogan, or there were so many guys who he was a big influence over. And you can actually tell, you know, when you're listening to some of his old promos, who's been influenced by him, but then you put him in this spot and it's just a miss. Why do you think that is? I don't well, because superstar was great talking about superstar superstar was not great talking about other people. And like I say, he looked great. He was, a, he was the influencer, man. He influenced so many guys in the business. It is, it's pathetic, but every, every big bodybuilder guy that you see, and then had that rap superstar, Billy Graham, he ripped it off from Muhammad Ali and everybody else ripped it off from superstar, Billy Graham, and just made it their own. Superstar was, uh, like you said, man, he was a great promo guy. Vince thought he would be great on color, uh, and he absolutely stunk. But Vince made a commitment to him, and it was my charge, make it work. God damn, work with him. Get him better. Um, but it, the problem was, one of the problems, a lot of times when you would be in Madison Square Garden or you'd be in Philadelphia, the only person that could talk to the talent was the director. And a lot of times the director was someone from uh, from their own place. So it was it was difficult to do. And uh, that shows some strength right there by Davy Boy, Davy Boy Smith lifting Matilda up. Hey, so let's talk about what we're seeing right now. We've got the Rougeaus who are already in the ring and, uh, the British Bulldogs have just come down with Matilda, as you said, and I love watching stuff from this era because so much of this is really what I grew up on. I mean, I first became introduced to wrestling after WrestleMania four, and that was the most recent pay-per-view. And this is the very first SummerSlam. I'm sure we're going to talk a lot about that in a minute, but first, you know, I can't help myself. I absolutely love the fabulous Rougeau theme music. I want you to just scroll through your Rolodex of uh, caricatures that you like to do and help me do the uh, Rougeau theme song. All American Boys? Yeah. Well, that was a Jimmy Hart deal, man. That was something that, that we came over. Just All American Boys! All American! Yeah, it was. No, come on. That was weak sauce. So I can do better well, that than was... that. That was actually how we sang it. That was me and Jimmy sitting there and trying to sing it like that, trying to show Vince what it would sound like. And it was the, it was the Rougeos that we put in the, in the studio to go and sing it. That was good shit. It was good. And it's funny because it's one of those themes. I remember all these years later. And what's great is it wasn't until very recently that I understood. I mean, obviously it's a rib because they're French Canadian or whatever, but the idea of being quote unquote, all American boys, and then carrying the tiny flags, as opposed to right. the giant flags, the tiny flag thing only dawned on me in most recent years that that was a way to get heat because they're saying they're all American, but they have these little baby flags and they're wearing the Florida de lease on their, on their trunks, on their, on their trunks and their boots. Yeah. Yeah. And speak with that strong French Canadian accent. So yeah, of course it was. And, and that was the entire point of it that they wanted to embrace America. And, but yet, yeah, the little tiny flags and waving them just ad nauseum. How fucking great is it that you guys put Matilda on a little stand? Like, like, you know, we saw that stand for the, see right there. You've got, Dude, that. she's got to watch the match. It's just hilarious to me. Cause that WCW did that a lot for like a cameraman. 
And you guys, nope, <laughs> doing it for the fucking dog. It's hilarious. Well, nobody was doing it for the cameraman at this stage of the game in 1988. But but she's the manager of the British Bulldogs. How else can she give the Bulldogs advice if she can't see the damn match? That's hilarious. So as a reminder here, this goes down at the end of August, of course, Madison Square Garden. It's funny that all these years later, they're back in New York City. Of course, Barclays instead. 20,000 folks here, man. And this is uh, the very first SummerSlam. Chat me up. Who thought of the name SummerSlam? We've told us before that Howard Finkel really gets the credit for WrestleMania, but they weren't all home run ideas. You told us last week he wanted to name SmackDown WrestleTown. So what? Did... <laughs> no, we didn't. That was that was an exaggeration, Conrad. That listen, was just a, a listen, what if moment. You fucking for stop. Of our story. Yes, thank you. God, don't let the truth okay. get in the way of a good story. Vince never said chocolate titties either. All right, stop it. Chat me well, up here. Who came up with the name SummerSlam? I remember Vin, I remember the meeting very vividly that events telling me. So I don't know who came up with it other than sitting in a room one day and Vince goes, we're going to do SummerSlam. I'm like, what is SummerSlam? Uh, and he goes, we're going to do a, a summer pay-per-view. The end of the summer, he goes, get this, the Mega Bucks versus the Mega Powers. And I'm like, all right, you know, that was a pretty damn cool thing because it was, it was Andre involved and it was Hulk, Hulk involved and it got ran. It, it was, it was interesting. It was really interesting, but I just heard it out of the blue right after WrestleMania or right before WrestleMania, I guess it was, um, that this is what we're doing. There wasn't, this one wasn't something that was talked about a lot you know, right. concept wise. And what are we going to do? This is, we're going to have this show. We're going to have this event. And I don't think that anybody really even thought even going back to survivor series is, is this going to be a annual deal? I don't think anybody really thought SummerSlam was going to be an annual deal. We just thought, Hey, we've got this big event. going to go to the garden and let's have this show on pay-per-view. So in 1988, when we first started working on it, nobody thought there was going to be a SummerSlam 89, much less a SummerSlam 30 years later on pay-per-view. Yeah, it is pretty hard to believe, you know, how quickly time flies. I mean, I remember this show and to think about the fact that that means I'm 30 years older. It's a little weird. And this is, uh, you're 30 years old. I'm 30 years older than the first time I saw this for sure. So let's so talk. How old were you when you saw this? For seven, time? seven. Okay. I had just well, gotten into wrestling, uh, earlier that summer and, uh, we didn't get the pay-per-view, but of course I got the VHS, um, Madison square garden, man. What an important venue for you guys. Of course, the first WrestleMania is there. The first summer slams there. And it's been, you know, sort of his and him being Vince McMahon, it's been his like uh, home arena, even before he was involved in the company. How do you think Vince took it very recently when new Japan and ring of honor, not only ran the building, but sold it out. I think that there's a big part of him that was probably hurt pretty bad. Just thinking about the tradition of his, his grandfather and his father promoting in the garden and him promoting in the garden that, but at the same time, man, the Vince McMahon of today is, is grown a lot too. And I think he sees it as, all right, it's part of, it's part of growing and it's part of progression. We'll have a new home and move on. So, you know, now Matilda here is she's listening. She's listening to the audience as you saw that because she's, she's, <laughs> I don't know if that's Tony Chimmel that's that's petting her and telling her hey just check out the match but she's she's into it people love matilda it's amazing you know it's the the dog the, the least animated dog ever but it's a fucking mascot and well, people loved matilda man i mean she was over like rover and she rover did. was on that other show who, who was more influential uh elizabeth or matilda they did about the same you know, the, you know what they, they did, they ran, they ran one in the same and true story. When we did the manager poll and we used to do those things every once in a while, do a vote who the, the best manager is 
Matilda got more than anybody. It's the best. Well, yeah. Of course. It's a dog eat dog world, so you got to go to a dog for that kind of advice. This sort of rounds out um, the big four here. For years and years, the WWF sort of hung their hat on four major events the Royal Rumble in January, WrestleMania in late March, early April, SummerSlam in August, and then Survivor Series in November. And at this point, of course, Survivor Series 87 was already a thing. Royal Rumble in 88 was already a thing. And of course, WrestleMania is the franchise. Was the idea, you know, after you guys rolled out SummerSlam, we're going to make this our fourth major event and that's it? Or when did you sort of know that, hey, we're going to have four major events? Well, actually, I got to correct you there, Conrad, because see, we hadn't done the pay-per-view Royal Rumble yet. Yeah, just the USA Network special. Yeah, but we didn't we didn't even think that that was going to be a pay per view at that time. Here at this point, we're thinking, okay, we've done WrestleMania, we're going to do a summer one, and then we'll do a winter one with uh, Survivor Series. Rumble wasn't even in the picture yet. Rumble didn't come into the picture until after the success of SummerSlam. And Vince got to thinking, well, hell, let's do another um, one. Let's do another one. Yeah. So um, then we've got four, we've got four tent poles then, um, wasn't even, yeah, wasn't even in the discussion yet. That's how, how crazy when you think about it. Now, Vince probably was thinking this, this whole time, you know, that he's going to have four or five, I'll do one every month. And everybody would think he was absolutely crazy, but the model is uh, stated so many times before it was all about house shows and it was all about going to the local towns and that's where you made your money. I'm I'm, so, I'm glad you mentioned that because this is such a foreign concept to think about now, but there was no raw here. There is no SmackDown. All you've got is primetime wrestling and wrestling challenge. And those shows are mostly, you know, I, I know the phrase isn't polite, but it's jobber matches. It's squash matches. It's enhancement talent versus name talent. And then lots of promos, which is definitely the formula. So this was really the only way to see competitive matches unless you went out to a house show and this is years before the business sort of became what it is now, like where house shows are maybe, I don't know, the fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, most important thing. The company does now it was number one back then from a revenue standpoint, right? It was, that was the entire model of the company and it was all about, uh, producing house shows and doing live events. And that's where you got the return on your investment. The television show was a one hour commercial to promote everything else. You know, we've, we've talked about this. It's probably been two years since we talked about this, we haven't even, I guess we have been doing it two years now, but you've sort of made, um, note of the fact, man, dynamite kid was the man. If you haven't watched this, you need to go back and see it just because we see so little dynamite on these podcasts, but you get to really appreciate what a performer he was, but you've mentioned before that the circus, believe it or not, was actually something that Vince used almost as a barometer for how business was, because in theory, and this is a stretch here, but you got to, you know, listen all the way through They're a live event business. So they're taking sort of their show on the road and they're trying to sell tickets. And then when you go to the event, they're going to try to sell you swag, you know, merchandise and gimmicks and things like that. And that really is what the business was. Now, of course, we know Barnum and Bailey, not even a thing anymore, which is hard to imagine here in America. So Uh, sad. It it is weird that it's gone because it was, and I know that they were cruel to animals and I get all that, but I'm saying as a kid, it was a big deal to go to the circus. So that's what I'm sort of referencing here. Well, their model didn't really change like that circus model, even up until the end was really based on, Hey, you got to come out and see it. It's a live event. It's an attraction. Whereas WWE has just really changed everything with television, with pay-per-view, with licensing, with television rights. And there's just so many different opportunities. When do you think Vince realized, I mean, is there a conversation or a moment in time where you remember there being a bit of a paradigm shift with Vince, like the house shows are important, but they're not the only thing. Cause right here, they're really the number one thing. And you start to see the rise of pay-per-view buys. And obviously he's tinkered with some action figures here and there. Those have done well, but when do you remember how shows becoming less and less of a priority because he saw gold in other areas? Yeah. Uh, priority may be the wrong term, but, but, uh, but as far as revenue, 
for the company when we started getting big television rights. That's when it changed. And with the big television rights and also with the competition from WCW that we realized, man, we've, we've got to change the product and we have to be able to compete. We've got to do it on television. We're getting paid for that. In addition to the house, you know, you're just not getting the house show. You're now getting a television rights fee. That's when it really started to change. And, and it's funny when you talk about even the comparisons with the circus in later years, the circus started stealing out of our book where it became two different events at the circus where you could get there early and you could, it's like a meet and greet. You could go and pet the animals and get up close with the animals and the clowns. And you, they had when they, especially when they would run the big stadiums, half of the stadium was a meet and greet with the stars and, a, uh, get a ride, the elephants and, and get close to the lions and the tigers and bears and oh my. see all the clowns. Oh my. Yeah. Um, that that's how they kept their business going even longer than it probably should have gone. But we looked at, you know, you talk about live events, man, we looked at concerts, but yeah, the circus, that was, that was a big, big one for us that we used to compare because it was the same audience that, um, you know, could, that were paying the same money to come and see us. Man, they're having a heck of a match here. You know, this is sort of old school. I mean, when was the last time you saw a move like that? The abdominal stretch? Yeah, I mean, the abdominal stretch used to be just a Too state. long. I mean, what happened to it? Well, I, I think that for a lot of respects, man, that used to be a finisher. Wilbur Snyder, man, that was his finish. When he locked in the abdominal stretch, man, the match was over. And then guys started using it kind of as a, as a rest hold and to catch their breath in the middle of a match. And the damn thing hurts when put on properly. And then guys just started using it as, as a spot, a rest spot. Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about what the company is doing on your way in here. I mean, you guys are on fire here and you probably wouldn't see this type of this level of business really for another 10 years until you get to. 1998, I guess, but you guys just ran like a month, less than a month before this, the stadium in Milwaukee, the Milwaukee County stadium. And you hosted WrestleFest 1988. Now I'm mentioning this because it was a major show, but as you said, it wasn't a pay-per-view instead, this was taped and went straight to VHS. So you guys were certainly trying some different things here where I assume the cost of producing a video cassette was much less than producing a pay-per-view. Not really. Uh, you didn't have the satellite time that you didn't have to pay for to be able to distribute the damn thing live, but it, you still had the cost of bringing in the cameras, but you didn't have the cost of as many production people. It was a bare knuckles crew and we just had cameras and we'd send a director to direct the cameras and, all, everything was on ISO so they could cut it later, but there wasn't that attention to running a show. It was still just a big house show that was being recorded. 25,866 fans are there. Uh, they had a couple of dark matches on that one. Boss man over Scott Casey, Brutus Barber over, uh, Hercules. By the way, can you believe that Brutus, the fucking Barber beefcake is at Starcast this weekend? Well, yeah, because it's all about big, big talent, big names. My God. Uh, the Rougeau boys uh, beat the Killer Bees. Bad News Brown, believe it or not, pinned Bret Hart. Hacksaw Jim Duggan beat Honky Talk Man by DQ. Of course, Jimmy Hart was interfering there. Uh, Powers of Pain beat the Bolsheviks. Jimmy Neidhart beat Lanny Poffo. Randy Savage beat Ted DiBiase and retained his world title. Rick Rude and Jake Roberts went to a double countout. King Haku beat Sam Houston. Ultimate Warrior beat Bobby Heenan in a weasel suit match. Demolition beat the British Bulldogs to retain the world tag team titles. Dino Bravo beat Ken Patera, main event anywhere in the world. And your real main event, Hulk Hogan and Andre the Giant in a cage match. Man, that's, uh, that's still a big deal. You know, it's funny because I think a lot of people think about Hogan and Andre and really think about WrestleMania three, but you had... 
you know, the main event, which we've covered extensively, the match at WrestleMania four WrestleFest, and here. And then of course, survivor series, they were on opposite sides. These guys have been, I mean, all time, where do you rank Andre as Hogan's opponent? You know, like all time Hogan opponents, Macho Man's got to be in the conversation. There's probably some others. Where's Andre for you? Always, I've always said Andre was number one. Wow. Because, I, because Andre, even going back before, you know, Hulk Hogan was a baby face, Hulk and Andre were able to go in and headline at the New Orleans Superdome, at Shea Stadium in Japan, wherever they went. That was an attraction, even then that was a huge attraction for the local markets and local promoters. A stadium show like that. What challenges does that represent besides weather? Weather's the biggest one. Really. It's no different than any other show you go in and you know, you got your show and you, and you knock it out. This was something that the, the brewers had brought to us and they wanted something in their stadium. It was something different. So we got a great deal on it. We partnered with the brewers and they plugged the living shit out of it uh, all the way through, you know, the the summer. So it was it was good and it was a good partnership. We decided when we saw how tickets were going, well, we might as well record the damn thing and make a pay not a pay-per-view, make a uh, video out of it. So chat me up. You know, you've got the threat of rain, of course. You're going to have, have to worry about shooting around the sun. Uh, that's obviously going to throw off some of your lighting. The sound isn't going to be there for the guys in the ring as much because it just goes up into space. There's no top on the thing. And obviously, you know, it's not air conditioned. So it's probably hotter for the guys. Are guys sort of bitching and moaning a little bit about working a stadium show or not so much? Not when they see 25,000 people. No. There you go. It's Let's, easy to do when there's a lot of people there. You know, I, uh, I've watched enough wrestling to know that I feel like, uh, the end is near here. Well, by God, now that you see that big press slam coming, it's, it's gotta be soon. Dude. What a maneuver that was a press slam, like rocket launcher maneuver. Into the blind headbutt. Got Dynamite's making the cover, but he's saying, Hey, we're not the legal man. This isn't going to work. Well, no, the damn bell's wrong. Oh, wow. There you go. Dude, th- th- this, this, the time limit has expired on this matchup. Oh my goodness. What are we going to do? Well, Conrad, there's only one thing you can do that. That's a time limit draw. That means there is no winner or well, both guys are winners. I don't think anybody had that pegged, but, um, I wish we could have put some money on that. You know, a lot of people ask us for our advice and they want to know who's going to win here. Who's going to win there. Well, you gotta go check out my bookie. I always tell everybody to bet with my bookie and trust me, guys, this is the best bet this season. Football is right around the corner. And this is the place where you want to lay all your action. They've been in business for years. They've got great reviews online, their mobile site, super easy to use. And they've got live in-game betting. So you don't have to place it before kickoff. You're good. And they've got tons of uh, player perks, maybe the most in the business. You can even bet on the over under and even fantasy points. Now that's my favorite. So fantasy points and being that being something you can bet on is a new wrinkle in the gaming world. So lay down some cash and win big today. And when you win, they will pay. Tell them about our special offer to well. members. Yeah, but even better than that, because I love my bookie. If you join right now, my bookie will match your deposit dollar for dollar. All you got to do is use the promo code WRESTLE to activate the offer. Visit my bookie online today. That's my bookie, M Y B O O K I E. Use our promo code WRESTLE, and whatever deposit you put in, my bookie is going to match it dollar for four dollar okay don't forget our code russell you play you win you get paid can't recommend them enough uh, my friends and i used them last year and how about i i feel like outlaw ron bass might be a bookie here he's dragging brutus the fucking barber beefcake around by his bullwhip and this is something i remember like it was yesterday and i can't wait to talk about this because we've we've often alluded to this but we've never actually seen it on the show like this 
This is one of the more famous angles of 1988, is it not? You better believe it. And it was something that people talked about for a long, long time. Bass getting the spur in his hand there. And now it's time to go to cutting on the barber. It's going to give the barber a different kind of a head cut, if you will. It's so fun to me now that, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm still a dumbass for wrestling, but now that I know a little more, you can just plainly see where he, <laughs> you know, roll tide. Anyway, this is, uh, the spur across the forehead. Brutus, the fucking barber beefcake censored, is, is censored. bleeding. And this is the best part. Uh, you guys put the giant red X over. And I know you laugh because you think it's silly, but I as the human psychology behind this is incredible because it makes you want to pay more attention. Like you may have been not really paying that much attention before, but now you find yourself not only wanting to watch it, but trying to look around the X, like what don't they want me to see? It's so genius. Absolutely. And also, you know, the strategic, you make sure that you're getting the shots of the bloodied head so you can see, but then it goes behind the X and there's a little more blood than there's behind the X. And it is that I want to see this so bad, but we're protecting you. We're protecting you and your children at home from having to witness the carnage that's taking place here. Of course, the locker room's empty in here. I, I should mention here that um, they're using this as a way to explain that Brutus the fucking Barber Beefcake is not going to be here. He, of course, was supposed to be taking on the Honky Tonk Man for the Intercontinental title. But they've used this as a way to explain that he is not going to be challenging for that belt. So he's no showed here. Chat me up about uh, that first match. Of course, we just mentioned it went to a 20 minute time limit draw. Meltzer gave it two and a half stars. I liked it. You know, maybe I, that's the old school in me, but I think it's better than two and a half stars. What say you? I did too, because the guys were great workers. They were both teams were great workers and they were able to go out and tell a hell of a story. And I thought that the match itself was excellent. There were no lulls and, and they told a good story. Right now we've got, um, the man of the hour, bad news, Brown in the ring here. He's going to be taking on Ken Patera. And I, you know, I, I got to tell you, I came along at a time when Ken Patera was wrapping up. I'm not a Ken Patera guy. Does that make me a bad person? Yes. That makes you a bad person. I, I remember when Ken Patera first broke into the business with Vern Gagne and they sent him down to Texas to learn the ropes and Ken was a baby face cause he was an Olympian and what have you. And he was doing the best to learn the business. But when Ken Patera bleached his hair blonde and became a heel and turned his back on America, I thought it was, he was one of the best heels ever in the business. He had always been a heel in the WWF. I mean, with his big run with the blonde hair and all that, as you said, but now he's here doing the brown haired routine and this is post prison stint. And he's trying to, I mean, talk us through the silliness of that angle. Well, the idea was a man had paid his debt to society. He had come out and we just told the story, you know, that, that his manager, Bobby Heenan had forgotten all about him and not taking care of him while he was away and not taking care of his family. And he came back to exult revenge on, on Heenan. And the idea was that the audience could get behind it and, and want to help him. Uh, I still think Kenny was a better heel. No doubt. What was his relationship like with Vince McMahon? You know, they had hot and cold relationship, uh, over the years and Vince took care of his family when he was away doing his time, made sure that, that they were taken care of during that time. So it was, it was weird, but Kenny had, you know, they just would go back and forth sometimes. And, and it was Ken's a real independent guy, uh, very outspoken. Um, I always considered him a friend and thank God I always got, <laughs> got along with him. Wouldn't want to be on his bad side. And it, it just, um, Ken wanted to do what Ken wanted to do. And Ken wanted it to be, you know, 1985 all over again when he was on top of the world. We should mention here that the reason Ken wound up going to prison is he had an incident at a McDonald's. And then when the police came, he, uh, put up quite a fight and it became a whole situation. So 
chat me up when he's back here. Is anybody ribbing him about that? Is it still a topic of conversation? I mean, it's not often that one of the boys goes to prison while he's an active wrestler. Of course, there's been stories of guys who have gone on to have great fame in wrestling where before their wrestling life started, maybe they got in a little bit of trouble, but in the middle of your run, going to prison and then coming back kind of unheard of. Yeah. And I also don't think that, uh, that's something you rib somebody about. Sure. Because he lost a lot of years of his life in, in, in prison. And that wasn't something that he found very funny. So I, I don't know of anybody that ever would have ribbed him about that. Plus Ken was the kind of guy that, uh, not a lot of guys going to want to rib because you don't want to piss him off. It was, it was an unfortunate situation, man. They, they were hungry, went to McDonald's in Waukesha, Wisconsin, the staff locked the door on them, and to retaliate, they threw a giant uh, rock through the window, and they called the cops saying, hey, there's this um, big blonde guy and a big uh, Japanese guy. Described them as wrestlers, and cops knew where the wrestlers stayed, went and paid them a visit, and it just got bad from there. But uh, at this point, you know, Kenny had, had, had paid his time, done his done his service, and was back, and we were trying to get him going here. Um, he had a name, but it just, whatever reason, just did not click and didn't connect with the audience. This match is going to get a star and a quarter out of Dave Meltzer here. Two legit badasses here, though. Bad news, of course, had an extensive judo background, and Ken Patera was once upon a time considered to be one of the strongest men in the world. Um, you ever see any Ken's real life feats of strength? Yeah, I saw Ken's, you know, lifts in the Olympics and everything in 1972, and he came right after that to uh, Texas. So one of the things, the big, big deal with Ken Patera was we would do weightlifting with him back in the day in the middle of the ring. And you think about it, which I learned this at a very early age uh, and brought it up on the Dino Bravo lift, was when you put weights in a wrestling ring and things like that, that adds so much weight because your base is giving that the wrestling ring, it, it gives and, it, and it, it absorbs that weight. So when you're trying to press it, and you're moving it, that ring is moving as well. So you're not on a steady base trying to lift weight. So it's a, a shitload harder to try and do that in a ring. And that's why guys always tried to do it on a solid basis. But, uh, yeah, Ken was badass, man. I saw him in, in the Olympics and just always, he's a world-class athlete, man. It takes a lot to get to the Olympics. Of course, we know in our first match, just a couple of months after this show, there would be a real physical altercation with dynamite kid and the Rougeaus. We've covered that to death though. You ever see Ken Patera or bad news Brown ever have to throw hands? You know, I saw it, which, which we talked about recently w with bad news and the Cuban assassin, but there weren't any blows thrown and there were some chairs thrown, but man, bad news is another guy that people just, there was respect there. Uh, Alan wasn't an asshole, man. He was, he was respectful to everybody and all he asked was respect in return. So you, you kind of knew there were some guys that didn't want to, didn't want to fuck around, didn't want to play ha ha. And Alan Quage was one of those guys. He didn't want to play ha ha. He was there to make money and, and go home and take care of his family. We should mention that, uh, about a month prior to this show, the wrestling world was shocked. Bruiser Brody was brutally murdered in Puerto Rico by Jose Gonzalez, who wrestled as invader number one. And that entire story, I hate to just keep plugging here, but that entire story is told in a new documentary that vice Land put together dark side of the ring. And, uh, it was originally slated to debut in the fall of this year. I think it may have been pushed back, uh, into next year, but for those in attendance at Starcast, they can actually screen the movie and see it before anybody else. And you and I were lucky enough to see it in January of this year. A very rough cut. It's narrated by. Well, well let's go back to the match here real quick because you're gonna watch. You're gonna watch this finish here with 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 Bad News Brown, and the kick that he does, this Savat kick, is something that I, I, I credit 
uh, my brother Tom and Chris Adams for really bringing to the States and making famous and, and their bad news pins him. But, uh, but Alan did it well as well as he was a judo champion. So of course, karate men always win. But you talk about the, the, the whole Bruiser Brody biopic, I guess is, is one docudrama. Docudrama like is the say. term. Yeah. That's what they like to call it. Yeah. Um, I thought it was very well done and it's, a uh, interesting piece and for everybody coming to Starcast, that's one that i would put on the list to make sure and see we'll come back to brody take a look at this now you've told us before that you guys oh kogan <laughs> i'm sorry go ahead when when would this have been shot the day before the day of no, this day of man and so you know these promos are some of my favorite memories as a kid H old hulk hogan promos and of course, people online like to joke that him and Macho Man had to be on just copious amounts of cocaine to pull this off. Chat me up though. The, um, the way you guys shot this and you can, you can see sort of the corners and you can see like mean jeans hand down here. This is before you guys were calling it green screen. Tell everybody what you called it here. This is ultimate. This was, this was the cream of the crop. This was the best of the best. Uh, the green screen, which they called, uh, chroma key. Uh, which are used for like the, the weatherman in your newsstands. This was ultimate, man. This was, this was the cleanest you could get back in the day. And you can still see it, it had a lot of things to do. And, and I can tell this is a blue one because you can see the blue Around outline Hogan. of Hulk's back, brother. Yeah. It's funny because when I see this, I think of the last dragon, I think of Bruce Leroy because he's got that glow in that one part of the movie. And like <laughs> when you're watching these up close, you're like, wow, we'll take a look. Yeah. No shit, man. But it was, it was good stuff and it was state of the art. We should mention that they were teasing their secret weapon here. Uh, and we of course know what that's going to be on the way here for weeks. Now we've covered this a lot. We've had Hogan promos where he's talking about the uh, the teeny weeny itsy bitsy yellow polka dot bikini or whatever. Uh, here comes uh, ravishing Rick rude, not his best robe ever, but what a great gimmick this was. And I think this is when rude was really hitting his stride. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah. Rick was, you know, starting to get over and starting to feel it. And more importantly, I think Vince was starting to feel it with rude. So he was, Getting in, look at that old camera, man, with the flash on top, pocket camera. Holy cow. Yeah, you would see Rude really step his game up from here on out. I, you know, I think 88 is sort of his breakout year for me. 89 and 90 were the two years I appreciated, you know, his WWF run the most, though. Uh, 89, of course, is when he's going to be working with Ultimate Warrior. 90, they'll be working instead of the Intercontinental title for the world title. And look at all the chicks, man. Can't wait to get a picture of ravishing Rick Rude. Damn right. And that was, that was one of the things that just worked so well because it was the shoot. They all were, man. The cameras went off. They all wanted to get their glimpse of the ravishing one. Well, and a lot of this is just the presentation, yeah. you know, I mean, presentation is everything. He's got JYD on his trunks there. The hip swivel thing, man. He got it over. You know, a lot of guys have tried to copy this since. I don't know that anybody has been as effective with it as the original. No, no. I think that the Rude's man, of course, I wouldn't have another man's uh, face on my crotchal area. But you put your own face on your crotchal area like Scott Steiner? I would put my own face, but not somebody else's face. So you'd suck your own. Well, it had to be done. Here comes JYD. Do you have a JYD impersonation? I feel like you should have one of those. <laughs> no, <laughs> Stagger Lee. No, I don't have a good JYD one. I should got of all the years being with JYD. I should have a good JYD one, but you talk about guys that were on top of the business and couldn't be touched, man. JYD was like printing money in the mid South back in the day. And that some bitch just had so much charisma and so much just oomph that there's another one that, that often imitated will never be duplicated. It is amazing. When you think about how little he had to do to just get people riled up, he just had this innate charisma about him. Did he not? 
Yeah, he did, man. He walked out and he had everybody with him. This is where I would get in the, the arguments with Bill Watts where Bill will talk about a black baby face. I said, no, he's just a baby face. Right. Everybody loves him. He is the man. It's like this son of a bitch will walk out and, and everybody would go nuts from the oldest, uh, just grandfather in the, in the arena to the mom with her little baby and her three-year-old going absolutely nuts, just wanting to dance and watch JYD because he was real and they believed in him. What was Vince's take on JYD? You know, while, while dog was a, a bigger, thicker man, he was not necessarily this body Adonis that, you know, McMahon sort of fell in love with at different times for his baby faces. What was his relationship like with dog? And what did he think of dog? I, he loved dog. And, and when dog came in, dog did have that body and, and he didn't have the belly that he's got, you know, here in 1988, but when dog went up there, dog was, was ripped up and looked great. Um, you know, then he kind of let himself go a little bit and became a little slower and he got the paunch and that's where, when his career started going down downhill a little bit and it was you know when dog was in shape good god he looked like a a great god so it just you know this was during a time that he wasn't taking the best care of himself this match gets a dud rating in the observer chat me up about um the airbrush tights of ravishing rick rude do you remember anybody ever having a problem with it? Was everybody always cool? I mean, does he, does he give them a heads up beforehand or they just find out and just got a deal? No, what's there to have a problem with? Well, you know, as you said, I don't know that I want another man's face on my crotch. Well, if you're going to be weird and homophobic like that, I assume that some of the guys may be at some point too. No, I'd never heard a problem, man. That was, that was Rick's gimmick. And that was something that he did. And I don't think that he ever did anything that was, over the top. Uh, but to that point, I think that there were, you could play into that with sure. What he does here at the end with, with Cheryl and having someone, having your wife, having your wife's picture on his crotch Larry. You know, that's something that may piss me off a little bit. And that was tremendous. You know, obviously the seed had been sown there for a feud with Jake and root. Check out this lady walking all the way down the stairs, getting as close as she can to take a picture. It's amazing how over Rick rude was, man. Well, hell yeah. Yeah. Rick was, Rick was, Rick was over and dog was over, man. This was one of those. And these guys had, had also worked together previously. Uh, I want to say they had a short little stint in either Florida or, or the mid South, but they, they worked well together and liked each other. So that always helps as well. Now you remember Conrad, we did the, the summer slam, in the garden and they had a different hard camera shot. Yep. 98, 10 that? years later. Yeah. 10 years later. Um, we're here. We're shooting into the bowls. We're shooting into the long end of Madison square garden. And the entrance is from the hard camera. It's to the left. So that was, was something that we did early on and why we went to, Oh, I do know why. Cause he wanted the entrance. Um, that big entrance to be seen. I don't know why we switched later on in later years to go and see that big gaping hole in the middle of your hard camera shot. That's an easy transition there. I'm going to let that one go. Let's talk about uh, bruiser Brody again for a minute though, because this has got to be the talk of the business just a month later. I mean, we talked about how unusual it was for Ken Patera to be a guy who went to prison and came back in the middle of his wrestling career. But wow, one of the boys being murdered in the locker room. What was everybody talking about here in New York? You know, it, it was just unheard of. And I think that everybody was wondering what the hell was going to come of it and what was going to happen to Jose Gonzalez, who, you know, that was the guy that did it. And there you see Cheryl Roberts come out. Holy cow. But, uh, man, it was. It was just sad and, and people thinking what's going to happen next when was the last time you saw Jake move like that. Uh, it's been a long time. You know, he might be moving that way now though. Thanks to DDPY. This is true. 
This is true. But Jake was on fire here, man. And oh my God. How believable was that? How hot was the crowd for that? Well, the, here's the thing. They believed it because Jake believed it. And, and he came in and he let you know that he was pissed off and there wasn't anybody in there that couldn't feel that heat coming from Jake. And that's the difference in a pro. He wasn't playing. He wasn't going through the motions. He was pissed. And you knew it. Chat me up. Bruiser Brody. Lots of people in these documentaries that have come out especially the one from high spots talks about how they all sort of thought and Dave Meltzer, especially thought eventually Brody and Vince might have gotten together. Um, they did try to negotiate a few times allegedly, but nothing ever came of it, but maybe people who were close to Brody thought, well, he always thought there'd be a chance to do it later. And of course, you know, he was murdered and that never happened. And I think even the legend is that once he was working for the WWF. The McMahons gave him the name senior gave him the name bruiser Brody. Is that right? Well, that part. Yeah, that that's true. That's what I'd always heard. But you know, when I got there, there was no talk of bruiser Brody coming in ever. And Vince wasn't, you know, from the time I was there from April, 1987, Vince was never really high on, uh, on Frank coming in. Why do you think that was? He had a reputation as a rebel, a renegade. Yeah, Brody, Brody definitely did. He, he, he did his own thing and he had a reputation for walking out when things didn't go his way. And that wasn't something that, that Vince liked to tolerate and put up with. And if a guy had that, um, he needed to see them display some loyalty and, and some professionalism elsewhere before he was going to be ready to bring him in. This is just a honky tonk man on here right now. I got greatest intercontinental champion, greatest singer, greatest dancer, greatest wrestler, greatest intercontinental champion all the time, baby. You know, I feel like, um, we've had a lot of fun with the character Brutus, the fucking barber beefcake because he beat the undefeated streak of Mr. Perfect. And that was really what sort of got me down that path, but the honky tonk man despite similar attributes to Brutus, as far as being super over and getting the character over so strong and having such a strong reaction, I feel like he sort of gets glossed over a lot. Why do you think that is? Do you think it's because he's because the gimmick was hokey or because he's alienated himself from some of the office because he does. I mean, the dude is white hot as a heel here. People fucking hate him, but I don't think people today really talk about him as much. Is it the shoot interviews that he's done? That's maybe hurt the perception of him. What is it about that? I don't know. I, I can't say I've ever seen any of his shoot interviews, so I don't know, but honky tonk man back in the day, good God, he was red hot and he had legitimate heat, but he was able, you know, he knew how to work it. He knew how to go out and he had money drawing heat. So can't knock him. Oh God, I hope they're going to sing Conrad. Are you gonna, I hope they're going to sing. Are you going to do this for us? You think? Well, if he, if Nikolai takes the thing, I will definitely sing along with him. The, cause it's only out of respect. How about slick as a manager for them? How fucking weird is this? The doctor of style, if you will, baby. Got to love slicks. He's a job soul, bro. Show a little respect. For comrade Volkov. That's right. Or Koloff, rather. To. Volkov. I love eating crunch at the bank, chase a case. Lordy, da. Okay. That's how they end it. What a look here. And this really, if we're honest, this is you guys ripping off the road warriors, not demolition. Uh, no, this is those guys ripping off the road warriors. Now see this, that's the part I don't understand. These guys were a rip off of the road warriors. A hundred percent. The hair, the face paint, everything. Yeah. Yeah. These are just some guys, black you know, tights, red letters down the side. 
face paint, crazy mohawks, even the hairstyle. Yeah. Uh, I mean, even the reverse mohawk thing. And this is a hundred percent rip off of the Road Warriors. Yeah, and this was something that that they these guys were coming straight in from Crockett at the time, and uh, had been unhappy there. They were in the middle of a program with the Road Warriors before they came in. But I'll tell you, during during this match, I, I remember watching this match, and I'm I'm brother love, and I'm looking out there, and I'm nervous as shit. I'm peeking through the curtain, and Pat Patterson comes by and says, "Good luck, Brucey." And Vince McMahon looks at Pat and he says, "Patrick, that's not Bruce, that's brother love." And gave me gave me a little speech that I'll I'll never ever forget. Let's hear it. Vince looks out the curtain and says, see that? That's Madison Square Garden, the most famous arena in the world. 18,000 people. And he turns back, he looks at Gorilla Monsoon and says, Gino, Gino, how many watching on pay-per-view? Monsoon, without even hesitating, 5 million. <laughs> you know, just 5 million watching on pay-per-view live. You know what? He holds out his hand, he points his hand, he goes, you know what? You own every one of them right here in the palm of your hand. You own every one of them. So fuck up, go on out there and own them. And I was absolutely just that I, if I wasn't scared before now, I was terrified. This was my first time going out, man. And I'm, I'm and I remember watching this match at the curtain, just thinking I'm going to be out there shortly. And, uh, hoping that I didn't turn my white pants brown. <laughs> I don't know why that's funny to me, but it is. Well, I was trying to think of a song to turn it something, something, and I couldn't think of it. So I just went with the lyric anyway. Oh, how I turn my white pants brown. <laughs> Well, no, they're not exact ripoffs of the Road Warriors. So he's got different colors hairs. Different color hairs. Yeah, he's got brown hairs on one side and black hairs on the other side. You know, for for two like really mean looking some bitches, Warlord and Barbarian. I don't think you could find two nicer guys. <laughs> same thing. Well, actually, same thing with with Big Jim and uh, Nikolai too, but. For some some of the nastiest looking some bitches in the world, they were just some of the nicest people you ever want to meet. I don't know why, but that's funny to me. What's that? <laughs> What's funny to you? I don't know. You met Nikolai. He was nice. No, I'm not arguing that. I can't argue that. We should mention that uh, end of July, Bam Bam Bigelow leaves the company, goes to the NWA. Why, why, why do you think that is like, why was Bam Bam not a right fit here? If it was like with this cast of characters, he'd have been a natural fit. I think that Bam Bam just saw, you know, more for his character. Bam Bam wanted to be the man and had been fed that in his head from day one. Uh, he also had Larry Sharp in his ear that, you know, was constantly, constantly looking to book him elsewhere. <laughs> So it just, uh, he was unhappy and Vince didn't want the unhappy guy around him. Didn't want the unhappy guy around him. Yep. Well, speaking of unhappy, Terry Taylor is coming in at the end of July and not talked about a lot. He actually debuts on a tag team with Sam Houston. Uh, he of course turns on Houston and becomes a heel and briefly wrestles as terrible Terry Taylor it's apropos. And then you guys reach into the famous box of gimmicks and pull out the legendary red rooster. Chat me up about old terrible Terry Taylor. Well, that was just a descriptor. I think more than anything, the terrible part. No, the, the red rooster was always the gimmick. Bring Terry in is, is kind of an underneath baby face and then have Bobby Heenan say that he can turn anybody into a star and, and take, uh, take Terry under his wing, which then fed into the Brooklyn brawler whole scenario as well. But he was going to be the, the red rooster er, 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 er. and, uh, 
Be a cocky little fucker. A cocky little fucker. There's apparently another cocky little fucker around this time because uh Mean Gene Okerlin popped off with Vince. They had a bunch of blow ups, one even at the Slammy Awards. That was so bad that Gene quit for a day. Uh, this of course is coming to us from the observer, but chat me up. Do you remember any of these famous mean Gene Vince McMahon blow ups? What were they about? Take us back. No oh, shit, man. Gene would always get hot and quit for a day. I don't know that he ever actually quit to Vince, but he would quit to the bar and let everybody know. I've had it. I'm done. I'm out of here. Not going to take this shit anymore. And then Vince would come in. How you doing, Vince? What are we doing tomorrow? <laughs> so, um, back in, you know, and, and especially back during this time, things were a little wilder and things were a little bit more open. So guys would have arguments and that happened every day. It was just disagreements. The, the stuff at, uh, the Slammy awards was more of so many cooks in the kitchen and so many chiefs that everybody was telling everybody what to do. You had ever saw there and, and his group and then Vince and us. And, and it just was, it wasn't a well-oiled machine. It's amazing that that huge production got on the air the way that it did, but, uh, it worked. It all worked. And that, those were just things that happened, man. Guys blow up and I can't tell you how many times I quit in the bar. Fuck it. I'm done. Not coming tomorrow. I'm out. Chat me up here about Baron Von Raschke. We haven't talked about him very often. He's the manager here and, uh, he's gone shortly after this. What happened? Uh, Von Raschke was actually my idea because uh, I think that he was looking to come in and I thought he would compliment these guys well because they needed a baby face promo. And Rashke cut a hell of a just heel baby face promo. So bring in the Baron. He was a new face, somebody different, and let him cut their promos. Put the face paint and the hood on him, and that's that's what he wore as Baron Von Rashke. So those that knew, knew, and those that didn't, he was the Baron. What did Vince think about the Baron? Loved him personally. He didn't think that he added anything to the act at all. Is this a uh, push here for the powers of pain? Is this really in response to the inability to sign the road warriors? Because allegedly the road warriors had met with Vince, but couldn't get a guarantee. So they opted for the guaranteed money with Crockett. Yeah. Timing wise, that was, that was about right. He was actually negotiating with both. And when one didn't come, took the other. Of course, next up is a, a pretty big moment for you. We're going to see uh, the Brother Love show on pay per view in just a minute. And you sort of told the story of uh, the guys maybe trying to get in your head a little bit. When we're seeing this on the network, is this um, is there an intermission right before you come out? Because they need a little time to set all this up, do they not? There was uh, we God, I think we just got that damn carpet in the ring and went, we had rehearsed it during the day. And so that was all ring crew. As soon as those guys got out now, watch, I'm about to trip and almost bust my ass as, as I come through here and they don't take it. Thank God. Uh, but when I, when I did the turn, there's a little step up there. Um, uh, either they edited it out or completely missed it. And I thought I was going flat on my face. And right now my asshole is about as tight and puckered as one could possibly be. I mean, it's a good looking ass. It's I'm going to let let's just, I'm going to leave that alone for a minute. The spotlight treatment here hadn't been done before. Has it? No, it was red or pink spotlights that bathed, bathed me in pink and this was long before lighting treatments and all this other crap. So this was a big deal as to how we were going to present the brother love show. How nervous are you right now? I love you. I'm scared to death. Absolutely. I mean, it's Madison square garden. First how old, of all. And how old are you here? I'm 25 here. That's the thing that gets me is 
you know, you're one of those guys who as this character, you know, I know you're 25, but you could pass for 40 or 45. You know, I joked with my friends the other day that there's a handful of guys in wrestling who've looked the same age forever. Like we almost imagine mean Gene Okerlund, like in second grade in a little tuxedo, giving a book report, like with a mustache and bald. bald. Yeah. Yeah. And so mean Gene, Arn Anderson, JJ Dillon, like those guys looked 55 when they were 25. And now that they're 75, they look 55 and you, for whatever reason here, when I watched it then, and even when I watch it now, I think, I mean, he's 40 something. But you're 20 fucking five. And and I think when you think about the idea that you're 25 and this is the infancy of pay-per-view and it's sold out Madison square garden, and you're the first to have a lighting treatment and you're in this character and you've got to pull all this off a lot of pressure for a 25 year old. And, and I'm also responsible for the production that night. So <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. On top of that, had a few things going on there. And look, you know, looking at it, not knowing that Duggan was going to be my guest until the very last minute, because we had so many different things in the work from Jessica Hahn. We'll talk about that in a minute. Keep going with your story about the pressure though. Oh no, it it just, I, I, I didn't know. I didn't have time to prepare and I'm just thinking I've got to get through this and praying that everybody is is going to be happy at the end of the day that I don't break my neck getting out of the ring. You guys had teased building up to this, that it was going to be a huge announcement that you were going to have a very special guest. I mean, this was hyped up to where you thought it was going to be a major happening and it almost was. We've talked about this a little bit before, but let's expound on it since we're finally here. Well, the idea it, the time was WWE Vince was negotiating with Ric Flair and that this was going to be the debut of the nature boy, Ric Flair into the WWF. So it was going to be on the brother love show. We were going to announce that, that Ric Flair had joined and that he was here now. Um, and that didn't, you know, it just kept falling through, but it, it was, it was close, then it wasn't close, then it was close, then it wasn't close, and it uh, ended up not happening. So Duggan had been gone for a little while, and this was kind of Duggan's Duggan's return too. So it was Vince was like, "We'll do Duggan." Um, Fuck! What a disappointment, though. I mean, after you've promised, and and you know what the real deal is. Of course, us fans, we didn't know, but how close do you think the flare thing got? It was, it was fairly, fairly close. It, it was, it was fairly close. The, you know, for me, I think that the, and I wasn't disappointed. I was happy to be on. It was my biggest disappointment was not getting Jessica Hahn because that would have got mainstream news and mainstream press everywhere. Um, then the thought of having flair, that was exciting because it was something brand new. And I liked Rick, um, the, the letdown was, you know, hack had already been here before, but at the same time, one of the things that at least calmed me down somewhat in here, I'd known Duggan for years and I'd worked with Duggan for years. So at least I was comfortable with Jim. Yeah. With Jessica Hunt, you would have been on pay-per-view with a real, I mean, a variable, you don't know what to expect. Right. And, and even with flair, you know, I, I would have, I've known, I've known Rick since 1981 or whatever it was. And there was still, I think I still would have been psyched out. So Duggan, the, the great part about having Duggan on there was a comfort. I trusted him. I knew him and we had, we had done stuff together before. So that was, that was good. But at the same time for me, I just am scared to death here. And you, you think about, you can't can't rest and think about what what could have been what should have been type thing well let's play that game for a minute though let's do the what if gimmick what if flair had come in here what would the plans have been i mean i think most people assume he's the arguably the second biggest star maybe third in the business the top three being hulk hogan macho man and rick flair and you guys are in the process of making macho here in this 88 run what would the plans have been 
for flair how'd he come in here in your opinion you know i it was never discussed with me i think that rick probably would have been put right into the title picture right away um but at the same time vince had in his head he was going to go with hulk and savage at wrestlemania so i don't think that flair would have changed that he probably would have brought rick in and taken maybe a year or so to get rick over to take that spot with hulk after wrestlemania let me mention here when you say to get rick over you mean to this new audience obviously yes. you know in the south and you know in florida i mean flair was over in st louis and blah 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 blah. but you mean to this new york audience which is really where vince has his finger on the pulse you would probably need to the to, wwf audience yeah yeah so the idea being maybe wrestlemania 5 would have stayed the same would wrestlemania 6 have, look at that look at that did you see the athleticism that was just shown there i did the way he twirled that two by four the way that i got out of the ring there and and, and moved i think i ran a i think i ran a a, a three Three, eight, 90 on that. Okay, cool. Yeah, it was, um, three, eight, 90. I'm, I'm going to have to remember that. Chat me up though. WrestleMania six. Do you think that would have been instead of Hogan warrior? Would it have been Hogan flair? I don't see that. It could have been. Yeah, it definitely could have been, but I, again, we'll never know. And I, and I, this was not the first time that that Vince had negotiated with flair either. So I think by this time Vince was kind of getting a little, um, skittish. Yeah. Because Rick would, would, would get close and then, then he'd do. never seal the deal. Yeah. And that was a frustration on Vince's part. Do you think, what do you think that was? Do you think flair was just in a comfort zone? Yeah. I think Rick was real comfortable. He, he knew the surroundings there. Jim Crockett, uh, at that time, at least treated him well. And, and Rick was comfortable. It was an unknown. We got the, uh, honky talk man coming to the ring before we do, I want to put a bow on that segment, uh, that we just saw you, you called, um, you called him Dugan, which is sort of fun. And Meltzer would write this. He says that you did a great job playing the gimmick, but it's already run its course. He also says, I don't know anyone who gets off on it, which I think is an interesting comment. And he continues the comments I hear when brother love comes on it's channel switching time. By this point in the show, I'd rather have gone to the dentist because getting teeth scraped was more entertaining. Dud, 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 dud. How much of that is him hating on hacksaw and how much of that is just, he's always hated Bruce Richard. Um, I just, just goes to show his being able to read what works and what gets over and what doesn't considering that, uh, the gimmick was on every television show for the next three and a half years and did get over and draw money. But then again, there's your expert. So here we go. We've got, uh, hockey talk man cutting a promo and he's going to be facing a mystery opponent. As we said earlier, Brutus, the fucking barber beefcake can't be here because Ron Bass has mutilated him. So he's challenging anybody in the back. Just bring them on out here. And they're killing a little time, getting some shots of the crowd. And then all of a sudden, some of the most iconic music of all time hits and look at the crowd go bananas and honky's freaking out like what? Not him. No. And of course the announcers are playing a dumb, like they don't know who it is, even though they hear the music and the fans know. And it's the ultimate warrior here and probably his first major career highlight for the WWF. Wouldn't you agree? I, yeah, I would agree. Definitely. Because this was a big point. This was a big, big deal for him. And we had to keep it short because, uh, he's already just looking for any kind of air he can get. And the honky tonk man right there is, is saying that was the stiffest freaking shoulder tackle I've ever had in my life. And that was the worst clothesline probably ever thrown. And this hurts. Does he not know how to do a splash? Man. You will notice there was no uh, warrior press here. And that's because honky refused to do it. Goddamn right. Anybody, anybody that had ever taken it before, you know, would refuse to do it because he didn't know how to do it. He would grab people by the balls and by the throat and try and lift them up. And 
Honky was like, yeah, you ain't grabbed my balls. You did that once. Ain't going to happen again. Well, there you go. I never knew that. So that's a, that's a fun story. 31 seconds here. Uh, ultimate warrior. Now your intercontinental champion. Of course, he's going to carry that to a WrestleMania and then rude with a little help from Bobby Heenan is going to take it from him. Chat me up a little bit about Meltzer's comments here. Cause he actually agreed with you. He says warrior gave honky quote, the worst clothesline in the history of pro wrestling. And he also referred to the warrior as the anabolic warrior during this time period. He gave the match, uh, negative half a star. Well, it was at least short. It's funny. I think that's the best thing that can be said about it. It is interesting that, you know, we've heard the rumor and innuendo that honky refused to drop the belt to macho man, but now no problem doing a 31 second splash squash to the warrior. What, what, what well, did, what did Vince see in warrior? Oh God. I mean, well, first of all, the, what they envisioned for the segment is exactly what you saw from the time that warriors music hit till the time that he left that audience was on their feet going nuts. We didn't give them time to settle down and come down and, and watch a match or try to have a match or anything like that. You kept them up and it was a frenetic pace. That was the vision that he had. That's exactly what they got. Um, you know, it worked, it worked. That's, that's what we were looking for. Make it, make a, make a moment. So there's your intermission right there, um, which they've obviously cut out, but we get the rejoin at this point. Are you watching the show? from the gorilla position. Oh God. At this point, I don't even know where the hell I am. I'm I, probably at gorilla with, uh, yeah. As a matter of fact, with at gorilla. Yep. What's, uh, what's Vince think of uh superstars commentary at this point? Whew. At this point, I don't even think we could hear the commentary at in Madison square garden. So it was, you know, one of those, you didn't, you didn't have Madison square garden was different, dude. <laughs> it was back in those days, you're dealing with the garden, uh, the garden network people, uh, MSG network, and you're dealing with their equipment, their stuff. And, and we had, we did have a gorilla position, but it wasn't, it wasn't what you think a gorilla position is now. It was just a place to send guys. And, and that was it. And there was one monitor there and that that's all there was. So for us, it was, you know, if you could get a place there and see awesome, if not, then you move on. But I, who knows where I was. Here comes Don Morocco, man, the original rock. How jacked is he right here? Well, Morocco man was, and here's, here's the other crazy thing for, for Don Morocco, he's was such a huge, huge star in Madison square garden in New York, back in the territory days, Don was a huge star everywhere he went. And this was during a time in, in Morocco's career that, you know, he had was sliding down a little bit and he had gotten so damn big and didn't move like the Don Morocco of old. And then you add in this match to that Dino Bravo and same thing with Dino, man. He, he just got to the point where it was, it was like slow motion watching these guys go. And Don didn't have, uh, didn't have that same zip that he used to have. Yes, it's a bitch. USA is not okay. And a bitch. Look at that there's, fucking there, guy. There we go. There's America. <laughs> <laughs> like Bruce Mitchell. Oh, We're not in Greensboro. God. Yeah, jack off. Oh, my. So let's talk about um, finishes for a minute. You know, we, we mentioned a minute ago that. Honky talk, man. The rumor in innuendo is that he wouldn't lose to Savage, but he, he will lose to Warrior. Any pushback 
for him honky on dropping the belt to warrior. I mean, you just said he wouldn't take a press slam was, and he wanted to keep it short. I get that. He was fine with losing though. And, and he was okay yeah. with making it short. Absolutely. You know, the, uh, again, the only pushback I remember from, from honky and, and with warrior was, you know what? Don't ever grab my nuts like that again. And we ain't doing that. We ain't going to do your, your finish. We're not going to do that press slam until you learn how to do it. Uh, I ain't taking it. And the problem was, was, with so many guys, the enhancement talent, they were just happy to be, be out there and, and be able to do a job and get a payday. So when warriors squeezed their nuts to oblivion, they would come back and wouldn't complain. So no one knew until he started doing the finish on top guys. And then when he did that, they were like, uh, uh, and that's where Rick rude sat him down one day and showed him how to do it. Still. I think he squeezed. I mean, maybe he was the original Joey Ryan Dick flipper. God. Hey, so chat me up here about, uh, you know, I did the transition for finishes. I want to talk about the rumor and innuendo, you know, you sort of addressed it there for honky, but what about the Rougeos and bulldogs? You know, one of the internet legends is that the bulldogs were supposed to go over, but the Rougeos complain and get a change to a draw. Do you remember that? I, I don't. And to my knowledge, that match from day one, when we put everything together, that match was always supposed to be a 20 minute draw to start the sh start the night off. You know, back in the day, that's how you'd start your shows. Have the first two guys go out there and go, you know, 10 or 15 minutes through. And, uh, then you start building the show from there. But to my knowledge, and I did the original run sheets from day one, which was the week of the show. That was always a 20 minute draw. You ever hear a story about an enhancement talent named John Ziegler? Allegedly no. he's credited with, uh, being one of the godfathers for introducing steroids to weightlifters. And he was working enhancement matches for you guys in August of this year. And the name jumped out to me. And so I thought I'd ask, God damn, how old was he? I don't know. Yeah. I, I have no idea. I, I go back to, you know, the very little I know about steroids. And I go back to the Arnold Schwarzenegger days, uh, in Venice beach in the sixties and superstar Billy Graham talking about, you know, in the, in the sixties and how it was all introduced then. So um, no, I've never heard that name at all. And I, I, superstar was the one who really was one of the first guys that brought that look. And that came from, from working out with Schwarzenegger and those guys out in Venice beach. Was this always supposed to be sort of the blow off for the Hogan warriors? I mean, Hogan, Andre stuff. SummerSlam. Yeah. I ask because it feels like it's, it's dwindling a little bit. I mean, obviously you guys have gone back to the well a few times and I know we've touched on it before when we did our Hogan 88 episode, but in August of that year, August 7th, in fact, you guys take the show to Greensboro Coliseum, of course, NWA country in a big way. It held the, um, Starcade events for 83, four, five, and six. And you guys have Andre and Hogan on top and you draw 3,600 fans. But you know, whenever you go say to Oakland, you're doing 10,500, you're doing 140 grand in LA, you're doing giant business in Montreal, believe it or not, with Randy wrestling Dino Bravo on top, like 300 grand. So you're getting tons of traction everywhere you go, except in the greens of Royal Coliseum with Hogan and Andre. And it always sort of stuck out to me that, you know, this is a year after they drew 93,000 or whatever fabled number there is, but it's 3,600 here. How much of that is because it's NWA country and how much of that is just because people have seen it. Um, I think that a lot of it had to do with probably our, just our exposure in the market. And I don't know how good our TV was there you know, going in and, and running a market that people were used to watching the NWA and another product. And they had a time slot that people were used to. So, you know, that, that damn new gas station opened up down the street, but for Vince with Andre, I know Vince wanted to limit Andre's exposure as much as he could because there were still questions about his health. So it, it was, 
How about the body slam and a ref bump, but he bounces right back up and a fucking That's Timmy white. He's resilient. It's just funny though. <laughs> that anytime somebody gets knocked over, they're dead for days. But when it happens accidentally, just pop right back up and a damn sidewalk slam is your finish. USA is not okay. I feel like USA should, is not okay. I feel like we need to have a costume contest because this would be an easy one to do, would it not? Absolutely. Count USA me in. is not okay. Is that your new gimmick? USA is not okay. Fetchy Bernard, Is that the guy who taught you how to smoke weed on a plane? Yes, it is. Come in here, Bruce. What you do is you get down and you get into the toilet and you push the button. When all the air sucks it out, it takes the smoke. Watch this. Watch this. And you keep it down there and the smoke goes away. Kiss How about Sean Mooney sporting the tuxedo? Got the mic cube like he likes it. I feel like we're going to see that at StarCast later today. What the hell? I think Sean Mooney's put on a few pounds. Got a little more gray, though. But he looks, other than that, he looks exactly the same. Man, how big of a star was Jesse Ventura here? Well, Jesse Ventura at this time was our answer to, for example, uh, any, any mega star that was out there. He had just done Predator, and he was getting a lot of press, and he was a, quote, movie star. Jesse liked to think of himself more as a movie star than a wrestler or a commentator, but he also knew where his bread was buttered. So Jesse was live, man, during this time. Jesse, Jesse was a was a huge megastar, and he was the guy that was able to get out there, he and Hogan, and get out on Entertainment Tonight and get that extra press. How about this? The Hart Foundation already in the ring. Of course, RIP to uh, Mr. Jim Neidhart. This is the first time we've had him really on the show since he passed away. And there's Bret Hart just a few years before he's going to be a big single star just three years after this, he's going to have a classic with Mr. Perfect and become the intercontinental champion. Still trying to find his way here a little bit. Yeah, but they were a classic tag team and the heart foundation were, if you were to ask if, if we were to go back 30 years and, and look at this now, I would tell you that the heart foundation, those are two tag team guys. I don't think either one of them could be a single. Man, this is good old school WWF to me. We've got demolition coming out both with Mr. Fuji and believe it or not with Jimmy Hart. Of course, Jimmy Hart had recently been paired with the Hart foundation, of course, but now they're good guys and Jimmy ain't having nothing to do with that baby. He likes bad guys and beans and taters. You know, that's right. And if you're ever in Jacksonville, no. Nope. Yeah, nope. Daytona Beach. You can Daytona go. Beach, damn it. I can't believe you would forget that because everybody know. knows about Jimmy Hart's famous bar and Tiki Deck. It's right on the water, baby. And they, they got cans of beer, baby. They don't have draft because you're going to have glasses down by the water. You got to have them cans. And all you got to do is come down to Daytona Beach right there on the beach at the Mayan Inn and ask for Jimmy Hart's famous bar and Tiki Deck. By the way, they got beans and taters. They got all kinds of wrestling photos all over the building. They even got one. Of brother love, of course, Hulk Hogan's in it. He's contractually obligated to be in all the wrestling pictures, but who else would you want? He's the biggest star of them all. Don't forget Jimmy Hart's famous bar and Tiki deck also has NFL Sunday ticket. So if you live in say Texas and the game is blocked out, just hop in your car 19 hours later, boom, you're right there on the beach with your feet in the sand and a can of cold beer in your hand, eating beans and taters at Jimmy Hart's famous bar and Tiki deck. You can see it all right there, baby. By the way, I, I know some of our listeners have no idea what I'm doing, but you and I recently did an event in Huntsville, Alabama, and no matter what question came from the audience. So Vince, um, or, or what do you guys think Vince thinks about new Japan selling out Madison square garden? Well, baby, I think they're going to be hanging from the rafters just like they are every night during raw at Jimmy Hart's famous bar and Tiki deck. I love Jimmy. And the, just the constant shield. He's the best. And I don't well, know. I don't know anything about a constant shield. So let's talk about Starcast. Yeah, I don't even know what you're talking about right here because it was <laughs> animal. And I got to the point where we would answer the questions with the same thing because we thought, well, shit, somebody's paying us for this. It's amazing. 
I would like to um, ask you a, a question about pay per view. And by the way, what, what we're watching right here is exactly what I remember about WWF '88. I mean, I don't remember anything about Morocco and Dino Bravo that I enjoyed, but I remember so much about Demolition and Heart Foundation, two of my favorites. And uh, it's fun to watch it back and just sort of bathe in the nostalgia. I do want to talk to you about the pay per view though, because we mentioned that this was obviously one of the big pay-per-view extravaganzas and Royal rumble at this point has just been a television show. So this is really number three for pay-per-view, but Vince is going to promote a boxing match. And we almost never talk about this. It's sugar Ray Leonard. And he's going to be in a boxing match for the WBC lightweight and super middleweight titles on November 17th. And that gets the rumor mill started in a big way that if Vince is throwing his hat into the boxing game and allegedly spending like 5 million bucks in order to get the rights to do so that perhaps he's eyeing a Hogan, Mike Tyson extravaganza. Tell me what you know about the sugar Ray Leonard fight and why Vince ventured into boxing, then why he didn't do more of it and anything about these Hogan Tyson rumors you can remember. No, the host, the Hogan Tyson rumors were always going to be there. That just was a natural going all the way back to Anoki and Ali that, yeah. And that's exactly what they were. They were just rumors. So, uh, you, whether there's any fire there to that smoke, there just wasn't other than talk and what ifs and different things, the Donnie Lalonde and sugar Ray fight was something that we did with sugar Ray. Vince was looking to expand into boxing and he had an opportunity to do it in Madison square garden in New York. He had an opportunity to bid on this fight. I don't think it was $5 million. I think it was closer to maybe $2 million, but I have no idea what the exact figures were. I just remember being said it was a lot, a lot less. Uh, he promoted the fight and we did it on pay-per-view. We used our production company, our production people, and did did the promotion for it. And I, I dare say it did really well on pay-per-view based off of all the promotion that it got through Superstars Wrestling, Wrestling Challenge, and Primetime. So it was it was a big deal. I've got pictures on my wall of me and Sugar Ray in Atlantic City um, promoting the fighter up in the Poconos, going through and uh, for his training. So it was it was an interesting time. It was a lot of fun. We had uh, we did a lot of co promotional stuff where we had Sugar Ray and Donnie on prime time and on our different shows. So yeah, it was something he wanted to do. Didn't stay in it because the boxing community really didn't embrace Vince McMahon in their world. Didn't want the wrestling guy in there. And and they didn't want the wrestling guy in there because of the connotation that it might be fixed. And so much of boxing is based on sports betting. And I understand, I mean, there was even a hesitation years ago, obviously that's eased up a little bit now, but there was a hesitation years ago from people in the mixed martial arts community, sort of co-mingling because they had that old school gambling is such a big part of our business because the Fertitas who were in the casino business, if they had a relationship with the quote unquote fake wrestling then it might negatively impact their business. That's before they got as big as they are and had so many other revenue streams and it wasn't nearly as important. That's coming from the boxing community. Uh, the, the, up, the upstanding never, sure. Never been fixed. <laughs> sure. <laughs> boxing community. Silly shit. Yeah. Yeah. And, but they, they didn't want, you know, they didn't want the wrestling people involved in that. And they certainly didn't want Vince taking it over kind of like he had done the wrestling and that's that's what they saw there was probably more concern on don king's part looking at i don't need another promoter in here dabbling in my world so there was it was fear and it it did well we got the hell out took it and and moved on you know later on he, he looked at doing some stuff with um oh my god i'm blank right now golden boy oscar de la hoya uh, many years later, but that just just didn't pan pan out. We did a little bit, but not a lot. 
Let's talk a little bit about this match. Both, um, both teams have said that they liked the match and that they, I mean, they both speak very highly of it. Why do you think these teams really work so well together in your opinion? Well, probably because they're, it's four tough son of a bitches out there beating the shit out of each other. And they liked it. Sometimes you get, sometimes you have chemistry with somebody. Sometimes you don't, these guys had chemistry with one another. So it was an, it was the ability for the hearts, the heart foundation to be baby faces against a heel tag team. So that helps because the hearts had been heels up until this point, And this was an opportunity for them to be true baby faces. So it was, a way to get them over. Let's uh, always, go ahead. No, I was going to say, I always like, you know, when you, you sit here, first of all, Barry Darso's hair, he has hair tremendous. Um, but it always looked like it had glitter in it. You yeah. ever notice that? It did. It's like, you know, now, I mean, the fact that he's got hair, cause very blesses little heart doesn't have any hair anymore. Axe had more of this glitter shit though than anybody. You think so? Yeah, for sure. Axe was always. I don't see it in Axe's hair. Let me mention um, Jim Neidhart. You know we haven't talked about him a ton. Of course, we've done Bret Hart episodes. We've done a demolition episode. Talked a little bit about the anvil before, but and I know every time we throw to him, you inevitably jump to some sort of a, a stew impersonation. Do you have any, any other stories about Jim, the man, not just funny ha ha's or, you know, I know that's what we try to do here on the show, but if we could have you share some Jim Neidhart stories that aren't just gags and ribs, that might be good. Well, Jim, the man, you know, he got the name, the anvil because he threw the anvil and, and he was one of the strongest son of a bitches that ever walked <laughs> the earth. You know, you, you would try and run into Jim. It was like running into a fire hydrant. He was just that thick and deceptively strong. You, you look at him and you go, Oh hell there. He's just through a drop kick. He was an incredible athlete, man. And very deceptively strong. I would put him up there with the, in strength categories with Kane and even guy like Mark Henry that was able to do shit, but he, he did the anvil toss and was one of the best in the world. And you kind of put him in that category of, of a Kerry Von Eric who was a discus thrower. Um, but I think people, because of his look and because of the big gut, they downplayed the athleticism of Jim Neidhart, but he was a, he was a stand up guy and got over more than anything on his toughness. Um, even when he was just learning to work and we had him in mid South when he was greener and fucking goose shit. Uh, he got over cause he could take punishment and give it out. And it looked real. I don't think he became really a gimmick until he, he got to, to WWE. Right. I remember him wearing the, he, he would wear a, a cowboy hat. And, and that was his deal. Just short trunks and, and a cowboy hat, an old black cowboy hat. And that was, that was Jim, the anvil Neidhart. Watts like Watts liked him because he was a tough guy. Yeah. He's a big bastard and obviously very powerful. That's Watts all day. Oh yeah. So, but no, nah, Neidhart, you know, Neidhart was Neidhart, man. He was fun. To, uh, he, he was exactly the opposite of the perception. Right. But to get to get Jim in a in a bar and just sit down and have a few beers and get him laughing and get him telling stories, it, he was a funny just, you know, one of the boys. Look at poor Fuji getting the living shit beaten out of him by Nightheart. There's a tough son of a bitch. Oh bullshit. That damn megaphone, Jimmy Hart, fucking them heart foundations. But that, you know, again, man, you look at, you look at the, uh, the great teams and without a doubt, man, demolition 
will go down as, as I think probably one of those greatest tag teams ever in WWE and here with the Hart Foundation, two of the best. What the hell is this? Who's that? Oh, that's Jimmy Hart. Look out, baby. See, Jimmy almost tripped, but he throws the megaphone, ba-boom, and we're out. Old school stuff, man. And Steve Taylor getting in the shot. I love it. The old wooden stairs come a long way since then, huh? My God, I hated those wooden stairs. I hated the wooden stairs because they were so damn narrow. It was like climbing up a ladder. It was like when I, I got in the ring at that uh, show in Huntsville and looked over and said, how the hell am I going to get up there? But it happens. Jimmy Hart's already in the back consulting with all the bad guys. There's Hercules who hasn't wrestled yet, but I think everybody else in the shot has. And I, the honk tonk man was robbed. I didn't even get my million dollar, didn't even get my million dollar jumpsuit off right here, baby. Me and Gene, you know, I was robbed that ultimate warrior. He's got my championship walking around. That makes a honky tonk man awful mad. Tell him honky, tell him, tell him. We're going to go right now down to Daytona beach. Why do you think, um, it's not talked about that Lawler's family is one of the most famous fa families in wrestling. It feels like, you know, you, you hear lots of other names, but nobody really talks about Brian Lawler, uh, you know, Brian Christopher, rather Jerry Lawler and the honky tonk man, all the same clan, man. Well, because none of them ever claimed any of the others. It's like, you know, Lawler and, and honky tonk are cousins. Oh my God. You know, you look at the Samoans, <laughs> they but there's out. only three of them and they, and neither one of them claims the other. It's just interesting to me. Here's the big boss man, AKA Eric Rottencrotch, friend of the show. He did a cosplay as him a few years ago. I put it on my Twitter feed. You got to see it. If you haven't already, I thought that was boss man. I know looks just like him. Identical, especially here. Early boss man and Eric Rottencrotch. Same person. Yes. Same person. There's a Rosati. This is a classic WWF here. The big boss man taking on Coco beware. And this is not too long after boss man debuted here. And we know that he is going to be a favorite opponent of Hulk Hogan. Who else in the company was high on boss man besides Hogan? God, I think everybody was, well, you know, once they got to work, DiBiase was loved working with him. Anybody that, that worked with boss man, shit, he was so damn easy to work with. And so giving that he was a favorite of people to work with. I loved working with him. I loved going out and doing the spots with him and taking his sidewalk slam and the damn, uh, ball in the gut and all that shit. Why do you think, you know, or how do you think, just talk me through the progression because Bossman, when he was with Crockett, was really just a heavy in the background. He didn't do shit. And now you guys have him, and you're giving him a push to the moon. And that's not necessarily something that happened a lot. You usually took top guys from other areas and then made them top guys for you. But he was very much a in the background, underneath guy. And now he's in a featured spot here. What did Vince see in him that nobody else did? Well, that, it goes back to, you know, sitting down and talking to him and getting inside what made him tick and what his desires were. I think boss man in the NWA was so happy to have any kind of a spot that he was willing to do whatever it is they asked him to do. Um, his, his true goal was he wanted to be a wrestler. He wanted to be in the business doing it. And he was so good at the big Bubba gimmick that they didn't want to deviate from that. So they, they did what, what worked. You know, so it's like watching now you see Coco where, and, and man, Coco from the minute he stepped into the business, here's a guy that main evented in, in Memphis came to mid South, got over in the mid South, which is a big man territory, got over huge and then, uh, caught the eye of Vince McMahon and came in and, and took the gimmick as far as he could possibly take it there in the WWF. So. It's, uh, it's a hell of a couple of guys in the ring right there. 
No doubt. I mean, three legends, boss, man, Coco Hebner. Yep. And the toughest and the toughest one in there is, is probably the one in the white trunks. No doubt. White tights. Yeah. You know, he's so tough that, um, he would be with, not with the company too much longer after this. He had, uh, a situation. Uh, he whipped Jim Troy's ass and allegedly it was Shawn Michaels who started it. And it just sort of, that's Coco Beware's version of events. Well, the version from everyone else is, was that Jim Troy pretty much started it and, and kept it on and just continued it until there was, there was nothing else that Coco could do. And it was an unfortunate situation, but you know, Vince's hands were tied. He couldn't have that. Just, just couldn't have two guys, you know, a wrestler beating up an office guy and an office guy being as fucked up as Troy was doing what he did. So it was a message. And I, I don't think that Vince and Vince even said to Coco and I, because I was, I was in the office when he, when he talked to him on the, on the phone, uh, when he was over there and said, Coco, this isn't forever, but you got to go home. Yeah. And he got other opportunities. Yeah. Um, and and it, it just was, it, it was a sad situation. Uh, did, did you ever meet my friend, super Dave Miller? I have super Dave Miller. Allegedly his sister had a relationship with Coco beware. Well, hell how about that? Cause if you're going to tell me his wife, Stephanie did, I'd be like really pissed. I like me some super Dave and Stephanie. Wait. So if she hooked up with Coco, you're mad. Yes. Because her and Dave are so happy. And I thought you were going to tell oh, me. Oh no, like, no, no. I meant back in the day. Uh, oh, okay. Co Coco was coming to the ring. I think he may or may not have been a heel when he was working down south. And um, he looked at Super Dave's sister and said, "I'm gonna run this big black dick up your ass, girl." Well, damn. And that's how they met. Really? <laughs> <laughs> it's a real story, by the way. I don't believe Coco would do that. No, I mean he was getting heat. Okay. He got, okay. I'm not even going to touch it. <laughs> I know you often try to get me to touch it, but I ain't going to touch it. I don't even know what you're talking about. Yeah. I don't know why that's funny to me, but it is. You're a bad man, Conrad Thomas. Well, I'm, I'm sorry that you see it that way, but you'd be seeing a lot better if you just use simple contacts. They're the most convenient way to renew your contact lens prescription and reorder your brand of contacts from anywhere in minutes. And guys, I actually did this. I renewed my prescription. I want to talk you through what this is too. You can actually take a five minute, simple contacts vision test online. I did it on my phone. That's a real thing. It was reviewed by a licensed doctor and then they got me a renewed prescription and I was able to just reorder my contacts right then. No appointments, no waiting rooms, no more overpaying. My time has been at a premium this summer. The idea that I could do this at my desk was a huge deal for me. I mean, it really is that simple. You just need your current contacts, an internet connection and 10 feet. Now the doctor's office is wherever you are. They've got all the brands, all the different types of lenses you'll need. And, uh, they've even got the vision test for just 20 bucks. 20 bucks is what your exam is shipping all your standard shipping. It's free. Now, I want to make this clear. This isn't a replacement for your periodic full eye health exam. You still need that occasionally, but man, this is the most convenient way to renew your prescription and just get those contacts on the way. It worked for me. It'll work for you. I love it. And they're offering a special offer here. $20 off your first order of contacts. Just go to simplecontacts.com forward slash wrestle and enter that code wrestle at checkout. I want to give that to you again. It's simplecontacts.com forward slash wrestle, or just put wrestle as your code at checkout. And you're going to get $20 off your first order. They just show up to your house, man. It doesn't get any easier. You don't have to go to any doctors. I love it. Simplecontacts.com forward slash wrestle, or just use the promo code wrestler. You're going to save 20 bucks. Well, you sure as hell, once you get your contacts and see big boss, man, whoop Coco's ass. 
And holy cow, was boss man <laughs> just young in the big gut. And there's poor Frankie looking. Coco beat. Coco beat. Watch this damn sidewalk slam here. Nothing. Nothing. Like a feather. And the big belly hanging out there. Just like. That's why you keep on thinking it's Eric Rotten Crotch. Why? Because that big belly hanging out there like that. Uh, he's doing that DDPY now. There's less of that big belly. Okay. Well, good for him. I like it. I like it. Look at that garden. You know, the, the one shot that we haven't seen here that you see in every single Madison Square Garden show is the shot of the roof of the garden. Oh, yeah. You're exactly right. And that roof is iconic. They put it on a lot of marketing material now for them, like it's part of their logo and everything. Exactly. Oh my God. Can you imagine these guys having to pretend like they give a fuck about the ultimate warriors win here? Yeah, they do. Look at Morocco. Is Morocco in a towel? Yeah. And David, David, I'm going to smile. JYD's back there. Yeah. What exactly am I supposed to be doing back here? Fuck this guy. I should be in a continental champion. I'm going <laughs> to leave now. <laughs> Gonna be the day, day, say, I don't know what I'm saying because I go around the universe. I cannot work and my fucking shit is stiff. Yeah. I hate I that you shit on the Ultimate Warrior so much because I loved I'm, him as a kid. Well, that's because you didn't fucking know him. You didn't have to work with him. Man, how about the vascularity? Is there any wonder that Vince McMahon is in love with him? Sean Mooney looks like he's enamored a little bit right there. Sean Mooney looks like he's happy to get a check. By the way, Sean Mooney, who is now a big time, badass professional broadcaster out in Tucson, Arizona. Back in these So he days, wasn't a badass broadcaster here. Nah, here's what I mean. When you go back and you watch Mooney stuff from like when he first starts, he, I, I, I'm sure this is direction from Vince. He's just yelling everything. And then folks, tomorrow night at Market Square Arena, we've got King Kong Buddy taking on Coco Beware. Let's go to these words right now. And it was just everything's out of fucking 11. And now it's just a much more deliberate delivery. And speaking of deliberate delivery, here comes Jake the Snake Roberts with the bag. And man, how over was this gimmick in 88? Fucking hell, man. The snake it in the back. Look at that. The, man, my mom. You know, so much of me watching wrestling as a kid is my parents thinking, watching with me and being like, this is fucking stupid. Uh, but my mom was like, Lord, is there a snake in that bag? I mean, this gets the casual non wrestling fans attention. Just that there is a giant snake in that bag. And you don't even have to see it to know it's there. It really is pretty genius when you think about it. Yeah. And I think Jake didn't want to have anything to do with that damn snake. But it was really the, the turning point in so many ways to take that gimmick to the next level and complete Jake the Snake Roberts, man. It's uh, <laughs> it's just dump the fucking snake over. I don't worry about it. It's only a snake. Our snake-loving uh, listeners are going to be pissed off for that one. Probably. Yeah. But then if we talk about feed, just feed the snake rabbit, then the rabbit lovers would be pissed off at us. Are we just going to see how many people we can get pissed off at us on this one? You are. Oh, okay. Well, I, trust me. You've had your share of pissed off at this. No, I'm sure I have. And, people are pissed off at me for Starcast by now. Oh, well, hell yeah. Definitely. All the hate tweets will go there. That's fun. But you know what? Here's the thing. Okay. If there wasn't a Starcast, it wasn't an effort to do a Starcast, and you would have nothing to hate, you would have nothing to complain about, you wouldn't have an experience of a lifetime that is a once in a lifetime experience. No, so, I, I agree. What? But you know, I'm, is what it is. I'm a first time promoter, so there's going to be shit that I didn't know. I don't know what I don't know, but I'm going to find Here. out this fucking weekend. And, uh, they're, but they're going to let me know about it. You know, parking was tight and the cheeseburger wasn't cooked all the way. And, um, their room was dirty and the air conditioner quit working and all that's my fault. And the lines it were is. crazy. And, um, Tony Schiavone wasn't nice. And all, you know, all of that is my fault. The Tony Schiavone's not nice. Well, I'm mean, just saying, you know, I know that you know, there's no pleasing everybody 
and there's like over 9,000 tickets sold to this thing. I'm going to get a lot of hate. I know what's coming. I'm one and done as a wrestling promoter. I'd, I'd rather just go back to being, you know, the baby face that everybody likes on the podcast and not the shit. When, when is that? Well, they really like me on this show. I don't know if you know that or not. No. Yeah, they do. They don't like you. because they, they know you're full of shit. I'm the voice of they them. They love me. No. I'm them. Yep. I am them. You're the liar. You're the, you're the McMahonite. No, the problem is, is that I tell the truth and I dispel all the lies that you've been fed your entire life. Well, I don't think that's necessarily a problem. I think that's why people listen. And when thankfully they're listening, cause we asked them, Hey, you got any questions about SummerSlam 88 fire away? I'm going to do some right here, Bruce. Cause I don't really want to talk about this Hercules match. Do you blame me? No, nah, go ahead and fire away because they're locked in a headlock side headlock right now by Jake, the snake Roberts. And we can either talk about that, or you can say, go Josh Kuhn wants to know how did slick come to the company? I always thought he was an underrated manager. Um, rumored innuendo was that he was like Rufus R Jones son. That is not the case. Uh, he was a manager in Kansas city and Vince got wind of him and liked him. Thought he cut a great promo and brought him up for an interview. He was, he was there before I was. So chat me up about warlord. This is a great question from Josh. Kane. he says, we hear lots of stories about barbarian and never hear anything about warlord. Warlord kind of kept to himself was a quiet guy. There's not a whole lot of, of stories about him. He, especially when you have as colorful of a partner as the barbarian that it was just what it was, man. Terry, Terry went through, didn't really bother many people. And that's really all there is to it. Not a lot of stories. Cause he didn't create a lot. Billy Staggs wants to know about the relationship between Macho's household and Hogan's household here. Of course, the insinuation is that there was going to be a time that probably hasn't happened yet where Liz and Randy were having problems. And she sort of confided in Linda and Hogan found himself caught in the middle. What's the relationship like with Randy and Liz Hulk and Linda at this point? I really don't know. You know, I, I assume that it was cordial and that, that they did things together, but also at this time, you have to remember that the boys were on the road 300 days a year. So there wasn't a whole lot of time to be, uh, social in any any form that you can really relate to. So, uh, I'm sure they were cordial, knew each other. And, and that was probably about it at this period. Cause it, for Randy and Liz, it was all work during this time. Matthew wants to know who thought it'd be a good idea to use superstar as a color guy. I heard him on a few house shows as well on the network and he was the shits. He was Vince really was looking for a spot for him. He couldn't do anything phys- physically. Uh, because of his hip and what have you, we tried him as a manager with Don Morocco and we were just looking for a spot for him. Dan wants to know, why did we not get Jake versus rude here? Not ready for it. That was a house show match. Michael wants to know why didn't the mega bucks counter the bikini with Virgil and a banana hammock? You know, we discussed that and, uh, the problem was we couldn't find a banana hammock that big. So it had to be scrapped. Horror movie barbecue wants to know, we all know how Randy felt, but was Liz... horror movie barbecue. <laughs> yeah. He came to our show in Rochester. Oh shit. Uh, yeah, I remember. I remember. We all know how Randy felt, but was Elizabeth uncomfortable with her role at the end of the night? She looked nervous and uneasy. Guys, go back and watch all of Liz's stuff. She always looked nervous and uneasy. That was her character. She's working. So obviously she did a really good job of that. Tim wants to know, why were the powers of pain brought in as baby faces? Why not? Okay. Because you had, you had heel champions and in demolition and that's where we wanted to go eventually. Uh, Chris wants to know what was the relationship between Jesse and Hulk like at this time? Was this before or after their issues with the rumored wrestlers union? 
Oh God, that rumored wrestlers union was so many years before that, you know, Jesse really didn't have a relationship with much of anybody. Jesse came in, did his job and went home. And during this time we were doing the voiceovers in the studio. So Jesse was only around the boys at a pay-per-view and that was it. Jesse really didn't have a relationship with Hogan at this point or anybody else for that matter. Um, Ken Patera versus bad news. Brown who booked this shit. Uh, Vince Pat would have booked that. Who else was considered to beat the honky talk man besides the ultimate warrior. Wow. Uh, beefcake beefcake would have been a good intercontinental champion at that time. Anybody else? Mm, no, Jake didn't need it. You know, I'm, I'm trying to think of baby faces that, that were in that mix. Um, Duggan was talked about, but Duggan didn't really need it either. But the only one I really remember was beefcake. Michael wants to know how would Jim Cornette describe Elizabeth's bikini? What the fuck? The goddamn bikini. I don't even see any fucking midriff or goddamn cleavage. Might as well be my grandma's fucking underpants. Goddamn bloomers, motherfucker. Neil wants to know. Fuck was, you. Thank you. Neil wants to know. Motherfucker. Was, thank you. Was this the first time they turned the actual damn lights on in Madison Square Garden? It always looked cheap and dirty on the MSG network shows. Um, trying to think. Yes. Uh, because of, for WrestleMania one, they had the regular garden lighting and this was our TV lighting. This may have been the first time that we actually had TV lighting in there. Jason wants to know, was Jesse Ventura's three count at the end, a shoot not to count three when Randy Savage had to force his arm down. Yeah, that was a shoot, folks. <laughs> that was uh, Jason Fields at jfields85. Thanks for listening, buddy. Uh, work, smile, humble. The WWF Superstars arcade game was heavily based off of SummerSlam 88. Have you ever played it, and do you have any memories of the boys playing it? What was the question again? It's about the old Superstars arcade game, which I fucking the love. Okay, not the pinball game. No, I it's played a, the pinball games and I played, yeah, I did play that. Um, of course you did. And you're actually going to be playing in the video game tournament that we've got going down at Starcast. If you haven't already check it out at starcast.com. You can actually donate to St. Jude's Bruce is going to be playing for charity and he's playing the brand new PlayStation four game fire pro wrestling world, which is obviously a Sue, Sue, super new game. Uh, that just came out and, uh, you're in there with a bunch of other wrestling personalities and uh, we auctioned off a spot to play in that tournament and man, it's a who's who in this thing. Sean Waltman's going to be joining you, Ron Funches, Matthew from Botchamania, Noel Foley. Uh, we've got the bears, both Barry and Bernard and your boy from MLW, former WWE superstar, Simon Grimm will all be participating in the video game tournament. So way back in the day. Did you play this superstars arcade game? Remember any of the boys talking about it? Yeah, we had one in the office, so I played it often. As a matter of fact, wasn't any good at it, but definitely played it. I sure as hell didn't play with that damn snake rolling around there, man. I, ugh. Still creeps me out. I'm not a snake person. How about the finish here? Bro, perfect. Smooth as silk. Look at the crowd pop for the DDT. That DDT was over like hell, man. And now they use it as a, as a high spot and get right up from it. But man, when he hit it there, the whole crowd went banana. Exactly. Cause you, they knew, they knew the end was near. They knew they were going to see Damien. Yeah. Snake put Damien down my pants one night in the ring. How about this flashback here? What an old school graphic that is. Ooh. I think you savage choke you like dog shit. Right. That's so really choke in my hand. That's right. <laughs> yeah. one, one of the things that um 
stuck out to me on these old flashbacks when we watch it back now is they blur out the word wrestling on superstars of wrestling. How crazy is that? Really? Yeah. That's weird. It is weird. So they blur it out on challenge too. If the word wrestling is in it, it's out. That's cray cray. I love Bobby Heenan just gets like one cheap shot in there. How would you describe? Oh, look at this goof. Your boy. Craig Benervini, the one that, that was, uh, that wouldn't come to our show in Fort Lauderdale. Yeah. He big, he big leagued us. Oh, okay. Wow. There he is. He was probably 12 at that time. Yeah. That sounds about right. Yeah. Something like that. I got a joke, but I'm going to keep it to myself. Uh, let's talk about uh, some more questions here. Defense wants to know why was there a need for a special referee? Because the match was, it was mega. There was mega powers and mega bucks. You need a mega ref. Uh, this wasn't, it wasn't the bucks against the powers. It was the mega bucks against the mega powers. So you needed mega referee. Uh, why did Hogan have to win every match and always be in the main event? Cause he drew the most money. Nope. Try again. That's why. No, no. One more. Well, it's very simple, Conrad. He drew the most money and people wanted to see him pose. Therefore, Hogan must pose. Thank you. We got there. Um, Aaron Carolla wants to know what would it sound like if Hakushi cut a mega powers promo with Savage instead of Hulk Hogan? These questions are way too long. What? Hakushi's going to cut a mega powers promo with Savage instead of Hulk Hogan. Akushi didn't talk. Okay, you know what he means. He means. Oh, we're talking about Sato. I mean, yeah, he means Shinja. Oh, and when he's talking about. Never mind. This, God damn. This would be a bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> this, these are questions. A bullshit. You must say, have Sato do the fucking thing because you question. I had to tell you, JJ. <laughs> There's brother love. There's brother love. There's brother love. And they had wrestling challenge on there. Talk to me about this SummerSlam. Do you remember what day of the week it was held on? It was on a Monday, I think. That's my question. Why? Well, because it was Monday night in the garden. What the fuck? Well, <laughs> why not? You know, that look, there was no rhyme or reason to it. It was, we ran the garden on Monday nights. And I think that that probably had more to do with it than anything. You know, you know how dumb that answer is though, right? Why? Was WrestleMania on a Monday night? No, but it was, but it was in the garden. I mean, duh. No, you run the garden on Monday night. The garden was probably booked and Vince wanted to run it in the garden and just said, fuck it. We'll do it on Monday night. Sunday didn't become the pay-per-view day for God, another couple of years. Not arguing that. Uh, Ed wants to know where does this SummerSlam rank amongst all time SummerSlams? Well, it's the original. So for me, it's up there and it was great because I was on it. You know, five seems like a silly question, but we got it three or four times. Did Macho Man have a problem with Elizabeth touching Hulk Hogan's chest for the poster? <laughs> well, why, where, where do these, I, I, I don't know what, what kind of thought process goes through people's minds on things like that. Folks, we're in the entertainment business. We're, we're in a physical entertainment business too. So you touch people. If you got a problem with that, don't be in the business. Matt wants to know, can we pass on this and hear about Patreon and Starcast for 100% of the show instead of 80? Thanks. I'm actually fine with that. If we just want to ignore what's going on with the rest of the show and just talk about Patreon, because you get so much extra content over at patreon.com forward slash something to wrestle. And it's only like nine bucks and Starcast now. I don't know if you heard Bruce, you get daily passes, just 20 bucks gets you in. You got to check this out. Starcast on fight is the place to be 
this Labor Day weekend. Fight.tv forward slash Starcast. I'm sure you have more call, comments and thoughts about Patreon and Starcast. We want to make sure Matt's happy here. Well, I do because I spent probably about an hour just doing extra video stuff the other day that'll be sprinkled out all weekend long. So it's the only place to get exclusive when I'm just pondering and get my thoughts from deep within. That's inside. Uh huh. Uh, yeah. So that's the place to get it because it's exclusive to Patreon members. Kind of like Jesse Ventura coming out in that hot ass leather fucking jacket in August. Yes. Hey, so how about the kid in the front row who had the super legit macho cosplay going? Freak out, freak out. Uh huh. Oh yeah. Gotta love it. Jesse doesn't keep this thing on the whole time. Does he? Well, you're going to find out, aren't you? Yeah, we are. Dave wants to know what sound did Andre make in the ring when Elizabeth unveiled the secret weapon? Ruh-roh. Dr. Delicious. This is the hard hitting stuff we need here. Any truth to the rumor that Virgil was going to be given a run with the world title after this pay-per-view or was he just one of those guys that didn't need it? Hashtag meat sauce. Oh yeah. We were, we were going to have Virgil just actually in this particular matchup, we were going to have him beat Andre DiBiase and then, uh, do the old flapjack on Hogan and Savage beat. He was going to pile them up and beat them together. I mean, it makes sense. So you open the pay-per-view with him. This is true. Oh, I shit on you. You know, Andre was giant. Really? Was he? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, he was. But I really don't, I don't. I don't know that I knew that. I appreciate you telling us that. Yeah. And as Bobby Heenan said, he didn't sweat. He molted. That's fucking funny. So uh, Jesse took the jacket off. Jake Roberts. I should mention uh, his match with Hercules got a star and a quarter. And here comes your main event. And how about this iconic look? The yellow and red with the mega powers. Yep. Passing the grill position. As you saw, there were just the two monitors. There's Jim Troy in the, uh, entryway there. Um, yeah, that's, yeah, that was the, that was the follow garden follow, man. If, if the director at Madison square garden could have used that for every entrance, he would have. Why did he like it so much? I don't know. I guess taking people backstage, just give them a peek behind the curtain. I like it. It makes it special i dig it i I love that mega powers cape that savage has i do too but i love the trunks i love the hulk rule shirt i mean this is what i grew up on this is my favorite look for these guys red and yellow yellow and red Uh uh-huh freak out freak out yeah here we go Uh uh-huh as i mentioned um jake and herc got a star and uh, a quarter boss man and coco ware got a star in three quarters what we're about to see here, believe it or not, it gets two and three quarters. Well, that's just stupid. Why? Was Liz was Liz not the most beautiful valet that there ever was? No. Sonny was. No. You're wrong. No, Liz was. How about the Velcro on Macho Man's world title right there? He's taking the snaps off of that uh Reggie Park's belt, and now he's got Velcro. Easy access, brother. Uh huh. Yeah. First name, my two last name, man. Check out the mega powers. Uh huh. How about, uh, how about the tuxedo shirt? Got the Tony Clifton look rocking here. <laughs> I say I was going to go with the Jerry Seinfeld puffy shirt. Yeah. The pirate shirt. Yeah. The pirate shirt. Yeah. The puff, the puffy shirt. And Heenan actually pulling out, you know, this is during a time that Bobby was, was, trying to go to, uh, to easier to carry wear, but for pay-per-views, he'd break out the, uh, the nice sport coats. Jesse actually wants to be a good referee here. Lots of questions about why he was the guest referee. It's because he had so much damn star power at the time. That was it, man. And it, this was the, the summer of, um, uh, predator. Really? Ain't got time to bleed. Yeah, I think, I, I think it was. If it wasn't Predator, it was Running Man. 
but he had a, he had had a big uh, movie out this summer, so that was one of the reasons to capitalize on that with him. Big star, big star. Uh oh, what the hell's happening here? Checking the turnbuckle. What's going on? Oh, he's oh he had Putting to move the it tag to the ropes. Other corner. There you go. He's being super yeah. legit, taking his time. Well, you got to get your time in, brother. Uh, Meltzer. Well, whoever put the fucking tag rope, they put the tag ropes in the wrong corner. Oh, see, you know what? Hey, we got to go back to that question. Looks like there's some legitimate heat there between Jesse and Hogan. That's why Jesse changed ropes just to piss Hogan off for this match, from that heat way back when. Let me ask you here. Uh, Meltzer called this quote, the most forgettable event in the brief history of pay-per-view wrestling. Your thoughts. Fuck him. He's an idiot. Meltzer speculating that, uh, the pay-per-view is purchased by about 450,000 homes on pay-per-view and going to grow somewhere between seven and $8 million, which would have meant a boatload of cash for the WWF. Of course, the WWF claims 880,000 homes. And $11 million. What say you? Was this considered a huge success internally? It was considered a huge success internally. Yes. Very much so. Everybody was happy with it. Around the same time, your boy, Ron Trongard, who was an AWA announcer, came to the WWF briefly. Didn't last very long. What's up with that? Well, Rod had a great, that great radio and announcer voice. I'm Rod Trongard. Um, Vince loved his voice. He had, he had a face for radio. He was an older gentleman, really super nice guy, but his time had passed and he wasn't really able to keep up the pace. He wasn't able to do, uh, all the traveling that was required. Rod had been a mainstay for Vern Gagne in the AWA and, uh, never really had to travel the way that we, needed him to travel and it just took his toll on him. And he was also sick. He, he had cancer and, um, that was it. We should mention here that, um, a couple of weeks after this, Arn and Tully quit the NWA and immediately dropped the tag titles to the midnight express on a house show in Philadelphia. And they come to the WWF right after, uh, and not too terribly long after that, that, um, we see Ted Turner buy out Jim Crockett promotions. What do you remember about Arn and Tully coming in? Um, man, just that, you know, the, the, the Crockett was having issues and best of my re yeah, recollection was that it was money issues that they looked to, to come in and come into greener pastures. So everybody was happy about, um, Arn and Tully coming in. I thought it was a, a good deal for them to come in. I remember when Ted Turner purchased the NWA calling Vince, like, Hey Vince, I'm in the wrestling business. Now I just bought me a wrestling company. And Vince congratulated him and said, we're in the entertainment business, Ted. Good luck to you. That was it. What's Andre's physical position or condition like at this time? You know, he, I think Andre would argue and tell you he was fine, but it, it was deteriorating. I, he wanted to work more, but you could tell he just couldn't do a whole lot of things, man. He couldn't do more. So, um, and when I say Andre wanted to work more, what Andre really wanted was to be on the road. Right. Andre, Andre just wanted to be out. He wanted to be around the boys and he wanted to be, be moving. Um, but as you see, you know, Ted's in there for, for the purpose of working and, and the boss was there to be a giant, come in and choke somebody when he needed to. You got three, uh, really good work and shape dudes here though. DiBiase and Savage have become very familiar with each other. Both regarded as being two of the tops. Obviously Hogan knows how to pull his own weight. So really you don't have that much to sort of cover up. 
No, you don't. It, and that was it was by design. You also had on the outside for distractions and, and things to do. You had Heenan and Virgil and, of course, Elizabeth. So this wasn't looking to have, you know, whatever you want to call your 18 star match, what have you. This was a story. This was about building the relationship between Hulk Hogan and the Macho Man and telling the story, you know, of, of Andre and Hogan and continuing that along. So this was to start that underneath shit to get us to WrestleMania. So as, you, as you'll see here at the end, and it was all nuances. Um, so yeah, it's, it's about telling stories and you have to start somewhere. And this was a start. When you look at, when you look at the totality of everything, so that's why I get upset with people. It's like, okay, you didn't like that. You'll understand it when we get to the, to the very end of the story. And you'll understand why we did certain things that we did. And Andre did this well. He liked to choke. Roar. I hold on to trapezius. I stand here. And Hogan sold. And Jesse reft. <laughs> you know, what's funny is this really doesn't age well, but at the time people were into it unless you were Dave Meltzer. Yeah, people were into it. I mean, th this was the biggest story and the, the, the garden's going nuts and Hulk is, I mean, he is the biggest star in the business and a simple spot, you know, Andre choking Hogan. And the funny part about it is, is. Andre is choking the living fuck out of him right now with his shoulder strap. Yeah, for real. Yes, for real. Yeah. <laughs> and laughing about it. So, but you've got, you have the four biggest stars in the company right now in, in a tag team match. And it was, you know, this was all new with SummerSlam. And it was, this was an experiment and one that obviously worked out well so that we're still having SummerSlam today. Um, Got to start somewhere, people. This is that one of the slow two camp. So yeah, I mean he's a heel. He's a heel. Well, that's why it was Hogan down. He should have counted faster. So watch. Oh, that's good to be. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that's bullshit. Overall, you know, WrestleMania is still the number one show. When you guys are done with this, do you think that Survivor Series is still the number two show or has SummerSlam replaced it? Um, tell you what, SummerSlam, the feeling coming off of this was we had, was A, that we have to do it again. Um, I think in our minds, still because Survivor was first, that Survivor was probably the second most important, you know, big show on pay per view. Yeah, and we only had three at this point, but still, it was it was considered that that Survivor was was still the you know the important one. Not that they all weren't important. As far as the agents at the time, you know, Pat, who else would have been an agent at the time? Lanza, Strongbow, Goulet, Gurria. Um, didn't have Jim Myers yet, but those were the main ones. Um, yeah, Dave Hebner was an agent, but mainly, you know, Lanza Strongbow were the two main agents. Adam, ah. Adam wants to know is the opening match with the Bulldogs and Rujo's not one of the best quote unquote curtain jerker matches ever. I thought it was very good. I thought so too. Yeah, definitely. It's not, you know, and I hate that term curtain jerker. It, it, you know, it's, it's a way, it's how you start your show. Right. You either start it in a good way or if, if it's a curtain jerker match to me, that's a negative connotation and it's a shitty match. I don't think it was a shitty match. And we tried to open up with damn good matches. Francis wants to know who came up with the SummerSlam poster. Probably the art department, but Vince with, with, uh, Hogan and I mean, Hogan and Savage on there with Liz. Yeah. 
Yeah, I remember seeing that very, very early on. And I remember that was one of those instances of Vince being so particular about the color of blue. And I'm thinking, you know, it's blue. It's a light, you know, it's kind of a light blue. No, I want that royal blue. I want this, you know, shade different and looked at all these different shades. And I was amazed at the attention to detail that he had on what I had considered at the time, you know, little things, but they were big to him. Up top, uh-huh, freak out, double X, count, bitch. Not going to cover him yet, uh-uh, because I'm not done. Ryan wants to know, with this being JYD's last pay-per-view for the WWF, what did you think of his run there overall, and why did he leave? I thought JYD had a good run, and JYD was just, you know, ready to move on. I think that at the time, you know, Crockett was looking for dog and wanted dog to come in. And I think guys always feel that the grass is greener on the other side, but I thought it was run. He had a good run. Michael wants to know how far out was it planned that honky talk man would lose the intercontinental title to warrior. Was it discussed right after WrestleMania four? No, it was not discussed after WrestleMania four. I don't think that was really discussed until the middle of the summer. And I don't know when I, I can't pinpoint exactly when it was. I never heard about it till middle of the summer. Jeremy wants to know, is it safe to say that Hogan and Savage was the rock and Austin of the eighties? Well, I think people would say that rock and Austin were the Hogan and Savage. You know, every now and again, somebody will ask the stupidest fucking question, <laughs> but I still want to read it. Can I give you the dumbest? Of course, of course you do. You're tickled. Look at you. You're tickled. You're fucking giggling again. Jareth writes. <laughs> Did Hogan shave his dong? <laughs> Did Hogan shave his dong in the late eighties? Rumor and innuendo would lead you to believe that he kept it all natural. According to Meltzer in the dirt sheets, Meltzer would write Hogan is gone. <laughs> What is wrong with you? <laughs> Why are people? I will never understand <laughs> your fascination. With I'm reading a question. It's hilarious to me that somebody would ask that. It's almost as hilarious as our ad. We, our ad read last week, which by the way, um, got over in a big way. Is that the most hilarious ad we've ever done? Do you think? I mean, that, uh, yeah, that could be. And, and I have gotten so much response from people that I didn't even know. Listen to the show. Who are interested in stretching a little bit, using a little gradual well, tension. So that's what I said. I said, you know, it's interesting. That's the one thing you bring up out of all the things I've ever said on the show and done on the show that this, you bring up. I didn't even know you were a listener, but now I know that you need a little yeah. stretch in action. Exactly. You said you liked it. I mean, yeah, I'll never forget. You told me you'd been using it for years, so I had to try it. Well, I, I haven't, but. I imagine it's all good and Hulk hulking up by God. Cause ain't nobody can sell like the million dollar man, Ted DiBiase. What a great camera angle that is. I love that. I feel like it was only used to no holds barred and right there. Really? I hate it. I love it. Yeah. I'm, I'm not a big fan of it. I, I like, I like the, uh, I, I just like a different version of it. I, I wasn't, I don't want to look at it straight like this. I want to see it from the angle over a pole. I don't know why. I think just because it's different like that right there. I love that angle. Like if I was in the crowd, that'd be a great seat to have, but it's at home on television. You don't want to be in the crowd. I kind of do. Well then go be in the crowd, but it's in New York and I'm seven. Well, t tell mom and dad to get off the couch and take you to New York. How many times did your parents take you to New York for wrestling when you were seven? Well, three, well, that's three more than mine. Three okay. more than mine. Roar. Roar. Well, those headbutts hurt. Hogan hated when he grabbed his hair like that. Cause he's got so little left. It's coming out. Well, yeah. That's why you should go to four hymns.com. Oh my God. They're not even a sponsor this week. Oh, well still we'll give him a cheap plug. Well, you didn't now look at the attention to detail. You see the rug on the outside of the ring. It's still there when they're out there selling and, and my rug is still just bundled up on the side of the ring. They didn't even move it. 
And and you think and you look at those things now and go, oh my God, but that's how we learned. Uh oh, there's the weasel. Weasel's up. Liz is on the apron. Is this her secret weapon? Everybody's looking. By the way, I should mention this segment of the show. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. Still to this day, it gets me. Nobody needs Zynga pro now. Oh, hell no. Look at that. Itsy bitsy teeny weeny yellow. Wait a minute. It's red and yellow and there's no polka dots and it's not even a bikini. Yeah, it's not a bikini. It's not yellow. There are no polka dots and the baby faces are using a girl flashing herself as a it distraction. Worked. And they're shaking hands on the outside of the ring. The big stupid handshake, which is awesome, but dumb. And here they come. Uh -huh. And she threw her skirt in his face like a heel. Everything about Hogan in this era is like subtle heel, but still a baby face. Here comes the body slam. Now the big elbow drop. Not before I point. Uh huh. There you go. Drop that leg, bitch. <laughs> uh huh. And this is the shoot right yeah, here. This is the shoot right here. <laughs> Jesse did not do it. Savage said, yeah, you're going to do it. You're going to count to three because that's what we do. Uh huh. And here's the spot we talked about recently where Liz comes in, tries to get Macha's attention, patting him on the back once, twice. He sort of shoes her away. Get out of here. So she goes over to celebrate with Hogan. Hogan's got nothing but love for her. Picks her up, twirls it, her around. Uh, and now you see a shot of Macho Man seeing what's going on here as Hogan's holding her up. And he sees what's going on and comes back, puts his arms out like, what the hell? And she gives him a hug. That's right, brother. And Hogan, oblivious, shakes his hand, raises his arm. But now Hogan's spinning her skirt around his head. Yeah. Wait a minute. That costs a lot of money. Can we get the skirt back, brother? And put it into a different outfit. Uh-huh. It's amazing. Macho's gonna pose. Oh yeah. I think I'll pose too here in a minute, brother. So they're happy again. They're mega powers. Nothing can divide the mega powers. Well, there you go, man. I'm pretty excited about, um, SummerSlam 1988, obviously the very first SummerSlam, a very important show in company history. And one of my earliest wrestling memories overall, you're going to say this is top five SummerSlams. Yep. I am because it was the first, it was the first it's memorable and it set the stage for the rest. And it started the beginning of a great, one of the greatest stories ever told. We've covered it to death. And, uh, this show was a missing link. And of course we covered it most recently, uh, here today, because we're right all right upon the 30 year anniversary, which is clearly a very, very big deal. 30 years. Yeah. It's crazy. Wait a minute. I was 25. That would make me 35. Yeah. If you were 25, then you had 30 to that and you're 35 now. That makes sense. Right. Yeah. And your kids, they're both 19. So you had them when you were a sophomore in high school. Yeah. Yeah. That's what but, I thought. But yet you still ache and creep and crack. And you went to work for Vince McMahon here as a Ute. As a young Ute. As a 24 year old kid, by God. If you haven't already, go check us out on Patreon. We're going to have some bonus content for you, some behind the scenes action from Starcast. And there's a hand on the ass. There it was. We've also got uh, lots of interesting things like uh, on Thursday, Bruce, uh, which was last night, and it's still up there on Twitch. We had footage of PCO's live exhibition from the Twitch stream. You can check it out at twitch.tv forward slash Starcast. And you can pre-order the rest of the days or just go ahead and pick up yesterday on a day pass right now at fight.tv forward slash starcast. Bruce, that's going to do it for me, man. I'm looking forward to uh, 
can hang out with you and hopefully we're still on speaking terms after the roast later today no guarantees but there is I a guarantee. just be top boy well 50 50 at best uh, okay. i don't know i don't know why i'm doing math because apparently scott steiner's looking for me and he's doing math that he's gonna bitch slap me so this might be the last something to wrestle i hope it's not and if it's not we'll be back right here next week on something to wrestle with I'm bruce pritchard Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to Something to Wrestle with Bruce Pritchard. And man, am I excited for today? It's finally here. SummerSlam 1989. Bruce, I'm looking forward to this one. But before we talk about this week, what was the feedback you got from last week's show, SummerSlam 99? Absolutely lovely, brother. How could you? I mean, I think that most people agreed with me it wasn't the greatest show in the whole wide world. But, you know, it was memorable for all the right reasons, if you will. Yeah. And we hope that, uh, Starcast is memorable. We should mention that we're right knee deep in the middle of Starcast. If you haven't already, you can join us right now at Starcast on fight. Uh, we are fresh on the heels of, uh, some fun stuff last night. We've got some more fun stuff tonight and tomorrow, sort of the main event. Check it out. Starcast on fight.com. Bruce, this is the first Starcast you're not a part of. You feeling left out. That hurts my feelings, man. Well, dude, you're working 21 and a half hours a day. Like, I didn't figure you could fit me in anymore. Again, kayfabe that. Okay, I got it. And without further ado, we're going to have you fire up the WWE Network. Go to SummerSlam 1989, which went down August 28th. I can't believe it's been 30 years, dude. Uh, August 28th, 1989. So when you've got that network fired up, you're going to uh, hear Bruce give a little bit of a countdown. He's going to say three, two, one play. And when he has, he says, play, you're going to press play. We're off to the races, baby. And usually while we're letting everybody get everything fired up and so on and so forth, that usually, you know, I like to try and go back and, and watch it before I watch it. I'm watching this one for the first time with you. I like it. This will be fun. 30 years. Well, I'm ready for that countdown whenever you are, Brussif. Okay, well, I got it queued up to zero, and when I'm going to say three, two, one, go, when I say go, we're going to hit play. All right. In three, two, one, go. Look at this wide shot here. I love this old SummerSlam logo. This is my shit right here, man. Absolutely, man. And this, uh, which I hope that we're going to get to, live from Meadowlands Arena, the open to this show, the pre-packaged open that we did for this show. I shot most of the stuff and was a whole lot of fun, but, uh, here's Tony Schiavone is I'm Tony Schiavone and the mouth, Jesse Ventura, who was a little appalled having to work with Tony Schiavone for this damn SummerSlam and letting him know. So live on the air, it's sort of weird to see Tony Schiavone calling like WWE. I mean, I know that, you know, there's a couple of pay-per-views where it happened. Uh, in 1989, he said was the best year of his professional career. Uh, you know, he had the most fun there and felt like it was the big leagues of professional wrestling, but it still feels weird to watch him call WWF stuff and, and hold a WWF microphone. Well, here is the open and then remind me to tell you the other story on the other side about Jesse and, uh, Tony just completely, uh, flubbing it and. There was, I think that may have been Shane and Stephanie running and jumping into the pool at Vince's house. Was that the Kevin beautiful st- No, that was, uh, someone on the streets of Norwalk and, uh, someone had just gotten a brand new Maeda Mazda Maeda. And we you mean Miata? shot them in the car, whatever. Steve Taylor's son right there eating some ice cream, getting him. Oh yeah. Uh, Beautiful young lady. Her name was Pam. Oh my God. That was Ann Russo, uh, playing it, uh, on the softball team. Whose kid was that's Kevin Dunn. That was Kevin Dunn swinging the golf club. And I have no idea who those people were. I bet you I didn't get them to sign a release either. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Some kids playing in the park. I just said, little kid, you want to be on TV? No clue. Had to be somebody's kid, though. That's how we did it back then. 
dude i love that theme song right there i know we didn't play it i'm gonna have uh, jojo go add it in uh somewhere i just love the theme song for this show so so watch this conrad you see this pan of the crowd yep okay then there's another pan of the crowd then there was a little tighter pan of the crowd and in the middle of that pan of the crowd one of the exuberant young ladies in the crowd proceeded to take her top off roll tight on that and that was live on the pay-per-view obviously has been edited out and does not live anywhere uh, at all in any archives because it was something that I used to use many, many years ago whenever I do auditions with play-by-play guys because Tony and Jesse completely froze and did not know how to react. I'm like, just say something and get off the fucking shot. Um, but I would use that and throw that in when someone was doing it to see how they would react to the unexpected shot. And most people, you know, some people would freeze just like Jesse and Tony did. And some people would be able to comment and keep rolling right along. But it was right there in uh, that instance where we, where we got that shot where someone was exposed. The brain busters. If, uh, uh. Tully Blanchard and Arn Anderson against Brett and Jim the Admiral Neidhart. Jesus Christ. Talk about four great great workers in the ring yeah i just watched this uh match i think you and i watched this together like what two years ago i know know why i know you and i have watched that open just randomly and you sort of broke down maybe it was three years ago it was it was a few years ago though we sat and watched this because you had mentioned that in one of the SummerSlam openings and you couldn't remember which one uh, that's where we could see vince's pool and you said oh stephanie's jumping in it and uh, whoever was driving the Miata and Kevin Dunn's playing golf. So you remembered all of that and we found it and then, uh, it just played. And when we saw it was this match, we were like, oh shit, we're going to watch this one. Well, hell the Hart foundation, one of the better tag teams, uh, anywhere, certainly in the WWF, Bret Hart really coming into his own. And, uh, I think you could argue that Arn and Tully were one of the best in Jim Crockett promotions. Of course, they were very much more a tag team territory with midnight express and road warriors and rock and roll express and Arn and Tully. This is good stuff. And I think Arn is one of the more criminally underrated in ring guys. And you can watch this match and see all the little stuff. That's what made him stand out. Is it not all the little nuanced stuff? Yeah, I think so. And, and Arn was able to get in the ring and be a chameleon and work with just about anybody and everybody. But Arn Anderson is another guy. I think that, you know, yes, people will uh, hear the tweets now. Oh, he was TV champion. He could whip any TV in the, in the world. Um, but I think Arn was a better tag team wrestler than he was a single. I don't, I wouldn't argue that. I mean, I enjoyed Arn as a single, but I think he and Tully are, are maybe one of my favorite tag teams of all time. And, you can't help but wonder had, you know, Tully's departure not been what it was, what they could have done together with a longer run. Yeah. I just don't know if, if their style and really and truly, um, it, it was, it was a different style and it was a different philosophy overall in how they worked their matches, how they cut their promos. Everything about it was different than the, what they were used to. You mean in the but WWF, you mean? WWE, yeah. And getting in, and it's deceiving here because you're working with Brett and Jim where they had these great matches and they were able to work with uh, the Rockers and guys like that. So all their stuff was tremendous. But I think there were there were times that their philosophy kind of clashed with, with what they liked and uh, what they were comfortable with for all those years. And I think they were more comfortable in, in the Carolinas and, and being with Jim Crockett. Do you think they weren't uh, flashy enough for Vince? You know, were they two sort of mean potatoes? I mean, they don't have pink tights. They don't have face paint. They don't have crazy hairdos. I don't know that they needed it. They had Bobby Heenan and it was, uh, yeah, I just don't think that they needed it really. And 
their shit was so believable and so good that you really enjoyed whether you knew why you enjoyed it or not. You had to enjoy their matches because they felt real and they had great psychology. Um, and it was, as you say, for both Tully and Arn, it was the little shit that mattered. And even going back here to 1989, Bret Hart would tell a beautiful story. This match is a really, really good match. Uh, if you're, if you're going to watch, if you're not going to watch this whole show and you're just going to listen, I still think you should watch this just so you can appreciate just how good the heart foundation and how good specifically Arn and Tully were here. I don't think Tully gets talked about enough. Um, talk to me about the end of Tully's or how the, the end of their run came to be and, and what you remember about Tully's drug failure and all the fallout from that. Well, I think that, you know, the, the drug failure was just more than anything, a catalyst is a way out and Tully and Arn were unhappy. They were looking to, you know, go back to Jim Crockett promotions and they were looking to get back with their friends and everybody that they knew and that they were comfortable with. So it was the perfect storm to allow them to go back and Vince knew they were unhappy and just felt that we had done all that we could do with Tully and Arn and maybe it was best for them to, to leave and, and go where they were comfortable. Um, unfortunately it didn't work out that well for Tully, but Tully was a guy that, you know, came from San Antonio, Texas, where he was a big star because it was his dad's promotion and probably had more heat in the locker room than the hottest heel in the territory had with the crowd. But Tully was one of those guys that as much as you hated him in real life, the bell rings, the son of a bitch could go and he could get heat. He knew how to work and he knew how to go out and tell a story. But the, the man, uh, Tully Blanchard, <laughs> especially, uh, early on in his career and during this time, Tully was a smart ass and Tully was very arrogant and just knew how to, you know, he knew how to piss people off in and out of the ring. This match, by the way, in the uh, torch, gets a B grade. Wade would say this was steadily paced opener. That was satisfying. However, maybe a bit too long. They're going to go 14 minutes. I liked it. I, again, shit. Um, I'm watching it now and it's absolutely fantastic. And I think that the, the pace is a good one because they're telling a the wrestling story and they're having a wrestling match where they're, oh my God, someone's actually grabbing a hold and working a hold. So it, it becomes to the point of what kind of fan are you? Do you want to watch the wrestling matches? Do you want the Gaga? And I think most people would say, I want both. Nice little, uh, double team. Yeah. And the crowd's into it, man. They are, you know, cause you've got Bobby Heenan out there solidified as a heel and able to get the response, even if there isn't one there, but this was during the time too, of trying to establish Brett and Neidhart as baby faces and they were due on the baby face side. So it was, people were still trying to figure out what the hell was going on with them, but it, uh, Again, beautiful story with the blind tag, totally tagging Arn in as Brett comes in and bam, now we're ready to set the heat with Arn Anderson beating the shit out of Brett. It's an interesting dynamic between these two tag teams and that, you know, while, while Neidhart was a good performer, I think everybody knows that the star of the team was Brett Hart. He was certainly the standout and, and, the the big performer of the two, I don't know that that's necessarily a dynamic that exists with the brain busters. I feel like Arn and Tully are sort of equal footing. Yeah, they were equal footing and they were interchangeable. And the star of the team was really in this incarnation, Bobby Heenan. Right. Um, but as far as workers and who's going to stand out in the ring, I think that they were equal in that regard and, and fairly interchangeable. Both of both Tully and Arn were great. Bobby Heenan just added a, a sense of realism and believability to whatever the hell he was doing, whether it was on the outside of the ring or behind the microphone to where 
he he was in the moment and made you made you believe it's sort of fun to look back and, and say hey what if because uh in june of 89 barry windham pops up here in the wwf as the widow maker and the widow maker the bull of the wood baby it's just fascinating to me that you know you, and you've talked about this before that SummerSlam 88 it was discussed and your brother love segment was supposed to feature the debut of Ric Flair and had Flair come in at SummerSlam 88 at this point, technically you could have had Arn Tully, Barry Windham and Ric Flair. The four horsemen would have been in the WWF and their manager, by the way, I guess it's worth mentioning JJ Dillon is there too, in a front office capacity. But imagine if, if that version of the four horsemen had Bobby Heenan as a manager, holy cow. Well, yeah, that would have been a hell of a stable, but uh, you know, again, at the time, I think Rick always just used to use the negotiations and those scare tactics to solidify and get better deals wherever the hell he was, uh, which is why Rick didn't come in. And I think that just, that was the norm at that time. Hey, Rick wants to come in. Rick wants to come in. You talk to him for a little while and he'd say yes until he got a better deal where he was. And he would just say. I think, um, you guys debuted Wyndham in June and he's undefeated for like four months. And I think you guys are even planning on him being on Randy Savage's survivor series team, or that's certainly the rumor in innuendo, but he winds up being replaced by earthquake when Wyndham leaves in October over the counterfeiting scandal, which I'm sure we'll talk about when we cover survivor series 89. Yeah, but Barry wasn't involved involved in that scandal at the time. No, it was no, just I, the, I, the I association know. with his family. When you when half your family is going to prison, you probably won't take a little time off. Well, I never had half my family go to prison. Uh, me neither. I'm just freestyling, and it's not an unreasonable request. Guys want to go no. home when their wife's having a baby, or you know, my dad's no. going to prison. Whatever. <laughs> my dad and brother are going to prison. Uh. It's a shame to uh, look in the ring and Morella's no longer with us. Bobby's no longer with us. Anvil's no longer with us. We just lost him about a year ago. Yeah. When you go back and, and watch something 30 years prior, it, it does. It makes you sad because I would like to believe that we're all, um, good God at this point, I'm only 25 years old and thinking, Everybody is, is just the same age and they stay there. They stay that way forever. And that just doesn't happen. Yeah. Neidhart here is only uh, 34 years old. I think, um, I think Brett's like 31 or 32 and Arn Anderson. I feel like Arn Anderson was born 40 years old. Yes. But in fact, he's, uh, he's 30 here, which he would not guess looking at him. Yeah, old Marty Lundy. I remember Arn when Arn first broke in as under his real name, Marty Lundy, with the bleach blonde hair and the beard, with uh, as a tag team with Matt Bourne. And I never, I just never, you know, with the exception of of this this stint, and I never got to got to work with Arn any for any length of time ever. And um, even when he was an agent with you guys. In well, I just saw him at TV. Yeah. And he was, he was an agent producer. So I, it just was very little interaction for the most part other than friendly and Hey, how you doing? And you want to go take a ride around the uh, parking lot of the bar in Indianapolis or something like that. <laughs> not that, not that that ever happened or allegedly. Well, I'm just saying it's a, it's a hypothetical. Sure. By the way, I, uh, can you believe that, uh, I finally convinced Arn to do a podcast? Oh boy. Well, good luck with that. Oh, really? You don't think it's going to be good? I hope it's wonderful. Okay. Yeah. Arn has uh, always played everything very, very close to the vest and is going to open up and tell some stories for the first time. I mean, Arn's so old school. He doesn't even have social media. Well, there you go. Speaking of old school, look at these two old timers going at it, Brett and Tully. And the the thing that I really liked about the Hart Foundation during this time is they were baby faces, 
but they worked like heels. Which is probably why they were such good baby faces. Brett cleaning house and got, by God, there's that baby face comeback that he always likes to make. Got to throw that drop kick in for good measure. What do you think of the, uh, the way the crowd is lit here? This is, uh, the WWF is really the first wrestling company to, to do extensive lighting like this for television. Well, I th- to me, I always liked it and it's what it just highlights the crowd and it gives you a good backdrop when you're looking at that versus a dark, you know, just a black, black, you know, kind of dull backdrop. I think for the television audience, it is not nearly as exciting to seeing the crowd and everything around them. Um, I know a lot of people would argue that, and we've tried it different ways. But when you look at it on television, I think it just adds a adds a hell of a backdrop and, and makes it three-dimensional because you can see the audience and that crowd in the background. Not only does it look better aesthetically, uh, to have sort of an interesting backdrop, but in addition to that, it also has a little bit of a, uh, I don't know, social proof, a little bandwagon effect. Like, golly, look how many people there are there. This is a big attraction. Sure. And, and you can see, you know, everything going on. And part of that, that appeal is, well, I'll go to a big event and I'll be on camera. Hopefully they're going to see me. Hey, look for me. I'm in the eighth row. Who was making the gear for the boys at this point? They, you know, during this time, they had their own people that that did most of the stuff. Um, like Bobby had someone that did all of his jackets. How about that for a unique move? That's something you didn't see very often. Uh, Nice little reverse, uh, body slam. Good shit. And just a typical, great, simple, absolutely simple heel move with the switch and, uh, and then Arn covers up his, his flesh covered yarmulke. So you can't tell that it's him. He's not the legal man, but they steal a pin. Love that finish. If you're going to watch one match on the show, I would recommend it be this one. Can't believe Wade gave this a B. This is an A to me. Absolutely. Well, there you go. That kind of tells you. I'm wrestling tabloids. I'm admittedly a mark though for Arn and Tully. The R and Tully were a hell of a tag team. They really were. I mean, look at this though. This is uh, a fun deal where, yeah, it's a whatever move off the top rope, but the little nuance stuff with Arn is what always stood up, like covering his bald spot with Brett's arm. So you can't tell is that Arn or is it Tully? And there you go. There's your victory. Absolutely. And now are we going to go to the infamous sign drop. I bet you that it's, if it is, it's edited out of the, uh, the network stuff. No, it's not oh. the American dream, baby here. I'm funky like a monkey. I got my little, got my little security guard hat on everybody. Let me Gene know that it's time for American dream. The common man. I won't give me a little bit of that big boss man and let him know just just what he's in for with all my polka dots. We're going to dance. We're going to have some fun. We're going to get a little funky like a monkey G mean. And I'm going to give him a, a ass whooping American dream style. And maybe I'm going to take that, that nice stick of his and I'm going to shove it with the sun don't shine. And then everybody's going to be saying, dream, baby. Dream, what you gonna do? I'm gonna say I'm gonna put my polka dots on and we gonna dance all night long, baby. Cause that is what it is, baby. Why is your Dusty so good? Cause I've been doing American Dream Dusty Rose since I can remember. Literally when I literally 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 when I was, this no shit, man. I bet you I was seven, eight years old and I was doing Dusty Rhodes interviews when he would come to Houston and I would imitate him then. And it just, I guess, got better as time went on and being around him, the, the nuances, if you will, baby. I was a honky tonk man. 
And this was a fun promotion with with Honky and uh, and Dusty when they did the sing off, which is absolutely classic. And, and Honky did Honky shit, and then Dusty was going to do uh, Johnny Be Good, and we shot it in the studio. And as I'm sitting there listening to it, I said, "Hey Vince," I said, "What if instead of Johnny Be Good, we change the lyrics to Dusty Be Good?" And I started fucking with the lyrics. And I, I went in and I said, hey, Dream. I said, you think you can... Uh... And by the way, Dusty thought he was great. Of course. Baby, this is going to sell millions. I said, well, what if we, we change the lyrics from Johnny Be Good to, to Dusty Be Good? You got it, baby. And it's the one and only time that I think Honky Tonk Man actually sounded good singing. Versus Dusty. It was so bad. He's just a common man. I think a few years ago, uh, Honky tried to sell this jumpsuit for like 25 grand on eBay. Was it the blue one? I know. He he had a red one for sale. Oh, okay. And it's funny because people started like tagging me in it. Like, dude, I, I, I collect cool stuff. I'm not arguing that, but 25 G's for the fucking Honky Tonk jumpsuit. Nah. That blue one, I think, cost him 10 G's. Well, he overpaid. No, that was a nice one. That was a heavy one. A lot of work in that one. The, uh, (laughs) I love Dusty Rhodes. I know that a lot of people, including my my old school wrestling friends who are big fans of Mid-Atlantic Championship Wrestling and Jim Crockett Promotions, they fucking hate Dusty and the Polka Dots. But this is the first Dusty I saw. Like, I started watching wrestling in 88. And I was all about the WWF. And so by 89, I was knee deep in WWF and I started to come around to WCW, but by that point, Dusty's gone. So this version of Dusty is the first version I saw. So I was always a big fan of it. It was great. Dusty in polka dots. Was absolutely great. And it was, it was most fun and without a doubt rejuvenated his career. Not just the polka dots, but Dusty having fun with his character and being the character that the people loved. What a fucking cool shot that is. Who would have, who would have done that shot? We just saw that wide swooping shot across the crowd that just panned across and, and landed on the ring. I don't fuck if I know. Well, I mean, Curl was directing. That's what I needed to know. So like in, in this time, in this era, 89, what is, what is Kevin Dunn doing at the actual day of the show? And then what is, what is Kerwin doing? Well, Kevin was probably, uh, with the commentators at the commentator and, and just, uh, directing, directing them at, at the commentary station, giving them cues and, and what have you. Um, but Kerwin was in the truck and he was the one that was directing, but yeah, for, for the live events and that stuff at this time, uh, KD was, was on the floor with commentators, I, making I, sure they knew where the hell they were. I bet, uh, some of our listeners would probably be shocked to hear that the honky tonk man has, uh, well, a, another famous wrestling relative, Jerry, the kink Lawler. Did you just say the kink King baby? Kingfish. Kingfish. This some bitch won't grow old. Jerry Lawler, I think, is like 109 years old. And still looks like he's only uh, 72. No, King looks great, actually. King King doesn't age. It's, it's fucked up. Look at that polka dot. Check out my ass full of polka dots, baby. Look at that shim. Are you okay? I am the honky tonk man. Greatest intercontinental champion of all time right there. The honky tonk man, heartbreak hotel, baby. For your referees, Freddie Sparta. Yeah. I was going to uh, ask you about him. I don't know. I don't know this guy. What do you, what do you, what can you tell us about Freddie? Freddie Sparta, uh, from, he's not from Boston. He's, he's like from, uh, Worcester or Lemonster. One of them stirs. Uh, up in Massachusetts. One of them stirs. 
one of them stirs, Lancaster, Lemonster, Worcester, Shitster, something like that. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord, my belly. He got me right. He got me right now, my little splotch. Referee. Reverie, he hit me that megaphone right in my splotch. Oh, shit, I hope it don't rupture and burst. Because that was always a weakness of Dusty. He's always bruised. What? I'm not saying anything. Okay. I think you are inside. I am a little. <laughs> man, how great is uh, Jimmy Hart? Hardest working man in the, in the company at this point, probably. Yeah, I'd say it was a tie between uh, Jimmy and Bobby on the outside. Jimmy was just high energy all the time. Just never, ever failed. Why the, uh, why the decision to sort of move away from uh, managers? I think it was just more than anything, an extra body on the road that, that didn't work. But I think that a lot of times that that managers are just as important, if not more important, a lot of times than the talent they manage. Oh Lord, I'm, I'm getting ready to go sleepy by. I'm going to go sleepy by. And if you notice the, the slendering look on dusty is because he, he always shaved his stomach and chest to kind of like slim him down a little bit. Wait, getting rid of the body hair makes you slimmer. Oh yeah. You shave that shit, Conrad. People are going to be thinking you're like 200 pounds with a 32 inch waist. I don't think that's going to happen, actually. No. I... You shave it and you watch and see what happens. You know, Orrin says uh, if you can't tone it, tan it because tan fat looks better than pale fat. I've said that for years. I got that from Arthur Morowitz, the uh, king of the adult film industry. So, wait, an adult fat film? looks better brown than white. So in the adult film industry, they, they tell the performers, Hey, uh, putting on a few LBs, go get a tan. Well, fuck. Yeah. You, know, Look, he, you, and I you ain't going to get, you ain't going to win no championships. If you aren't tan, you and I had a conversation once about the similarities between the adult film industry and professional wrestling. Yeah. Well, do you want to explain? Well, it could be very similar. I'm just saying they're, they're working there too. <laughs> I mean, they are calling spots. Some guys they predict a little earlier. There's always a hot finish. Yep, and uh, there's a, and look, and there was a day back in the day when they would call it in the bed, and <laughs> now every goddamn thing is scripted for them. Exactly, you know what to do, how to do it, when to do it. They can't even improvise anymore. Back in the day, they'd slow down, tell a story. Yeah. This day it's just high spot after high spot. Nobody's selling shit. Yeah, it's hard to keep up. There's storylines, there's costumes. Yeah. Yeah, they just ruined the business. <laughs> People used to pay for it and now everything's free thanks to the damn internet. Exactly. Exactly. Honky, honky goes right back to that reverse chin lock. Look at all that air in between there. Come on, baby. Uh, come with me. Help me. Because if you clap, if you clap, please clap for me. So I can start pumping my arm here in a minute. I'm letting you know I need some help. I got my hand up. I'm starting to shake. The more you shake, I'm going to shake. Ooh, and then everything going to shake. I got the puppets shaking. I got oh everything shaking, baby. What's wrong with you? What? Uh, Wade, oh. would say, Wade would say this was a pretty poor bout because Dusty was ducked out and polka dots. The fans love Dusty Rhodes. He really has found his niche in the WWF and they get 10 minutes. He gives this one a D. Oh, fuck him. You have got to admit this has been the most entertaining match we've seen so far. No. Yeah, it is. Like Look at him go. Ooh, flip flop and fly, baby. That's a big man bouncing around there. I'm telling you that right now. Dusty Rhodes, people fucking like to make fun of the way Dusty fucking looked and all this shit and everything. He was an incredible athlete. I mean, incredible. 
He could move when he wanted to. He just was a little bit bigger than everybody else. Yeah, I love his old promo. My belly's just a little big. My hiney's just a little big, but I'm bad and they know I'm bad. Ref bump That's... in your second match. This is starting to feel like a WWF show now. Oh hell. I hope that, that Jimmy Hart just keep Oh no no. He's he's he the megaphone didn't phase him. We're going for the big guns here. This is uh before the Jeff Jarrett Balsawood guitars too. Oh my, oh my. Look at the crowd. It's such a simple spot, but the crowd just went bananas for that. Because of the polka dots. You're telling me that audience didn't like them fucking polka dots. Look at that shit. Virgil Riley run of the third, baby. Man, the yes, crowd. I just whooped that honky tonk man. Crowd was really into that one, dude. Next up, it's uh, going to be, well... A match between two guys who inspired a conversation very early on here in our something to wrestle series, Mr. Perfect and the red rooster. And of course, Terry Taylor has told folks that they just drew the wrong name out of the uh, box of gimmicks. And when they were passing out gimmicks that day, Kurt got Mr. Perfect and he got the red rooster. And Hong Kong man right here looking for Scylla. Shilla, Shilla, I'm coming home. Help me find a stage. I'm a little confused. Yeah. yeah the, 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 thank you, Shilla. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm a come. Oh, he's just a common man. Yes, he is. Yes, he is, baby. You hear him? You hear him? They ain't never going to stop for the dream, baby. It's weird, too, nope. when you think about. You know, the, the fact that Tony Schiavone is calling this and in the opening match, you got Arnie Tully and in the second match, you got dusty and in just a second, you're about to have Terry Taylor. Uh, there's a lot of familiar names here for Tony Schiavone. Well, that's good. That helps him. He needs help. What do you think that referees doing these days? I don't know. I think he's living in Florida right outside of Tampa. Look at this shit here. We got demolition. By the way, do you know how old I was before I realized this demolition shit? You guys were were peddling like S and M to us, and I had no idea. How are we peddling S and M to you? Well, they're wearing leather and spikes, and that's what demolition men wear. Yeah, well, I get that, but uh, they also look like they're here for the cock and ball torture convention. They've got a gimp in a box. I don't even know what that is. Well, I'm just saying if they had zippers on their, on their leather masks, I mean, process this motherfucker leather masks. I had no idea. I'm fucking seven, eight. I don't know. I don't think Hacksaw knew either. What do you think of Hacksaw putting the little crown on his two by four decking out the two by four. He's got the mask on and he's got the crown. And then he's going to take that mask off in a minute and reveal he's painted his face too. Hacksaw was into this shit. Wasn't he? He is gimmicked out. It looks like DDP in 95. Plus you got the, uh, stars and stripes two by four. That's King Duggan. And ho. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Perfect. No, no ring entrance already in the ring. Gotta keep this shit moving, man. Well, you're going to keep it moving here. They only get three minutes in this match, but look who does get an entrance. So. Fuck me running. <laughs> Why does everybody have a Terry Taylor story? Uh, I just don't know how the fuck he thinks he was supposed to be Mr. Perfect. What do you think of, uh, the presentation, the red spikes in the hair, the jacket, well, if he would have kept it going, it, it probably might've had a chance to get over if he'd actually worked the damn gimmick. Well, what was the gimmick besides bobbing his head back and forth? Like he's a cocky rooster. He should crow. He does. Okay, good. He goes er, 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 and throws feathers in the air. And he should. 
it's crazy to think that, you know, Mr. Perfect before he's here, AWA world champion, one of the better in-ring performers in the business. And Terry Taylor was developing a bit of a reputation, but a lot of people who would be critical of Terry would say, rather than sort of trying to find his own identity, he was basically doing Ric Flair cosplay. What say you? I would agree with that statement. I think that the Terry emulated Rick and I mean, look at him. If, if you were to take his head off, the boots are exactly the, exactly the same trunks, knee pads, everything from, from the neck down is Ric Flair. Yeah. He's got RR on his boots for red rooster. He's got little initials on his trunks, just like Flair. He's wearing the knee pads below the knee. Just like Flair. Yeah, exactly. Getting ready to get beat by Mr. Perfect, just like Flair. Oh God, what's wrong with you? Well, well. Hey, by the way, I cannot help but, but cover this with you. I was, you know, there's no observer posted from 1989, and I'm sure somewhere in one of my hard drives I've got these issues. But it was very easy to find the torch, so uh, we're using the torch for today's episode. And oh God, this is one of the reports, uh, either the episode or the issue before or after SummerSlam. This is word for word. The hottest rumor of the past two weeks was that the ultimate warrior either died of a heart attack. He never missed a date. So the rumors weren't true. So let me report it. (laughs) This folks, none of this happened. And this is a complete lie. Just like 98% of the rest of everything I'm writing and completely made up, but let me report it. And then I'll tell you up. They decided he decided against dying and now he's alive. Surprised you didn't word it that way. I don't know why, but he didn't miss any dates. So the rumors weren't true. That fucking tickled me. (laughs) Hey, uh, turns out he's not dead. He still made all the shows. Damn. Might have been an imposter. There was that rumor for many years too. Oh, dude, tons. Like I remember in school, people were like, "Well, the first Ultimate Warrior dead. This is uh, this is a new one." Yeah, and I guess it was because you know when he came back, he was doing his his face paint a little differently. He was wearing his gear a little differently, and most importantly, he had lost quite a bit of size. So people thought, "Well, this is another one. He's the real one's gone." No, unfortunately, the real one was still around. In a perfect plex, and we have a victor. If only that had been Terry and Kurt be the Red Rooster. Three minutes least, here. Kurt is, would have made the Red Rooster work. Uh, it got a D. Uh, Wade would say it was a very good series of fast moves in the opening minutes, followed by a perfect plex to end it. Rooster was limping after the bout, so he may have called for a quicker finish than planned. He's just selling, though. He's not hurt, huh? Uh, who knows? I hope I, I would have hoped it wouldn't have gone that long. You're just fucking not a Terry Taylor fan at all. I'm a Mr. Perfect fan. Oh, everybody. Yes. So if he had only gotten that gimmick, then things might be different. Yeah, sure. Zeus. How about, how about the survivor series? You know, the, this is back in the era of the big four. So the Royal rumble in January. WrestleMania, of course, late March, early April. Uh, and then we're going to pop up for SummerSlam here, usually towards the end of August. And then around Thanksgiving Survivor Series. These days, it feels like, you know, there is a major show every three weeks. Oh, here's the famous skit right here where the sign's going to fall. Let's play the audio here for this. But I bet it doesn't fall on this one. And where the Intercontinental you think it's going to fall? Belt. I, think I bet they've cleaned it up and put the, well, put the only one on there. Promises are made to be broken along with arms, legs, necks, and heart. Yeah, it, it fell. Tonight, no, this is, this is the, the good one that actually was supposed to air in place of the bad one. Hmm. I got you because the, the bad one I believe was supposed to air. It was supposed to be the first pre-tape of the night. And so it aired accidentally, accidentally. And then, and so probably for Coliseum home video, they fixed it. Yeah. Oh yeah. 
tell everybody you know at home who, who may not be familiar I, I don't know how that's possible that you're listening to this show and you don't know what we're talking about explain what we're talking about well there was a pre-tape that was done uh with rick rude and bobby heenan and in the middle of the pre-tape right when gene like threw to rick rude the SummerSlam sign in the background just fell to the ground. And what did Oakland say? Fuck it. Yeah. Fuck it. Goddamn props. People put this shit together and just proceeded to bury everything. So it was great. Absolutely wonderful. I love that shot. The rockers are here. It's wild to see, uh, a young Shawn Michaels are going to be teaming up with uh, Tito Santana. And the Rougeos and marvelous Rick Martell. Here he's the model, isn't he? I don't think he is yet. Not yet? No, because he's he didn't have the fragrance, he didn't have the the glasses, the sweater. He's just a heel Rick Martell. Yeah, he's just a Quebecois. Quebecois Rick Martell. With the Quebecois Quebecers, a la Jacques and Ramon. Why don't you Raymond think- Rougeau will go down as one of the nicest guys ever in the wrestling business. Probably too nice to be in the wrestling business. Boy, that is not the case for his tag team partner, though. Jacques could carry a little heat. That's the thing. I've never had a, a cross interaction with either, but goddamn, everybody has some sort of, uh, a story about Jacques having heat, but I don't know that he's ever actually done anything to anybody that uh, is it just his personality. It's just things he says, or uh, he has a weird demeanor or, or why does Jacques have so much heat? I think that Jacques, uh, first of all, being French Canadian, I think that sometimes his use of the English language, maybe he just comes across as arrogant. Jacques actually a very nice guy. And He just can rub you the wrong way. Sometimes he speaks what's on his mind. He doesn't hold back, but he can just rub people the wrong way. There are those people that, that just, no matter what they do or what they say, you don't care for them. And Jacques is one of those people. Uh, Raymond, on the other hand, I I would defy you to find someone who would say anything bad about him. Uh, stand up guy class all the way but just a pure, true gentleman. And like I said, one of the nicest guys I've ever met in the business. Same thing with Tito Santana. That's why, that's why Tito won't shake his hand. He doesn't like him. Grab a quiet pace. I just shake my hand. Talk to me about Rick Martell. Uh, I've always been curious, like, Why is he not in the WWE Hall of Fame? Is there something I'm missing? Well, you know what? I asked about Rick last time we were in Montreal, and I believe that Rick has been approached about being in the Hall of Fame. I don't know that for a fact, so I may be speaking out of my ass here. But I asked, you know, why Rick doesn't come around and why we don't hear about Rick and Um, I was told that that Rick is out of the business and has no desire to do anything, uh, in the business whatsoever, that that part of his life is over. And I think he does real estate now and manages stuff and buys real estate. And that's, that's it that, um, he, it's not that he's bitter or anything like that, just that he's moved on and doesn't want to revisit that part of his life. So I think that Rick Martell is definitely Hall of Fame worthy. And again, when you talk about really good guys, Rick Martell is in that class too, because he's just, you'd find some people hard pressed to find anybody to say anything negative about Martell. I talked to, uh, probably shouldn't say the name, but someone in the front office of a major wrestling company in the last I don't know, three or four months. And he says his favorite all-time wrestler was Rick Martell. I've never heard that before. I mean, I've always thought Rick was a fine performer, but it's one of those deals. I guess when you're growing up, you know, you sort of like who you like and you gravitate to a certain performer and his favorite all-time wrestler, Rick Martell. 
and Rick was great, great wrestler, man. And especially I think in obviously for the AWA, he was AWA world champion. Right. Um, so for, for that area, man, he was always on top. He was always one of those guys that was around that was a fan favorite and never, you know, wavered one way or the other. And then when Rick came in to WWE and the tag team and all that bullshit, and he just, he's so smooth and so good. Um, it's kind of like, what's, what's to dislike, right? Uh, the model thing was tremendous and he played that off perfectly, but it's, uh, yeah, I could definitely see that. Why don't you think he had more single success? I mean, he obviously had some, some pretty memorable feuds here as a single star. You know, the thing I remember most is his match with, uh, Jake Roberts, the silly blindfold match that we've talked about here before, but you know, it feels like in an era where the intercontinental championship was sort of the quote unquote workers belt, he would have been a prime candidate for that, but he doesn't have the opportunity. I mean, he did have a couple of a tag title runs, but no singles gold was, was Rick Martell ever considered for a run with the IC? I'm sure he was. And you know, Rick, the one thing that held Rick back was his ability to cut promos. But at the same time, this is the era where you, you slap a manager with him. You know, you guys have 38 different managers on the roster. And, and we did. We had Slick with him. But it, it still, it was, if you could cut your own promos and you could go out and get that kind of heat and be able to project that. But Rick with the model gimmick um, didn't need it at that point. But I do think that Rick Martell is one of those guys that the championship may have it may have helped him. Uh, just give, bring him up another notch, kind of like it did with Tito Santana. It's, it's same, same thing. Uh, but I think the Intercontinental Championship did help Tito and take Tito to the next step. But uh, I don't know with Rick. I just don't know that they never pulled the trigger, and he was always able to survive and, and be just fine as Rick Martel without a championship. Now Jacques coming in and of course the wonderful Rougeos. Man, the Rougeos when they did the were just, you know, we're all American boys. Good God. You talk about heat and they were they were so easy to hate. And for Raymond it was a stretch to try and get him to be a heel. But for Jacques, it was always just Jacques, you be you. I don't understand. Qu'est-ce que c'est? But there's, you know, two of the two of the best, you know, unsung heroes of of the time in Rick Martel and Tito Santana that just were workhorses that you could always depend on, no matter where you put them in the card. Wade loved this match. He said the finish was fantastic with a lot of close pinfalls. I was on the edge of my seat and really thought the finish made this match. The bulk of the match was only average. He gave it a B. So the finish coming up here, you're really, really going to like, apparently. Well, we'll see about that. We'll judge this shit, man. By the way, next up, uh, this is the last match before intermission, which I can't wait to talk about, but the ultimate warrior and Rick rude. It's going to be, uh, interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Why? Well, you know, I know every time we talk about the ultimate warrior, you can't wait to shit on him. And, and that's not true. Okay. We said, we said earlier today that there was a rumor that he died and he said, unfortunately it was the same one. Not that, no, you read that, you took that completely the wrong way. Okay. How should I have taken that? Well, not that way. So I think most people, uh, remember, uh, but maybe you should catch them up. What's the backstory here with Rick Martell and Tito Santana? Rick Martell and Tito Santana were strike force and, uh, Tito still wearing the strike force trunks with the little, um, lightning bolt on his trunks and they broke up their, their tag team. 
but uh, they were tag team partners for a long time, had a nice successful run as tag team champions. It was originally Rick Martell and Tom Zink. And what the hell was their name? You remember their name? Can-Am Connection? Can-Am Connection. And they broke up probably about a week after I came into the company. Well, look what you did. You broke them up, you bastard. I broke them up. That's what I do. So it was, um, How dare Tito and Rick took off from there and then they had a, a falling out. And of course the rockers, because they're, they're rockers and the Quebecers, they like that classical Quebec music. That's an, that's a, just a natural rivalry. And this was during the time that the rockers were also really coming into their own because they're, they're new back in the company and jury's still out on, are they going to succeed? Are they going to be all right? And they were stealing the show every night in house shows, no matter who you put them with, the rockers would usually have the best, the best match on the card. And of course the star of the rockers would have to be Marty Jannetty that everybody felt would go on the singles stardom. The other guy, not a lot there. Shawn Michaels, he'll never amount to No, I don't know that he's long for this world. Yeah, no. Nah, what do you think is, uh, do you think there's any hope for Marty Jannetty? It feels like he's going through a tough time right now. Well, what do you mean? Hope as far as. Well, it feels like, you know, if you, if you follow his social media, it feels like he's definitely struggling with some substance stuff. And I know he's sort of had a lot of stops and starts there. You think he can pull the nose up on that? I sure hope so. I do too. And, and I think that Marty, is, Marty's a survivor. And I think that Marty, you know, will come around and obviously there there's help for him out there if he wants it. Um, but Marty's a strong guy. And I, I think that he's also a stubborn son of a bitch. So deep down, I know Marty wants help. And I think if he will just get it i think that that marty would be okay i really do i hope he is because he's he's a good human being deep down and i just hope he gets everything together i really do that was a flying burrito as uh <laughs> I was waiting on jesse just... ventura used to call it the things that jesse would say then would never <laughs> fly today <laughs> By the way, uh, high praise from Wade Keller about the announcing here. He says, uh, a Shivani, uh, oh, let me back it up. Uh, Tony Shivani was a little disappointing to me. I thought he was good, but below his average. However, this was his first time working with Jesse Ventura, who was as good as always a Shivani Ventura team has potential to be the best, but it will take some experience together first. Yeah, they needed repetition. They just needed some reps, man, and get out there, which they didn't have going into this. And I don't think that there was that comfort, uh, with Tony that Jesse had with Vince. Was this, um, was this Vince's, we know that, that Tony's going to call the Royal rumble 1990, but that may or may not be because Vince was partying on the boat too long and really wasn't up to it that day. So Tony, what, still, what do you mean? What are you talking about? Tony Schiavone says that he was not supposed to call Royal Rumble 1990. And the day of Vince said, did you bring your tuxedo? And he said, yes. And he said, you're calling the show. I can't do it. Okay. And the rumor and innuendo is that, uh, he had been enjoying the sun and the beach and the sand and the boat. Maybe a little too much the day before. Yeah, I have no idea if that's true or not. So you're saying Shivani's a liar? No, you see, so you reported it as fact, kind of like the tabloid newsletter people do when it's just rumor and innuendo. And so, so the rumor and innuendo is, which is secondly, that Tony Shivani, that's hearsay saying shit from Tony Shivani. Okay. Is this going to be uh, shit on all my co host day? No, 
let's, uh, you know, last week you said something about Jr. and today you're already like, oh, good luck with Arn. <laughs> and now you're like, oh, that's hearsay from Tony. Uh, let's see. Uh, what about Eric Bischoff? What do you think he was doing here in 1989? Thinking about how he would, uh, steal talent in a few years. There we go. We're checking all the boxes today. Thief, thief and motherfucker. Thief and motherfucker. I mean, right about this time, he's, he's selling Ninja Star shit in uh, Minnesota, no? <laughs> hey? Ninja Star shit. Have I missed anybody? Uh, you know, I don't think you've shit on Jim Cornette today. Oh, fuck Corny. Goddamn. No, because then he'll fire back and oh yeah, a damn it'll it'll be it'll be, a, it'll be Twitter for fucking ever. Did you see a few weeks ago where he had a legit fucking Twitter meltdown and was just firing off at everybody? No, it's uh, fire off at me. No, he usually just shits on you on the podcast. Okay, here we go, man. Look at the crowd. The crowd is really into this. This is what must be what Wade was talking about. They're hot for this. By the way, if you want to know if Hulk Hogan's over. Just look around at all the fucking yellow and red. It's in every row. Yeah, Hulk, I think Hulkster uh, was going to get over. Yeah, I think he was doing all right there at this point in the game. I know that you hate talking about money, but freestyle, what do you think he made in 89? Oh, God, I have no idea, but I'm probably well over. 10 million? Uh, no. Uh, 5 million? No. But he made millions. Yeah. I'm sure he made millions. That was a good finish. A lot yeah. of shit going on. Who would have been uh, helping the guys put together matches? Who would have been agents in this era? D during this time, you had Pat Patterson, Jack Lanza, uh, Chief J. Strongbow, Tony Gurria, Rene Goulet. Besides, um, besides Pat, who was like, who was the go-to guy? Who was second command? Like, if you need a hot finish, you go to this guy. I would say Lanza and, and Strongbow, but but Strongbow became just very, you know, Warriors not going to sell shit. Um, it would be, uh, you know, it, it depended on what type of match it was, really. I love this build here. Of course, we're seeing a clip here from Royal Rumble 1989 at the Summit in Houston. And he's got this uh, flex bar where they were doing like a pose off, and I was choking out the Ultimate Warrior with it. But at first, Bobby Heenan sprayed, what was it? Suntan lotion? Sun, sun no, it was the oil that, that, uh, Rude was using to oil up in between poses. And here of course is what happened at WrestleMania five. Bobby Heenan trips him, holds the leg. He can't kick out. So as a result, ravishing Rick Rude wins the intercontinental championship that warrior beat honky talk man for at last year's SummerSlam. But you've uh, always had fun telling the story about that Royal Rumble skit from 1989 where they're doing the pose off and Bobby spraying Warrior. And Warrior doesn't even realize he's being sprayed. Doesn't sell he's it He's got at his all. eyes closed and his mouth open. Doesn't even realize that that's the spot where he's getting blinded. But every once in a while like this, we, we did, you know, as part of a, a prime time wrestling angle, we said, okay, this happened on prime time, uh, with rude attacking warrior. And, and again, as much as, you know, I like to pick on warrior as far as his, his working ability or lack thereof, uh, you, you could not deny it. this son of a bitch had charisma and personality that was over like Rover. Um, and the audience loved him. So just go show you the greatest workers in the world. It really doesn't matter as long as you got that charisma and, and by God, the people were eating it up. It's good shit. And now we're starting the, uh, kind of the cross program from rude who got warrior ready to Andre. Hmm. I don't like you. I've told the, the uncle Elmer Andre story. Haven't I? I don't know. Well, uncle Elmer. <laughs> yeah. Kind of, kind of lost read there a little bit. Is this, uh, yeah. tell everybody how these women were picked from the crowd again. 
Well, they were just chosen at random. Uh, a lot of actually back in this day, day and time, they were chosen chosen at random a lot of times by by people. The hey, would you like to get do the rude awakening with Rick Rude and get kissed, and we'd bring them in. Sometimes it'd be somebody's friend, but for the most part, we'd go in the audience and pick them. How much did Warrior love working with, uh, or did Rude love working with Warrior? Uh, Rude hated working with Warrior, but Rude made good money working with Warrior, and Rude knew that that was his job to get him over, and that's how Rude looked at it. Watch the way he drops this guy. Yeah. He's going to drop this guy. I think this is the skit, if I remember right. Yeah. (laughs) No protection, no nothing. Just (laughs) fuck him, sack of shit. Yeah. Well, I choke you now. You know want to sell? I give you something to sell. Now, you know, here's here's the thing. You look at those two guys, who do you think the strongest would be by looks? Oh, warrior for sure. Yeah. Not even remotely close. I would say Andre was probably ten times stronger. Let's uh, let's just play the audio here. Let's let the fans listen to this warrior promo. Brokeless from all the street tickets and all the river rooms across these weak planets. And you, Andre the Giant, will realize that the power will become the eighth one of the world as we eat you alive. But you, ravishing Rick Rude, as I promised, you will surrender to the gods above as I beat you. One, two, three. Let's go back to the arena. Well, there was that. Yeah, there was that. What's your favorite warrior promo? That one right there. Yeah. I can understand it. I like the old load the rocket ship. So, uh, yeah. this is, I, the- I tell you the bet, the best warrior shit was when he, when he became WWE champion and, and just some of the, the, the totally nonsensical, I have no idea what the fuck he's talking about promos to me. Those were the most fun. Take a look at uh, Rick Rude's belt. If they show it from behind again, they've got just extra rows of snaps here because his waist is so small that, uh, they had to add several more snaps just so he could wear it. That's, that's the shape he's in here. Yeah. Rude was always in great shape. And, and of course, Rude, you know, here, this is the, that journey to, to get warrior into a position of you know, drawing and, and make him be the man. Um, so much so that after this, when rude would take his hiatus, rude knew that, you know, coming back that, that that was going to be his job to get warrior over his champion. And, and, and rude took it seriously. Rude looked at it as this was his job to make this guy look good. And I think that Rick rude without a doubt is probably, if you were going to pick one person, that that made the ultimate warrior you have to look at rick rude number one uh honky tonk man is up there because honky just you know did the did the right job the right way the first night in a year ago at SummerSlam, and and rude did it all the way through and made it consistently made him believable and put him on the map and then then there's andre the giant But look at the crowd go banana. Oh, they love the ultimate warrior. It's, uh, the music, the entrance, the face paint, the muscles, the neon colors. And as you would say, and then the bell rang. Yeah. But again, give me this shit. I'm good. This, this frenetic entrance and everybody's on their feet. They, they believed. Yes, they did. And they believe because the shit hurt and it was real. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, God damn, it looks like Warrior is really hitting him. Well, yeah, because he was. Okay, let me get my breath. Yeah, I mean, you got to blow up doing that, right? I'm blowing up watching him. 
It was like Jesus Christ. I remember strong though. You know what's it? Goes he runs to the ring and what's next? <laughs> he can't breathe. So it was always trying to figure out that way is to okay do this nice slow methodical and, and Rude knew how to work with Warrior. Rude Rude knew exactly what to do, when to do it, why to do it. I think there was a trust factor there that not in the beginning, but eventually where Warrior realized, all right, I need this guy to make me look good. And, and that's, he did by God. I love Rick rude. It's, it's one of those things where I didn't appreciate how much of a rude fan I was until I was older. And, And this is a really good match. I mean, Wade would say the ultimate warrior Rick Reed match was spectacular and better than even the highest expectation. He gave it a B plus. Does he know that a comes before B? Yeah. Okay. By the way, uh, former friend of the show, Matt Coon pointed out to me a few weeks ago that the deep purple song highway star from 1972 was probably the inspiration for the ultimate warriors theme song. Have you heard this song? Do you, do you remember this song? No. I've heard warrior song. I'm going to, uh, get your take here. See if you think that it, uh, it sounds similar. I could see it. You, I could see that is, is being, yeah, that probably is the inspiration for it. Probably so. And, and back in the day, had he used that as, as an entrance, he could have gotten away with that. Yeah. See, now watching that, but, but, but going back and watching this damn, uh, suplex on the outside there's a way to do a suplex other than grabbing the guy's tights and just pulling his tights up his ass and pulling them over yeah he can help you (laughs) give him a heads up take your time big boy get set but i dare say you know this was during a time that you know, Hogan had been gone and, and Savage is, is on the up and, and you had, had warrior coming up and by God, you know, they, they, they loved him. I mean, it was warrior could do no wrong here. And the, the audience just, they didn't want these long matches with him. You know, what's weird. I, I, I don't really know that I, this clicked until just now, as you're saying all that about where Hogan is and where macho is. And, and you said something like warriors next. And I think even as a fan, I knew here in 1989, Hey, warriors going to be the next top guy. I don't even know. I mean, the phrase top guy didn't exist in my vocabulary, but I just knew who oh, he's going to be champion. You know, I just knew this is going to be one of the big stars. He's going to be the, he's going to get the belt. And I feel like that may be lost a little bit. Now, when I watch WWE television now, and I know we're not going to talk about current stuff, but I'm just saying back in this era, you could definitely tell, okay, here's where we were. Here's where we are now. But just looking at it, you can tell the way they're programming it. This is going to be the next guy. Do you think that's just gotten too predictable, formulaic, boring? And so now you have to, you got to have so many moving parts just to sort of keep the attention span of wrestling fans today. Well, I think that that entertainment in general has changed quite a bit, especially television and how people view it, that you have so much more to choose from that you've got to create a multitude of stars and you've got to create everything. Um, And this was also a, a more innocent time where you had superstars and you had wrestling challenge, syndicated television programming that 
that's how you got it. And you, you were able to make stars on that with squash matches every single week. So the larger than life, man, when you, you put them in the ring against someone, they're equal, let's say like a Rick Rude and ultimate warrior here that the audience felt it. They knew, they knew that this is, this is a top program. It's a top guy. Um, it's just warrior man just had that fucking energy and that Jesus Christ. But again, I'll go back to what I said just a second ago, man, this match should have been over by now. Right. Way too long. And that's, yeah. you know, the, the issue with, with just formatting warriors matches, we should have made them quick and move on. Mm-hmm. But I mean, it is probably better than you expected. Oh, without a doubt. And, and, and I, again, I give a lot of that, that credit to Rick rude in slowing him down, slowing him down. And Rick rude is the one that's setting the pace here. And rude is the one that is taking warrior to school and saying, Hey, now let's calm down. Now let's, let's tell this story and let me get my heat. And then we're going to blow that comeback and come home. But it, it's rude. Who's being the methodical, slowing it down. You just walk around and sell big boy. I'll come get you. And it says it right there on Rick rude's trunks. Feel it, <laughs> feel the heat. Well, it's a message to everybody. If warrior gets lost, read my trunks. Wade would say there was no shortage of two and a half counts. Warrior excel beyond what is expected of him. Rude continues to prove he is far from the average performer. He used to be Warrior your own the crowd tonight. And I think fans were more excited to see him win than Hogan win. Piper was a ringside at the end of the bout and distracted rude with a moon, which we'll see in a few moments, which is fucking depressing because Roddy Piper's no longer with us. The ultimate warrior's no longer with us. Bobby Heenan's no longer with us. Rick Rude's no longer with us. And unfortunately, neither is Joey Morella. So not a soul who's involved in this is still with us today. Yeah, it's kind of sad. It really and truly is, man. That's just, that is sad. Who would have thought, and I don't mean for this to sound the way it does, but who would have thought out of that list I just made that Bobby Heenan, the oldest of the bunch, would be the last one to go? Oh boy. Yeah. No, not I. And the, the Joey, the youngest would be the first in that horrible car accident. So it's just, uh, yeah, kind of, kind of crazy 30 years ago. And, and what happens in that time frame? I've always loved that where rude would jump on their back and do the sleeper sort of wear them down. It makes sense. I dig it. It does. And, and that's, again, that's what people, people look at. This is twofold by the way, a it's to tell a story for the audience, but it is also literally too slow warrior down. <laughs> okay. Carry me around big boy. <laughs> and if you're not going to slow down, I will make you slow down. That's the old, it's uh, right. The old Terry Funk, uh, advice I heard, uh, once he gave a wrestler was slow down. And when you think you're going too slow, slow down some more. Exactly. And then slow down a little bit more. <laughs> if you think you've been laying there too long, lay there longer, right about the time you think this is really uncomfortable. It's time to get up, wait and lay there longer. I get, go ahead. Neither guy's moving. They're both, they're both laying there like they should. Um, what would, warrior dying for air. How would Patterson Bobby is describe moving. this? When Patterson wants a double down like this, how would he describe it? Uh, just lay there. Don't move. Lay there like a fucking douchebag. 
Just lay there, I don't move, I too soon. Why? The warrior is actually perfect here. Except till now. I still went away before he started shaking. But he laid there. He gave him time. He gave him time to fucking come with him and get him up. Now slow down. Rude with the double axe. Good shit. I feel like Ooh. we should mention here that uh, around this time, it's reported that the WWF secured another pay-per-view event for December 27th. So after Survivor Series, there's one more. And this one is going to be the no holds barred version. And, uh, what would you call it? The match, the what? Why have a Merry Christmas? So you can have a no holds by Christmas, no holds by the match, the movie only on pay per view. Wade would say that it would be the movie and then a taped no holds barred match with Hogan and Zeus. Uh, so it'd be their first straight up singles match and a few other matches leading to WrestleMania. And Wade would say specifically, if the Hogan Zeus match does good pay-per-view business, look for that to headline WrestleMania six. If it does poorly, look for a quick replacement, possibly Wyndham, Henning, boss man, ultimate, etc. The Hogan Zeus meeting will be pre-recorded to avoid embarrassment. If Zeus screws up. So he was wrong on all counts, but there's your expert. No, he got the, uh, he got warrior. WrestleMania six. He listed the entire fucking roster. <laughs> well, it could be perfect. It could be this guy. It could be what could be Bobby Heen. It might be Joey fucking Morella. It could be honky tonk man, Brooklyn brawler. So <laughs> yeah, he could wrestle somebody on the roster. Let me ask you, was there ever a Wyndham Hogan program discussed that you know of? No, I actually, no, I don't think so. Um, what about boss man Hogan potentially at WrestleMania? I could have seen that at WrestleMania during this time. I think boss man or Hogan had run, had run its course the year before. Now this one's fascinating though, Mr. Perfect, because Mr. Perfect at this point is still perfect. He's still undefeated. And we know Brutus, the fucking barber beefcake is going to be the guy to end it. But however, um, Mr. Perfect Hulk Hogan, that could have worked for WrestleMania. I would have dug that. Oh, I definitely believe that could have worked for mania, but at the time, you know, kind of, kind of getting there, all this was, was under the, the auspices of, we got to get warrior to where, where we're going to get him. And, um, contrary to the tabloid, um, fib sheets that the makeup sheets that I must just start calling them, um, in November is when we pretty much knew we were going warrior and Hogan. But all their sources, I guess, didn't tell them that. Rick road up on top. Oh my. What the fuck was that? Nice little false finish there. Good God. If Roddy Piper shows his ass, I'm, I'm just, I'm going to flip out. Cause that would cost the match for me. Are you alive? No, I'm alive. I'm letting you do your thing. Well, help me. <laughs> so let's talk about the intermission because, uh, this is the last match before intermission. They don't do intermission anymore. Was intermission just a part of wrestling because it always had been. And, and when did you guys decide, uh, enough of that shit? Well, it was, it was a part of wrestling because it always had been. Yes. And it was something that you always did. And B, originally, it was to sell merchandise and shit. Oh, my, he's got nothing on under there because he's a true Scotsman. 
I like that. And he, that's I'm what, so obsessed. Huh? I like that. That's what allows the distraction. The idea that someone showed Rick rude, their ass infuriates him. How dare you show me your butt crack? And look at the hang guy. on. I'm going to run right by you to go over here. <laughs> yeah. Look at the guy, a couple rows back on the left side against the hard cam. He's got his sleeves rolled up. He's got a tie on his hands. He's just wringing his hands. Like, please beat him. Please beat him. Yes. People are so into this. I can't wait to see his reaction. It goes up for the slam. Has he got his hand in his, uh, no, no there. Yes, he does. Mm. Yes, he does. Look, look at this dude. That motherfucker still's got his fist clenched. Dude, it's been like this for se for several seconds now. Let's see, here we go. Oh, yeah. Oh, here we go. Ah, yes. Did his hands move from that position? Are they oh, up? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, he's Arsenio in now. Okay. And the crowd goes wild. Look at the crowd, dude. For real. I know. Fucking went banana. They exploded. You know what? I don't know how you could see this and not say, yeah, we're going with warrior at WrestleMania six. We did. Well, it could have exactly. been Mr. Except Perfect. Wade Keller, been had, <laughs> except Wade Keller thought we're fucking going with, of course we'd go with Zeus or of course we'd go with fucking Brooklyn brawler, or we could go with this guy. We could, you know, yeah, no, we're going to go with Jim, the animal Neidhart, or we're going to go with Jacques Rougeau or Sean Michaels. No, no one will believe that. Um, I mean, seriously, you go back and read that. He's just throwing out names. Hey, let's, uh, I look at Sean Mooney doing man in the crowd here. I used to love this. I wish you guys still did this. <laughs> well, he can't hear himself think he look at the IFB in his ear too. It's, it's basically like a goddamn half a headset in his, in his ear. That's what hearing aids used to look like. By the way, old hearing aids, even before that. Yes. High praise. Uh, well, not high praise, but him being the, the fan man is discussed, uh, in the torch. Sean Mooney was the crowd roamer again and actually did a fair job. That position as the fan man is sort of working. And here's me and Gene looking as only he can look in that spiffy tucks and the giant IFB. And there he is. Mr. Perfect. Who is absolutely perfect. By the way, that, uh, that side behind them at SummerSlam right there, that popped up, uh, in the last year or so on the collector market. So my actually has that now. And where would they have gotten that from? I have no idea. I think it was when you guys had like a developmental territory somewhere and they sent like a bunch of old <coughs> signs down because the WrestleMania 13, uh, like backdrop piece for interviews was there. And, uh, that one, I think there was a Royal rumble one from like 1990 or 91, something like that, but old, old stuff. And then a bunch of old nitro ring skirts and canvases and things like that. Interesting. And Gene's got that giant IFB, not very well dressed, hanging off of his ear there as well. Roddy Piper out here doing his best Roddy Piper. This is by the way. We should remind everybody he left her WrestleMania three going to Hollywood. And I kind of thought that'd be it, but he's back. Yes, he is. I'm looking just fine there, Gene, you know, because I just went out and I just showed everybody. I'm the true Scotsman that I am. And, uh, I'm going to flip flop this glass here. Drink me some water. If only Bruce would have put some tequila in there for me. I like it a whole lot more. God, don't let me drop this son of a bitch. As a matter of fact, I'll just keep on talking until I do. And if you don't like that, Rick rude, well, I'm sorry because I'm pretty damn sure I'm going to drop this shit, Gene. And oh yeah. Oh, I got to cry and blow my nose because I, well, you know, I'm not going to blow it too hard. Can't, can't fucking uh, get rid of the shit. You know, just saying. Oh, well. Roddy Piper's interviews were nonsensical, but people loved them. Can you put your finger on why? Is it just the energy? Well, it is the energy. No, Roddy told the story. You always, the story didn't necessarily always make sense, but he did <laughs> tell you a story. It was kind of like follow the yellow, oh, you follow the yellow dick toad. You know, you know what I'm saying, right? Okay. Well, let me explain to you. One of, once upon a time, little bunny foo foo hopping down the forest. So, and then Goldilocks came in. Yeah. He just, he mixes all of it up and shit, but somehow, some way 
it makes sense to him. These interviews we're seeing here, these would have been pre-taped earlier in the day. I would hope so. Actually, we, we may have done these live just to have, um, just have Piper there, make sure that finishes were, were done. So we'll just line them up and do them live, live. Are these being shown on the big screen inside the arena? No. No, no. At that point, that was intermission time, and that that was the time for people to go and get their hot dogs and hamburgers and popcorn and and everything else. Besides, so and I'm, I'm pretty sure this is live just from uh, from the Bobby standpoint more than anything. Why do you say that? Oh, well, because yeah, look, well. Rick Rude's all sweaty and yeah. coming right from the ring. And forget about facing the camera there. So yeah, we would just go in and you had, you had a block you had to fill. And one thing we're not doing here that was a big part of the intermission on our side was selling merch. Yeah. That's what I was going to ask is besides Hulk Hogan, the foam finger and the Hulk rule, rules, t-shirts, like what, what other merch items, not Hulk Hogan stuff is a top seller that maybe would surprise people. Uh, you know, that Piper, uh, the hot rod shirt was a big one. Uh, all the warrior stuff was big too. Um, was there one gee, item where, where, right, he, where like he, he took that right on his face? He didn't even move his head to the side. You mean warrior? Yeah. That. yeah. Warrior did. Yeah. It's like, move your head to the side. That's well, good to know. He hurt himself as much as he hurt other people. So what's wrong with you? What? It's good to know. He hurt himself. Well, no, here's what I'm saying is that sometimes when he would do moves to people and he would hurt people uh, on that particular move that hurt himself, you know what I'm saying? If he had just moved his head to the side and taken care of taking care of himself, he would go in very haphazardly and dangerously to himself and others. Some merchandise. What was your question? No, just, you know, was there an ever an item that surprised you how well it sold? Matilda. What do you mean? Uh, the Matilda, uh, stuff plush. Oh, okay. I'll be honest. I don't even remember that. I'm going to have to look that up. I'm sure fucking Zack Ryder has eight of them. Oh, without a doubt. Yeah. The, as a matter of fact, I'm looking, I don't have it here. I had a Matilda in my office for years. One of the Matilda stuff blushes and, uh, and, uh, I used to just for whatever reason, I don't know why, maybe because it was such a big seller. I'm, I'm looking at it right office. now. This is wild. The Matilda stuff. Yeah. I, I've never seen this in my life. Yeah. People used to buy a shitload of those. There he is. There he is folks. Now this motherfucker, we had to shoot in two nights. Yeah, no, we've talked about this and this was one of my first wrestling memories, him showing up here, Zeus, I mean, standing on the steps, preventing Hulk Hogan from entering the cage, the big blue cage. By the way, I used to love that Hulk Hogan would cut slits in the back of a shirt. I think we should bring that back. Me and you. The slits in the back of our shirt shirts. Yeah. In our dress shirts. You know what? You know what? We might, uh, we might get our man Ryan to, uh, make us a shirt. That's got the slits in the back. Fuck. Yeah. Just nothing on the front. Just slits there he the... is. Or wait, are no, you saying man. there he is macho man or no brother love for oh. fuck's sake. Look at that good looking son of a bitch. Man, uh, Sherry had on a see-through dress. You could see them cheeks. How did I miss that when I was a Ute? You can't see them cheeks. You see them legs. Just let me use my imagination as a seven-year-old back in the day. Come on. Eight. Well, hold him because the madness lies in the eye of Zeus right there. Is, yeah, the eye of the madness. Oh, oh, freak out, freak out right there. The eye of the madness coming for you, Hulk Hogan. He's coming for you, Zeus. Oh, oh yeah. Freak out, freak out. Yeah, we didn't let Tiny do a whole lot of talking. By the way, Hulk Hogan. 
I don't know what else I'm saying. I fucking love Zeus. I know you get annoyed because I love Zeus. I don't get annoyed that you love Zeus. You can love Zeus. Well, I do. And you can't stop me. Well, you know what? Millions more loved Brutus Beefcake. No, they fucking the barber. Didn't. Watch your mouth. Millions upon millions. Many more millions than ever loved Zeus. By the way, uh, <laughs> I can't believe it's real. Wade had an opinion about, uh, about the entrance. He says, I would have liked to see both Hogan and beefcake approach the ring together to Hogan's music. Although I see their reasoning and trying to establish both gimmicks. Who gives a fuck? Who gives a fuck about what? Whether or not Brutus and Hogan walked out together to the same music. Well, obviously he did chat me up. You know, we've, we've used Wade a lot this week. You, uh, if you had to pick, would you go, uh, would you call yourself a Wade Keller guy? Or a Dave Meltzer guy. I'd rather be dead than either. <laughs> I didn't see that coming. I mean, that that's like, okay, do you, do you want to put your nuts in a bowl of piranhas? Or do you want to put your nuts in a, a bloody bowl of sharks? Bloody I mean, bowl of sharks. Okay. So chat me up. Uh, Jerry Jarrett. Wade Keller, Dave Meltzer. Well, at least Jerry's got chicken salad. Okay. But then I'd have, no, then that would be, that would be bad. Why would you want to put me with any of those people? Uh, I was just asking, you know, hypotheticals. I mean, beefcake should be out here after that devastating uh, bear hug. No, I agree. By the way, the macho man here still rocking the tape on the elbow. We've talked before how at WrestleMania five, he was suffering from staff. Does he still have some lingering effects with that in his elbow right now? I think, it, you know, it just was an elbow injury that was a result of the staff that he kept just trying to protect it and make sure that it didn't get any worse. Easy there, big man. To push me in the face again, I'm going to knock you out. All right. Yeah, your Hollywood career will be over. When I fucking tell you to go, it's time to go. Yeah. Uh-huh. This isn't the Hollywood you got. I'm going to hide your eyes so you can't even see them. It's good shit, Zeus, man. Very, Zeus. Very good shit. This made you a fan. There he is. The body. The hell's Tony reading? What's he looking at? Uh, probably walking papers from Vince. That came later. What I was getting to Not earlier. Not quite the mullet. What I was getting to earlier, uh, when you took issue with me talking about Royal Rumble 1990. The, uh, this show, is this, is this what convinced Vince that, nah. Tony ain't the guy. I don't like it. No, I don't think so. Not at all. I I, look, the only thing that happened with Tony was when Tony's contract came up, uh, Tony asked for a lot more money and started negotiating and giving Vince ultimatums as far as, uh, going back to WCW and things like that. It wasn't even WCW as Crockett, I guess at the time. And, Vince wasn't going to negotiate with them, you know, wasn't going to put one against the other and just said, fine, you want to go, go. Tony Schiavone wasn't, wasn't selling tickets. So it was okay. Next we'll get Jim Ross in a few years. (laughs) Man, what a team here. Andre, the giant, the big boss, man. And Akeem, holy cow. And by the way, uh, I loved the, uh, analysis from Wade Keller. He says, uh, 
Jim Duggan is trying to wrap himself in as many gimmicks as humanly possible. He's been said to be a walking souvenir stand with the addition of the demolition mask. Actually, at this point, he has a bigger selection of merchandise on his person than the NWA has completely. <laughs> yeah, probably true. Probably true. It's like at WrestleMania 7, Willie Nelson sang America the Beautiful and Swag Willie... out. Swag oh, out. Oh, my God. And he and Donald Trump stood in the backstage area and Trump kept putting more and more shit on him, which was absolutely hilarious because he kept, you know, he got the championship belt. He had the t-shirt, he had the bandana, he had a uh, wrist, he had everything there was. Um, maybe he had seen Jim Duggan. Yeah. The referee, you got to take the masks off beforehand. Oh, so let's run through this. Hacksaw Jim Duggan has the American flag paint on his face. He had the demolition mask covering that. He had the crown on top of both. He had the two by four wrapped in the stars and stripes with a crown on top of that. He also had an American flag and he wore a cape. This is, uh, it's a lot. It's called dedication, Conrad. Dedication to your craft. One of the favorite things, my, one of my absolute favorite things was when we had a fan once at one of our live shows, I asked, did Hacksaw Jim Duggan carry the same two by four to all the towns? Did he, was the, was the piece of wood a checked item? Was it a carry on? <laughs> What? Yeah, well, he got him at two by fours R us in every town. Yeah, you know, here here's the funny thing: the the real answer to that is in the early years, Duggan would just walk around the building and try and find a two by four. Sure, and that's. And then we finally got to the point of. Why don't we just carry a bunch of two by fours in the fucking trucks? Right. How much space is that going to take? Right. Bunch of two by fours and a saw. That's his gimmick. We're good. Conrad, you're doing a hell of a job in the ring right now. Selling for demolition. Ah, oh, thank you, sir. I did my I, best. Uh, I had a good hair day here, didn't I? Without a doubt. It does make me wonder. If one man gang ever like work continental, he did. I'm gonna have to have a talk with my mom. I wonder if he ever made it to Gunvalson, Alabama. I wouldn't have been there as a Ute. Oh, I would have been uh, down near Montgomery in Prattville, and you know they ran Montgomery all the time. Oh, he talked about this one in Montgomery. Shut the fuck up. This blonde. No, my mom wasn't blind. Come on. Well, sometimes she was. He said she wasn't a real blonde. But <laughs> yeah. By the way, uh, in my my hey, search... don't ever let Miss Deborah hear this either. Damn it. Uh, rest assured, she does not listen. That hurts. No, have you heard what we say on this show? You wouldn't want your mom listening. My mom's dead. We're talking about you're getting your dick hard every other week on this show. Well, somebody's got to. Okay. There's that. All right. Didn't expect that. By the way, um, in my search to find this Matilda dog that you're talking about, it was described as I found it, it listed in the, uh, like in the old merch booklet. Yeah. Oh. Our adorable Matilda stuffed animal is just waiting for you to give her a home. 11 and a quarter inches high, cuddly, soft. She's wearing the British Bulldogs t-shirt and a bright red collar made of 100% acrylic plush, fifteen ninety five. Yeah, man. And the Matilda t-shirt also photographed only comes in a youth medium, a youth large. A small, medium, large, and extra large. There is no double XL. 
but the person modeling the Matilda t-shirt, you know, take a guess. Uh, Stephanie McMahon. Isn't that wild? Yeah. That's crazy to me that, you know, if you know what you're looking for at the open of this show, she's jumping in the pool. She's also. Oh, God damn. That first sit out by Andre was painful. If you think that's bad, wait till you see uh, the bump that Akeem's going to take in a minute. Are you a bumping fool? Be the bumping fool. We haven't spent you know, a lot of time talking about Bill Eady. You got any good Bill Eady stories? Bill Eady about killed Houston one time when we had, he was the mass superstar and the finish of the match was if, um, Murdoch and the mass superstar lost that the mass superstar would unmask and they did a deal where the heels and baby faces fought all the way to the back to the dressing room and the baby faces went in the heel locker room and Bill Eady just threw a second mask, not even the same mask he was wearing in the match. Just threw a second mask to DiBiase, and DiBiase came out holding the mask up like he had just unmasked him in the dressing room and got the mask. And the audience just shit all over it and booed the fuck out of the two baby faces, Doc and DiBiase. This is like he, he worked the he worked the whole mask with the silver mask. And then they come out with a red and black one. And it just was a shit. But that was, that was Bill Eady. Ooh. I climb over rope now. Boss man you know, is uh, one of the more underrated big men of all time. Where would you rank? Um, or do you even consider boss man a big man? I mean, obviously he is a big man, but is there a requirement in your head as to what does or doesn't qualify? I think over 300 pounds is a big man, or at least back in the day it was. And I would put boss man definitely at the top of that list. I mean, he's, he was a guy that could move, take great bumps and had just tremendous timing. So boss man was a very good big man. So was, so was, uh, Akeem. I mean, gang was a damn bump in hell of a big man. So ever, everybody in this match, I would say shit. I was before we were so rudely interrupted by the finish. Uh, <laughs> I was going to say Barry Darso, uh, smash right there was a guy that a lot of times got overlooked because he was in a tag team. A lot of the time, whether it was Crusher Khrushchev or whatever, but Darso could go and was a big young guy that could really go and take bumps. And he was usually the workhorse of his teams. See, now watch that damn two by four come down. That's with precision right there. Knocking Conrad's ass out and the crown went flying off. He's cheating. Red yeah, that's what he said. They know how to keep that one short. It got a D minus though. Um, Wade would say <laughs> Duggan and demolition beat Andre, the giant, and the twin towers in the greatest match in WWF history. Just kidding. Smash pin to came to end the match. Andre was Andre. The, the match lasted seven minutes and it was eight too long. D minus man. Wade had a hard on for those guys. Didn't he? If you say so. Well, no, I didn't mean it like, you know what I mean? Well, we're talking about blue chew and shit. I don't know. No, we're not. They didn't buy a spot this week. Well then fuck them. Yeah, exactly. Hey, how about a million dollar man here? Looking as only he can look. I know that in hindsight now, this is a fucking stupid look, but at the time I thought this was the most badass fucking wrestling costume ever. Because it cost a million dollars, Conrad. Those are diamond studs on his, uh, Furnum snake. It's there on his shirt thingy. Is Furnum Schnavitz. Yeah. By the way, I collect those old school hundreds. That's my job. Are those gimmick hundreds? No, those are real ones right there. I'm just saying I like the old the old hundreds, not the the big oh, face ones we've had for Not 20s. the new ones with the big faces and yeah, shit. Yeah. Gotcha. 
You got a few million of those, don't you? A few million hundred dollar bills. Yeah. Yeah. I got three or 400 million just sitting around in a safe somewhere. No big deal. Why'd you start putting it in a safe? You used to keep it on the kitchen table and shit. And in my room. In my room. Yeah. That's what we did with, I don't know if you remember, but in the brother leave love suite upstairs, yes. we, uh, when we went to replace the mattress, I thought, man, I got an idea. You know, it's not a purple mattress. It's not, you know, one of those bed in the box mattresses. I got a better idea. We'll fucking just stuff it full of hundreds. So nice. So you took them out of the cabinet and put them in the bed. Sleep like a million bucks now. All right, let's let everybody hear the Ronnie Garvin bit here as he's going to do the ring announcing. I'm going to play this so everybody can hear. Ladies and gentlemen, the following contest is scheduled for one fall. He does, he does a good job. He's reading cue cards. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. Coming down the aisle, weighing 275 pounds. The fans to their feet. The mighty Hercules. The mighty Hercules. So the gimmick here is Ronnie Garvin is about to be feuding with Greg the Hammer Valentine. So he does a straight read for the Hercules introduction. But here comes the interesting. So called opponent. Well, that's an opinion. Squeak, poor excuse of a manager. A big mouth of the South. Big mouth of the South. He claims he weighs 249 pounds. To me, he looks like he's overweight by 30 pounds. <laughs> How dare him do that as an announcer? This individual who can't take for himself. And when he goes to his wimpy manager for advice, little Jimmy can't give him any. He is the only wrestler I think I've Ronnie ever Garvin's seen a punk. with two left feet. Well, he's talking Where's a lot. Where's the robe with cheap rhinestones? Oh. Well, cheap he's really rhinestones. Can't tell if he's coming or going. Listen to this. Made the biggest mistake of his life when he asked for me to be reinstated. Greg the Hammer Valentine. Well. I can't believe that got over, but it did. I mean, big booze from the crowd after that ring introduction. And I got to tell you, I, uh, I, I was never into this and it is sort of weird in hindsight that what, like 18 months prior to this Garvin was the NWA world champion main eventing a starcade with Ric Flair. And now he's here. Um, what do you think of, uh, Garvin's stomp finish? I was not a fan now. See, this is where, you know, it, it, it gets hard because, uh, I love Ronnie Garvin. I personally, I mean, good God, go out and have a few drinks with Ronnie Garvin. He is a funny son of a bitch and a great guy, a tremendous worker in the ring. Um, great, but I just never, I never got it. You know what I mean? I, when they made him world champion in, in the NWA, I thought, what in the hell? Um, it, it took me back to the old days. Okay. Put a shooter in there and, but it wasn't the old days and Ronnie, same thing that I said about Rick Martell, Ronnie, I just didn't think cut great promos. Uh, and may have been because he was French Canadian and the, the language barrier, but shit, Ronnie lived in, in the States more than he did in Montreal. But for whatever reason, I just thought it, uh, it never really clicked with me. And I was always amazed at the level of, of how much that, that we did put behind some of that stuff because I didn't get it and I don't, but it was a, you know, it was kind of a mid card program type deal. And, and that's what, what it was meant to be. But the NWA making him champion. I just, again, it was, I never saw it. 
And I think people, you know, still look back on that and go, what the hell? Some people may not recognize the referee. Tell them who that is. Timmy white. It's crazy. It's a young Timmy white. too. That's what I mean. It's a young one. By the way, uh, tell everybody we see Fink on the outside. We see, uh, to his right, Ronnie Garvin and to his right, Tony Gurria. and Tony's wearing a headset. Give everybody a heads up as to what, uh, what Tony Gurria's role was here. All Tony Gurria's role is here is to tell the guys, get the hell out of the ring when it's time at the end of the match. That is his only role there. Okay, guys, let's go. The, the Vince is yelling. I want you get, get back to the back. That's my Tony Gurria. Tony Gurria would start every story with, well, back in my day, you just grab a hold. So, yeah, Tony's one job was to, to let everybody know, get the hell out of the ring. Uh oh, what's Ronnie Garvin doing? Ronnie Garvin is stooging off Jimmy Hart. He can't do that as a as a damn ring announcer. He cannot award the match to Hercules. Wade would say number seven saw Hercules defeat Greg Valentine by DQ. The highlight was allowing Ron Garvin to introduce Greg Valentine and insult him left and right. Hercules continues to show he's the most expendable personality in the WWF. There's no future or present value to him in Titan D minus. What, what do you make of the, uh, assertion that he has no value Hercules? Yeah. I disagree with that. You know, Hercules was, was an attraction. And I think that people, uh, he was one of those guys that, as you say, people looked at in an airport and a lot of people knew and again, he's one that in the locker room, everyone loved. I mean, God, Ray was, was just the best, but I don't think the baby face role of Hercules, eh, nobody bought it. Nobody wanted it. Him as a heel with the manager and being able to do his shit was fine. But I think that when Herc tried to be a baby face on his own and have to cut promos and all that other shit, Ah, nobody wanted it. Nobody cared. what do you think of, um, Greg Valentine's robe? He had Olivia Walker, make him a robe and, uh, you know, lots of, uh, as, as Greg said, or as Ron said, cheap rhinestone, but he put a fucking arm on the back of his robe. That's for the elbow smash, man. Yeah. It was for the big elbow elbow smash because that was that was the finish and that's what his old man used as well. Oh yeah, the cauldron promo. Sherry, here, get some of this, man. <laughs> I like it when she's making making Zeus. Come on, inhale, buddy. She almost sounds like Paul Bearer when she does her promos. Dude, Man, uh, Sherry was the best. I'm God, I fucking love these promos here too, where she's looking in the cauldron. And oh, she sees something. Did you see a few, uh, it was earlier this year. Someone took a promo of her and macho man just yelling and ranting. And they put like a meme above it or made it a meme. I put some text above it and it said when the bartender at Chili's cuts you off after four margaritas. <laughs> and, and she's just yelling you're a common woman i hate you so bad that's just the best shit ever let's let everybody hear the macho man do his thing i'll play this for everybody Link, brutus the barber beefcake oh yeah in the bottom of the cauldron of the madness yeah and i also see hulk hogan yeah on the bottom of the cauldron of the madness and it's because of the human wrecking machine yeah! impervious the pain and i told you hulk hogan that this was the end of the road and i am looking at the end of the road and also i see sensational sherry you with miss elizabeth yeah the possibility is unbelievable thank yeah. you very much i'm a little bit quiet all let's get back up to the ring 
Good stuff, man. Smoky cauldron. Uh huh. Yeah. I like it to get freak out. Yeah. Uh huh. Good shit. You got to keep the smoke going, man, in order to really see what the hell is at the bottom of this. There he is, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Joey Morella tying his shoe in the background. <laughs> million dollar man yes folks that belt worth well over a million dollars now what do you think you legit spent on that back in the day two million dollars god damn fuck you ted dibiase is gonna have a uh, count out victory here against jimmy snooker that uh, wade is gonna say is a disappointing five match quote although snooker is three careers past his prime with dibiase this match could have been very satisfying it wasn't Snooker was counted out chasing Virgil around the ring. D plus. Ah, oh, lovely brother. And Jimmy might not have even known that that was the finish. He might have just wanted to chase Virgil. Who knows? Something that uh, Wade asks in the newsletter this week is um, nine matches is much better than 12 or 14, like the usual pay per view card. But he's still not sure why Wyndham wasn't on the card, at least beating someone like Paul Roma in the opener. And why weren't the Bushwhackers on the card? Well, why didn't Wade take his money and start his own promotion and book his own wrestlers and book his own show? Are you just going to be a whiny bitch dickhead today? I, explain to me how that's a whiny bitch anything. <laughs> uh, the whiny little bitches are the ones that bitch about everything and say, why didn't they do this? Why didn't they do that? Well, wait, wait, wait. And the guy... whiny little bitches who have never done anything to prove that, well, why that? Why, why would that work? Why wouldn't that work? And because they don't have the balls to get out there and actually do it. That's a whiny bitch. Because he likes Barry Wyndham? Well, then you know what? If he likes him that much and wants to see those matches, then he should have been a promoter and do it. Uh, and he, so basically if he doesn't like what he's getting, he should just shut the fuck up. Yes. Okay. Just want to make sure. No, I mean, I get it. He should just shut the fuck up. Well, they, yes, they should shut the fuck up. It's, 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 it's like, you know, What's wrong no, with you? no, it's, 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 it's fucking like me telling an engineer how to design a building. Well, I don't like the way that he designed that building because I think that the air conditioner should have been over here. And it's really stupid that they put the air conditioner there. I don't know fuck all about designing a fucking building. So I'm not going to comment on something. I don't know how, cause I've never done it. So either I like it or I don't like it. And if I don't like it, then I choose not to live in it, rent it or whatever the fuck. It's that simple. Feel better. Oh, I got more. Let's talk about some other news and notes from the torch. Uh, it should be interesting to see how Piper does in his return to active wrestling. He'll be wrestling Rick Reed at the Met Center in Bloomington on September 9th and other dates during September. His act on primetime wrestling with monsoon continues to get mixed reviews, but most agree the duo, the duo doesn't mesh like Heenan and monsoon did. Speaking of Heenan, his show is bombing in every way. The ratings for PTW drop off by as much as one third when his show is on and the content has left few satisfied. USA is ready to drop at any time. And McMahon, of course, will work an angle around its cancellation. Why not just say the ratings were so bad. The show had to be canceled. Oh, that would be the truth. Silly me. Is that silly you or is that silly? Somebody making a comment. I was just reading directly from the torch. Okay. So uh, once again, someone who doesn't know what the fuck they're talking about. <laughs> I mean, the if, rating, the ratings suck though. I mean, that's true, right? Again, they don't know what the fuck they're talking about. USA. It was not a separate show and it was something that we were trying. And the, <laughs> as the story goes, the person that was supposed to tell USA that we were going to do this didn't. 
and they didn't know what the hell they were doing. The reason that we stopped doing it was because USA was pissed off that they were not told that we were going to do it and that we were presenting it as a separate show. So we went back to the other format and they were like, we want Bobby Heenan back on uh, primetime and we, we don't want to wait till the last 30 minutes of the show to go to this Bobby Heenan show. That's what happened. And it was, you know, again, they just, that's what really happened. And I was heartbroken. We all were heartbroken because we loved the Bobby Heenan show. And I think that when you go back, it was so far ahead of its time in its absurdity um, that if we would have debuted it just 10 years later, it would have been over like a million bucks. But nobody knew what the we didn't know what the fuck it was. We were just uh, it was an avenue for Bobby and trying to have some fun and experiment. And it was really, really bad television, but bad television actually on purpose. Uh, maybe not the best idea in the world, but it was a lot of fun to do it. And USA had no idea that we were doing it at the time. <laughs> and when they realized what, what they're doing, it was like, wait a minute. You didn't tell them ahead of time this is what we're doing? Well, no, I just figured they'd be fine with it. That's what happened. So, shit happens sometimes. But you loved the Bobby Heenan show, didn't you? No. Get out. Well, when you were a child, you just didn't understand it. Maybe. Go back and watch it now. Classic shit. By the way, uh, Wade would say that the way the WWF gets over angles for its big shows is beyond perfect. What they've done with Zeus to get him over has been great. And he is the talk of casual fans and a Hogan Zeus match with seven more months of angles to push it. will do tremendous business at WrestleMania. Well, he's, he's a genius. He also wrote Tony Schiavone is performing his announcing role so well. He will give Jim Ross a run for his money with my year end picks. Ultimate warrior will almost certainly win the intercontinental title at SummerSlam. Heard a story from a reader who ran into him at a gas station and the reader asked him when he was going to win the intercontinental title and the ultimate warrior told the fan it's just more fucking luggage. Why didn't you tell him at SummerSlam? Curious. Yeah, well, Wade certainly had was the expert. He knew exactly what he was doing because we were going with Zeus and Hogan one on one at WrestleMania. You got any good uh Mike Jones stories you can tell us? Hmm. I think that the 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 best was when we were shooting the original million dollar man vignettes and you go back and look at him and, and he was wearing gold and silver spandex, completely form fitting tight, uh, sleeveless outfits, uh, you know, like spandex pants, spandex shirt and everything. And we made the comment that he looked like the FTD florist. Which if you remember back in that day, that's kind of what the FTD florist looked like with the, with the wings and shit. And we actually, we're in a, uh, one of the scenes that we did with DiBiase that may have been the hotel. There was a florist next door with the FTD florist life-size cut out in the window. And we got Virgil to actually pose just like the FTD florist. And he had no clue what he was doing. And I've got that picture somewhere. I don't know where, but uh, with the FTD florist and Virgil just side by side, and they were pretty damn close. But he's got that fuck money now, so. And that what made sauce. Yeah. And Does he, he manage at Olive Garden now? No, he's just the best he customer. He just eats there? He's the best customer. Oh, okay. That's good. Does he have a job? Yeah, he's a WWE superstar. But he's not. But, no, but, I mean, he is. Just ask him. He was in 10 WrestleManias. Was he really? He sold out uh, every arena around the world with Hulk Hogan. There's Sean Mooney. 
at the top of the arena. Whose idea was this shot? This is tremendous. It shows you just how massive this is. Oh, I love that shot because you get to see the whole arena behind you. So if it's a good shot, it was probably my idea and, and a mistake on Kerwin Silfie's part. They're going banana. Yeah, we got 32 minutes left for the main event. So you got plenty of time here because, well, you know, what's going to happen after the show. What's uh, if you've been listening to this show very long, you know, that Hogan must do something. Oh, I love that Hogan and Burtis rule. <laughs> Burtis. <laughs> oh, shit. And I didn't catch that till you had to read it to me. Burtis. Vroom, vroom. Man, that belt looks awesome. It's got the uh, little fans on the tip there. I think that's the dual plated one. Let's let everybody hear the Hulkster break it down. I'll play this. Harley Davidson threw a lot of heavy traffic, dude. But on the way to the Meadowlands today, when we hit the George Washington Bridge, it was at a standstill. So me and the barber, we just looked at each other, brother, and we decided to head for the water, brother. We headed for the Henry Hudson River, and just like Moses parted the Red Sea, that's exactly what happened when the pythons started heading for the river. And once we crossed the river, Mean Gene, everybody on Interstate 95 pulled off to the side. All the Hulkamaniacs with the stares in their eyes, with their jaws hanging, with the dumbfounded looks, couldn't believe the largest arms in the world hanging on to a pair of ape hangers ready to do battle. They couldn't believe the gleam in the barber's eyes. And we know why, don't we, Brutus? You know me, Gene, <laughs> these are titanium yeah. steel blades. They will cut through absolutely anything. You know, I love the blades, Gene. <laughs> the blades are part of me. Now, madness, listen up, because I'm going to make them fall. You. I can't believe that, Hulk Hogan. You better believe it, me, Gene. Yeah. But the thing that all those Hulkamaniacs that were stopped on the side of the road couldn't believe was the package I had riding on the back of my fender, brother, with those long, sexy, curvaceous legs that wrapped around me, with the arms that hung onto my waist for dear life, with a set of headlights that were pointed straight ahead, brothers, and the smile across the secret weapon's face. Just just like an acre of sunshine, satisfaction guaranteed. We're gonna take it to him, brother. We're gonna wipe out the macho man. We're gonna destroy Zeus. And then we're gonna get Scary Sherry and put her in her place. What are you dudes gonna do when the barber, the blade, and Hulkamania run wild on you? Get ready for the, the fuck did he just say? Hulk Hogan, the barber, and the blade run wild on you. Isn't it titanium? Yes, it's not titanium, and I'm pretty sure <laughs> titanium isn't a steel. Uh, so it's titanium steel, according to old Burtis. Well, Burtis, you know what? Actually, we could both be wrong, and old Burtis could have had titanium steel blades on the blade of his steel titanium tine. Let's go to Twitter. We posted the uh, graphic from SummerSlam 89 and asked if uh, you guys had some questions. Uh, Bad Money Slim writes Savage and Zeus with Sherry, top five tag team. Oh, fuck yes. James Stewart wants to know what was the reason for having Hearts versus Tully and Arn be non title on pay per view? That's a pretty good question. That's a real good question. One that I can't give you the answer to. I, I don't know. I really and truly don't know why the hell that wouldn't have been a title match. AJ wants to know no holds barred debuted in theaters on June 2nd, a full 12 weeks prior to SummerSlam, considering the three month gap between the movie and the event. Um, how big was the expectation for the movie box office success of no holds barred to carry over to the pay-per-view box office? Well, the, here was the. Here's the deal. We did so much promotion on our television show to the movie that in and of itself, we had to pay off somewhere because you couldn't show the movie on television. So bring the stars from the movie to television. Um, and that's what we did with Zeus and to capitalize on it because for weeks, good God, six weeks leading up to the premiere of the movie, all you saw was 
Hogan and Zeus in the movie. And then during the time the movie was actually in theaters, that's all you saw was Hogan and Zeus and the scenes from the movie. Now you introduce Zeus into this world and people are, people know who he is. We invested and we made a heel through the promotion for another event, the movie itself. So it was, I think in the back of their mind that they always kind of had that intention, but not really knowing how much, uh, Zeus could do. It was okay. You know, shit. Um, let, let's see what we've got. But we quickly found out that, uh, Zeus is an actor and that's what he did and trying to be physical in, in a wrestling ring and do that was not something that he was going to learn in, in the next six months. That, uh, that robe that uh, macho man is wearing is actually owned by a private collector who listens to the show. Yes, it is. And I've actually seen pictures of that. That's one of the most coveted robes out there of the macho man. Uh -huh. yeah. Oh, dude, does it get him any more exciting than this? Yeah, it does. By the way, even as a kid, I was like, oh, look at there. There I am as a Ute. I got really those births. Um, I was like, damn, Sherry's hair is really long. Is that really long hair? But of course I'm a kid. I didn't put together. Oh, it's fake and it's coming off. Uh, Mr. William wants to know if SummerSlam was the WrestleMania of the summer, why didn't it get numbered like WrestleMania? I like that. Actually, I thought it would have been cool. Well, I, I think that just Vince liked the numbers for WrestleMania, but he didn't like it for survivor series or SummerSlam or even the rumble. He just felt that they would be their own entity and, you know, SummerSlam 88. It is what it was. I mean, and, and that's, that's how he labeled those. So it, it just became, now it's just, you know, SummerSlam and, and rumble and survivor series. Look at the crowd, dude. Look at all the foam fingers. Look at all the yellow and red. Hogan on top is something to see, man. Man, it, it, during this time, and again, he's coming back. This son of a bitch was just so red hot. Charlie Wolf has a great question for you. When it comes crashing down, does it truly hurt inside? Absolutely. John Hayes wants to know after seeing Zeus's limited abilities, what were the expectations for him going into this match? especially knowing how Hogan doesn't like to overly script matches. Uh, the expectations were very little, but we knew that we had Sherry and Savage out there to, to make everything work. All Zeus had to do was slap himself and do the Zeus. Great question here from Sean Wolford. Why Brutus, the fucking barber beefcake. Cause Brutus was fucking over. Drew wants to know, it seems like Savage had to carry his side. If Jerry Jarrett was giving Zeus advice on how to be helpful, what might that sound like? Well, you know, for, for, you know, you get to the, and when, well, you know, to, to the steps and, and then, well, well, you know, you take it and you, you know, you turn around and then, well, you know, and, and you take your, well, you know, your, your, your eye and you make it. Well, you know, Chris wants to say, I'm not going to argue that warrior was a great worker. However, he did have the best match at this event, a great match with root at WrestleMania five. And he had the best matches at both WrestleMania six and seven. Therefore, shouldn't he get some credit and praise for his abilities? I give warrior a lot of credit and praise for his abilities. As far as being extremely charismatic and being over like a motherfucker. And being able to sustain that. And yes, I thought that if you give him someone great to work with, like Rick Rude, Randy Savage, by all means, he'll hold his own. Blanco says, is there a good story about Zeus doing or saying something out of turn in the locker room that maybe Hulk or Randy or whoever had to step in and sort of explain etiquette amongst the boys? Zeus was kept separate from the boys for the most part. And even when we went on the road, uh, together, 
and I talked about this in the holds Bart thing where brother love would have brother love shows with his guest Zeus. So that was, that was a long standing deal that we did for the entire promotion of the movie. And Oh my God, here's miss Liz Hulkster had a secret weapon by God. Macho man isn't going to be too happy about this. No, uh, 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 ain't going to happen. So, but uh, while we were doing this, I would go in the ring and I would do a Brother Love show. And Zeus only had like a line. And I basically did everything else for him uh, and tell him what to do and try and get him around. And one night we were in Springfield, Mass. And I'm, ex- I'm trying to tell him what to do in the ring. And he's not doing it. So when we get to the back, I said, Hey, tiny, I said, I'm out there and I'm trying to tell you what to do. You got to listen to me, man. You got to take your time and you've got to listen. And when I tell you to do something, you need to do it. And he looked at me straight face as hell and said, Oh, I didn't know you were talking to me. There were only two of us in the ring. He didn't know who I was talking to. I said, who the fuck did you think I was talking to when I'm telling you to get up on the fucking second rope and slap yourself and fucking come on down. Let's hit the other side. I mean, the fuck you. He goes, I don't know. Yourself. Okay. Chris wants to he know. Was, few- he was used to doing scripted shit his way. And that was all the only, that was all he's going to do. Hawk fan wants to know who were the guys who would have helped Zeus with his wrestling training for this tag match. Did you guys lay out? Uh, anything at all? Like, I mean, I, a lot of times we hear just last week, we talked about how test and the main street posse and Shane worked on the match for three days. And I think we've talked about how Hogan has done that a lot. Like for WrestleMania six with warrior, him and Patterson got together and worked through the match. Did, did, did that happen here or because you had macho and Hogan, did they just figure, ah, right, we'll just, we'll be fine. No, absolutely. Uh, the, all four of them got together and worked out in Tampa and different things. You had to, because this was too big of a deal for him to look really terrible. And it, it just was too big of a gamble not to. So yeah, they definitely took some time and got in there and got him to the point where he could do certain things and make sure that, uh, he was comfortable doing it. Uh, another fun question here from uh, Chris when the SummerSlam sign crashed down leading to Oakland's expletive, how did Vince and Bruce react? Who got in trouble? Did Vince ask Jesse to divert attention? I know you've told this story on some other episodes before, but retell when you realized, oh shit, I'm playing the wrong one. We fucking realized it live and it was like, God damn it. And, and tell Jesse to cover it. It was the second time in the night that Tony and Jesse were called upon to cover something. The first time being with the, the woman that took her top off. Um, so here was another her fuck up and you know, Jesse just commented on Gene's mouth, but he had already been, you know, got the wrath of damn it. You guys got to cover shit. And if we come to you, that's, that's your job. So we were pissed off that a, that someone put the wrong tape in and B then that it wasn't followed up on and, and jumped on immediately by commentators. They had to be told again. So that was the reaction and not a good one. Blue collar shirts wants to know in 2013, during his live shows with Eric Bischoff, Hogan talked about a sexual relationship he once had with sensational Sherry. Given that this information is now out there, can Bruce confirm how big's Batista's dick? Mark and Didron wants to know, can Bruce do Cornette if he was giving Rick Rude's robe speech? I don't know what the fuck he says. All you lazy, fat, out of uh, shape here. podcast puds. What I'd like to have right now is for all you. 
Yeah, what I'd like to have right now is a double fucking cheeseburger, triple cheese, extra honey, double mayo, motherfucker. That's what I'd like to have. Johnny Utah Fuck has. You. Thank you. Johnny Utah has the most dickhead question ever. Which eye did you choose to look at when speaking to Zeus? <laughs> My God. Johnny Utah, shame on you. The eye of the madness. I knew That's you were going to. I looked at. <laughs> Dude, you got to pick one and stick with it. <laughs> what is going on? Well, you do. Uh, it doesn't matter who you're talking to. Pick one and stick with it. Vacant wants to know SummerSlam 89 was the first of four consecutive pay-per-views that did not feature a world title match on the card. Was there a method behind this madness with only having the title defended at WrestleMania on pay-per-view or did it just happen that way? No, actually, you know, there kind of was a method behind the madness because WrestleMania was special at the time and it was looking for different attractions so that every pay-per-view wasn't about a, uh, world championship match that they were more issues and other reasons to have it. It was the rumble was the rumble survivor series was the teams. And then summer time just kind of fell into that personal issue one. So your big wrestling pay-per-view, if you will, uh, was WrestleMania. Ron wants to know, is there ever any discussion about bringing Zeus back in 90, 91, 92? Nope. We left that for WCW. We gave, we gave them his number. I love you for that. Phil wants to know, was there ever a plan to put the belt on Zeus? Yeah, sure. Yeah. We, we're going to have him and warrior work at WrestleMania. So well, no, listen, I know you're going to, I know you're making fun of that, but realistically the old, you know, you have the baby face chase. I mean, there could be a situation where. Yeah, he beat him on a Saturday night's main event and they had a pay-per-view for the belt or something, right? In theory. Who's theory? No, he couldn't work. Oh, Jesus. No, there, there was not. Like that fucking helped you. I know that I just, I, I stumbled the fuck on that one, didn't I? Uh, Francis Reyes wants to know, was there ever any talks of doing a second no holds barred movie? You know what? Um, I don't, I don't recall, but that's a damn good idea. Maybe now's the time. Now is the time. It's like, um, what if Rip's little brother grew up and it's John Cena? Here's a, an interesting question. You've told us before that Howard Finkel is responsible for naming WrestleMania. And one of the other names considered was colossal tussle. Were there other names considered for SummerSlam? And was Sonny Tussle ever one of them? Now, this is way before Sonny was on Skype doing a different kind of tussling. Um, this, the first one was 1988. And from day one, when I first heard the idea of the, the summer pay-per-view, it was always SummerSlam. So there probably were other names that were bantied back and forth, but I was never a part of that at that time. And it was presented to me as, Hey, th- this will be SummerSlam mega bucks versus the mega powers. And for all we knew it was a one-off. Look at beefcake go what? wise beefcake in the main event. Why Cause he's you, beefcake. Why are you encouraging that? What? Fucking good shit. Uh, Ian wants to know how come Brutus didn't stab them boys with them big ass clippers. Well, he about ready to cut that Z off of Zeus's head. I don't know why, but that cracks me up. Why did you just stab him? Because that would be cheating and the barber don't cheat, but he may cut. Oh, come on, Randy. <laughs> I don't know why I love when you do that impression. Come on.
lots of uh, weird questions today about Batista's anatomy and whether or not Zeus tried to give sensational Sherry an Alabama hot pocket. We have some interesting listeners. What in the fuck are you talking about? Which part? Any of that that you just said. I, every other question this week is about Batista's penis. I don't know. I, I guess, I guess I've created a monster here. My apologies, but <laughs> I had to look up Alabama hot pocket. And if you're listening right now, don't do that. I, I, I wish I didn't know what that was now. I don't need to know. No, you and do I'm, not. I'm need not going to look it up. You do not. I bet your son Kane knows, but he shouldn't. He just went away to college today and now you're going to make me look it up to make sure that I have to advise him against an Alabama hot pocket. He does not need to do that. There will be paperwork involved. No, there, no, no. Okay. Is there anything like a, uh, Tony's hot pocket? Yeah, we should just not talk about it. Okay. It's real bad. I don't want to know. Well, I mean, now I feel like we've talked about it so much. I have to No, you no. we're not. It involves defecation. Oh God. Why? <laughs> <laughs> uh, speaking of defecation, uh, Brutus and Zeus are in the ring. Now this is the blind leading the blind. Oh boy. Oh my God. Conrad, stop. You looked it up. Oh, fuck. Yes. Why did you look it up? Cause you told me not to. Oh God. You asshole. I didn't know. Somebody asked the question. I had to look it up myself. Why would you do that? And then bring it up on a, oh. 8 million people right now are, are fucking going, oh God. There's probably about three of them that are going. Yeah. So. I, I didn't do it. You disappoint me. I didn't do it. You did do it. By not doing it, that's the same thing as doing it. Boy, this this wrestling business is hard to navigate. Ah, oh, look at the way Savage hits those ropes. Good God, he was intense. By the way, uh, Wade would say the main event saw Hulk Hogan pin Zeus. And the main event tag team bout in a lot of ways, it was reminiscent of last year's main event and match quality and heat. The fans were very into this match and Zeus was over. Zeus was bashed in the head with Sherry's loaded purse by Hogan body slammed and leg dropped leading to his shoulders, staying on the mat for three Elizabeth and Sherry were both at ringside C plus. Well, considering the combatants in this match, I'd give it an A plus. He would also got say, the most out of Zeus. Um, the main event was an entertaining match, but the same match would have been horrendous in Trump Plaza where you can hear a worm talk. Zeus did what was about expected. He didn't take me out of my seat in amazement and he didn't make me bury my face and wish I wasn't a wrestling fan. This is the best WWF pay-per-view since WrestleMania three, mainly because there were really no slow parts and it kept my interest. His pace was also satisfying and, uh, there were, uh, there was enough memorable, original and funny moments. So wait, 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 dug it, man. What's not to dig this actually. And again, seriously, you, you take into consideration, um, beefcake and Zeus being in this match and it was better than it, than it deserved to be. Even though, I mean, again, beefcake is over like some bitch. And Zeus was a novelty and people, there was a high interest as to what he could and couldn't do. Um, this, this was pretty damn good. I mean, it's all Randy Savage and Hulk Hogan, but man, this is good shit. And you, you gotta assume when he hits the big elbow off the top, that that's going to be it. But Hogan just pops right up and here he comes. Well, because he hit the Hulk button. Yeah. And by God. Now it is time, motherfucker. Throw another punch. Oh, no. he I was going to tell him to throw two more punches, but he didn't even get to that. Spinebuster. Now Zeus is in. I wonder if Zeus is going to try and throw a right hand. 
the shit is on now, motherfucker. I am Zeus. Yep. Lock that, fucker. Yeah. One more. Oh, my God. Zeus is taking four punches. Swing and a miss. Close line. Nope, that didn't do it either. How's the Hulkster going to be able to get this monster down? Oh, he's on a knee. Where's the guy with the tie? Is he still in the fist? Let's see. No, he's seated right now. What the hell? Yeah. She's fixed to come in the hard way. Oh, who would do that from the outside, Miss Elizabeth? Thanks for missing that shot, Kerwin. He got enough of it. Oh, uh, the, uh, the, the hands guys here again, Justin is tie. He's ready. Got the loaded purse from Sherry. And it's a swing and it's out of here. No, <laughs> look at the guy in the crowd. He's calling for the body slam and he got it. He's so fired up. Because oh the God, leg drop. If Hulk hits the leg, it's over. That guy's got one stance. He's ready. Uh oh. Hulkster, don't you dare give her a fucking atomic gimmick fernum. Stavitz. Yes. Savage is back up. Uh oh. And look what Brother Bruda has in mind. Old Burtis pulling out them big ass clippers. And he's going to give an atomic drop to someone who doesn't have a ball sack. Oh. <laughs> and uh, Liz nails her. And you know what's coming. Here come the hedge clippers. No way. You can't do whatever. They better not cut off that ponytail of Miss Sherry. Must mean Ric Flair's in town. There's, there's like double hedge clippers too. Double hedge, double schnavitz. No, that's a double fernum. Here we go. Sitting her up. <gasps> Liz. Don't do it. No. Oh, man. Sherry's beautiful hair is gone. I love that. Uh, she made sure to put the little gimmick in there. It'll be like, Hey, let's hold all this shit together here. You know how long it took that hair to get just that way? Look at the fucking crowd go Dude, nuts. They're insane. And again, I hate to be the, the Debbie Downer. Neither of the women are with us anymore. Liz is gone. Sherry's gone. Macho's gone. Burtis lives forever. And there's a hair on top of Hulk's head. I got to tell you, man, when I was a kid, this is the first pay-per-view I remember watching live and I just still love this show so much. And it really is a lot different than last week's show. You know, we covered SummerSlam 99 and that was largely a forgettable show for me. And, th and there were lots of gimmicks, you know, uh, lover, lever and lion's den and hardcore and kiss my ass and triple threat. And, and there's lots of stuff on that card, but this one really stands out to me. And I think it's because of. Warrior Rude. I think it's because of the Heart Foundation and the Brain Busters. I think it's because of Zeus. You're right. And this is 1989. Last week was 1999. And this one holds up. Isn't that crazy? It's, you know, and you said it right there, man. It was, you look at that opening match, hell of a fucking first match. Warrior and Rude right in the middle of it. They did have a hell of a match, and it was something everybody looked forward to, switching of the Intercontinental Championship. And then you finish with the big finish with the unknown in Zeus and the always dependable Hulk Hogan and the never disappointing Randy Savage. Oh, yeah, and Beefcake. Beefcake is posing with the Hulkster because Hulk must pose. I guess we should uh, give everybody a heads up as we're winding down this week's episode as uh, they're finishing the Hulk must pose routine next week. We're going to cover in your house ground zero. Uh, 1997 is always a, uh, a popular topic and, uh, this will be no exception. September 7th, 1997 is what that one went down and Shawn Michaels and the undertaker are in a singles match 
And uh, that's your main event. First time we see Undertaker go over the top rope. We got Bret Hart and the Patriot for the world title. We've got Max Mini and El Torito. Yes. We've got uh, the Headbangers, the Godwins, the Legion of Doom, Owen and Bulldog in a four way for the vacant tag titles. Savio Vega is going to be in there with Crush and Farouk in a triple threat. Brian Christopher is going to wrestle Scott Putsky on a fucking pay per view. And Pillman and Goldust are going to work together. And this will be Brian Pillman's last pay-per-view. Unfortunately, uh, after that, we're going to do something we've, we've not done. Uh, I, I don't think in a long time, something from 2009, uh, I think this is going to be one of your last pay-per-views with the company breaking point, 2009. The main event of that is CM Punk and the undertaker. I wasn't there. It's September of 99 or 09. No, I left in December of 08. Well, you know, this would have been helpful when I sent you the fucking list ahead of time. Well, I just saw you wanted to watch it and get my opinion. <laughs> All right. Well, fuck it. We're not doing breaking point on nine. Right, we'll figure it out. Yeah, we will figure time. it out. We do. We do have big plans though. Uh, September 27th in particular, unforgiven 99. Uh, I don't know why I thought you were there then. I know that I know better, but unforgiven 99. Uh, that's an interesting one. It's in Charlotte. The main event is uh, Triple H, Big Show, British Bulldog, Kane, Mankind, and The Rock. It's a six-pack challenge with Stone Cold as uh, one of the special guest enforcers. Tom Pritchard is a special guest referee for X-Pac and Chris Jericho. The Kennel oh. from Hell. Al Snow and Boss Man. Lots of silliness to talk about there. Uh, and then last but certainly not least on the docket, uh, October 4th is when we're planning to uh, revisit the great career of Harley race. Uh, we recently lost Harley. We wanted to pay tribute to him. Uh, so we're going to make our way there as well. So stay tuned. Lots of fun stuff coming every Friday at noon here on something to wrestle. Uh, we look forward to uh, seeing you next week and appreciate your, your continued support every week. I am at, Hey, Hey, it's Conrad on social media. He is at Bruce Pritchard. Our show is at Pritchard show. If you'd like to ask a question for next week's in your house ground zero show, and, uh, we'll see you next week right here. On something to wrestle with, Bruce Pritchard. Shaka Khan. That was a good one. Brother. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to something to wrestle with. A very sleepy Bruce Pritchard. Bruce, what's going on, man? How are you? I'm all right. Boy, that Thunderdome's really taking a toll on your ass. Okay. What time did you go to bed? Oh. Who, whose idea was it to record at six forty-five this morning? Some fucking idiot. <laughs> <laughs> It was your idea. The fuck goes to sleep so goddamn late. That was also your idea. Well, we appreciate what you're doing for us. I know you're working uh, hard, burning it at both ends, and I'm eating the English muffin peanut butter, so I can awaken somehow. <laughs> Well, boys and girls, we're going to be talking Ask about me what I had for dinner last night. I didn't have any dinner. Neither did I the exact same thing. Oh, you don't hear me bitching about it. I'm a bitching. Yeah, a little bit. I'm making conversation. Listen, we got a big show today. It's a uh, SummerSlam 1990. We've got a bonus show coming up on adfreeshows.com. We're going to cover SummerSlam 1992. And next week, we'll be back at you with The Rocks 99 2000. And then we'll keep the hits going on the 11th of September. We'll be here for the Honky Tonk Man. On the 18th, we'll be covering Unforgiven 2005. And then on September 25th, another profile show on Rick the Model Bartell. So much 
fun stuff coming your way here on something to wrestle. And we hope that Bruce will be awake for all of it. Can't make no promises. Let's jump into it. SummerSlam 1990. Uh, yeah, believe it or not, yesterday was the 30 year anniversary. Happened August 27th from the Spectrum in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. It's the third SummerSlam pay per view event. We've got 19,304 fans, which was actually the lowest attendance of the first seven SummerSlams. But it's still a pretty solid gate, especially for 90, $338,450 from ticket revenue. The pay-per-view buy rate is a 3.8, which is significantly down from SummerSlam 89, which was 4.8. But by the way, this slide would continue. SummerSlam 91 was a 2.7 buy rate. Bruce, what do you think about the WWF in 1990? I look at it through little kid glasses. It was my favorite year, but realistically business was down from 89. Do you attribute that to Hulkamania maybe peaking in 89, a great storyline with the macho man is the business cyclical was the warrior, not the guy to be leading the company. What would you attribute this falling buy rate to fatigue? I think that. People were the the height and the build and the familiarity with Hulkamania and everything leading up to it um, was had reached a peak and had reached a fever peak in many ways that the audience I think was just a little fatigued and not embracing warrior nearly as much as they did Hulk. Um, they were embracing warrior and they liked warrior, but it just was different and it wasn't at the same level. So do you buy into the, uh, the theory that, and I mean, a lot of people subscribe to this, the wrestling business is cyclical. Sometimes it's going to be hot. Sometimes it's not. And, some of that is just based on the sort of ebbs and flow of society. Or do you think that it really is, you know, up to the company to keep it hot? I think that the cyclical argument, which by the way, I subscribe to, um, it's also a cop out. Cause you know, you can always say, well, Hey, that new all night gas station opened up down the street. Right. They got Diet Coke and refrigerators <laughs> and Reese's peanut butter cups. You can get them anytime you want. So I need to get down there. Instead of watch wrestling and going to the SummerSlam. Uh, but like society, like anything else, man, there's good times and there's bad. And this wasn't necessarily bad. This was just down. This was just different. So the cycle of Hulk Hogan and Hulkamania, the illusion that it was coming to an end was definitely there. Mm. You know, Arn Anderson recently said, you know, nobody wants to see a team that's eight and eight, but when a team goes 12 and zero, now you've got everybody's attention. Do you feel like once warrior beat Hogan, they thought that at WrestleMania, by the way, that perhaps he wasn't quite the same. Do you think it really hurt his character having that big loss at WrestleMania? Because we had never really seen that happen at a WrestleMania before. I mean, previously every WrestleMania, as it comes to a close, Hogan's in the ring posing and now he's leaving with his head down. It's the first time we'd seen that. Yes. But that just comes with change. That, that really is a matter of change and that's a matter of, of life. So I think that if anything, in a lot of ways, as far as Hulk and the character of Hulk Hogan, that particular night made him stronger. This is an interesting time for the company too, because 
we're no longer just doing WrestleMania. We've expanded to where now fans are familiar with the fact that we're going to have four big pay-per-views a year, the Royal rumble, WrestleMania, SummerSlam and survivor series. Of course, these days, Lord, it feels like there's a pay-per-view every weekend somehow, but the whole industry changed, you know, you don't have to go get a cable box anymore. Now you get the network and you pay one low price and you're good to go. Did you prefer the old school? You know, we're going to have a major pay-per-view every quarter. I did, especially, you know, we did television in a way. It was all syndicated TV. So you saw it in your local market at different times throughout the week, usually on a Saturday morning or Saturday afternoon or a Sunday morning, something like that, that would promote your local events. And you did live events. And then once every three months, you had this big event that was hyped. So it was a much simpler time, boys and girls. And it was a time that you could take your time in telling a story and allow things to develop and allow people uh, to get behind something, really get invested in it versus, hey, this is going to happen. Bam, this is why it happened. Bam, there it is. Hope you liked it. Bam, here's what's next. So... It was a simpler time, and I think that stories were allowed to play out longer and that they were probably a little easier to understand, and everyone got it because it wasn't so fast. The uh, major pay-per-view we're coming off of, as we mentioned, is WrestleMania six, where we saw the Ultimate Warrior win the world title from Hulk Hogan. We did a full show on that probably like three years ago. Available in the archives at something to wrestle.com. We're also on the heels of a Saturday night's main event, which we just recently did a show on a few weeks ago. Speaking of warrior, he's going to be making his first high profile title defense here. He'll be defending the title in the steel cage at SummerSlam 1990 against a former rival of his, the man who actually beat him for the intercontinental title at WrestleMania five ravishing Rick rude. Meanwhile, our hero for, I don't know what feels like nearly a decade here. Hulk Hogan will be making his long awaited return to the ring after a storyline injury at SummerSlam 1990. Of course, he's going to be taking on the man who put him on the shelf earthquake. We've got lots of news and notes as we head into this, but I do want to talk a little bit about ravishing Rick rude. This feels like the first major test for warrior you know, in, in sort of the post Hogan era after WrestleMania, it's his first pay-per-view and of all the opponents, we choose ravishing Rick rude. And we've done a great profile on ravishing Rick rude in the archives, also available at something to wrestle.com, but we're going to spend a lot of time talking about rude today. Why was ravishing Rick rude, the right guy to showcase the skills and talents of your brand new champion? We knew that Rick was the right guy because Rick had been able to do it with Warrior before. And it was an opportunity to put Rick into that upper echelon where Rick felt he should be. Frankly, where we all felt that he should be too. Warrior and Rude had good chemistry in the ring. And there was no, you know, it was an opportunity here for Rick to come out and it was it was a coming out party for Rick Rude too and it wasn't just Warriors first title defense this was the first time seeing Rick Rude in, in a top spot being able to carry that and I think that Rick did carry it and I think that Rick was an, an unbelievable talent especially in his ability to get guys like Warrior over what's so fascinating to me about this is and we're going to talk a lot about rude today, but I thought he just had a home run performance here. I liked the training montage video that got us here with Rick rude. I liked his new Thanks. look, which we talked a lot about, you know, cutting the hair, getting rid of the mustache. Talk us through how he really changed his presentation. It does feel like he's updating himself and he goes from looking like 1985 to very much 
you know, the way you would want a wrestler to look probably in 1990. Yeah. Rick got himself in incredible shape, uh, in a very short period of time. Rick was looking at the time. And I think this is when he had his son, uh, in this time frame. but good Lord. I remember going down to Tampa to meet with him and shoot vignettes with Bobby Heenan and rude. And it was just a physical transformation and almost a mental transformation for him as well to come in and just absolutely be on fire. And Rick Rude delivered it. I, I, in my opinion, didn't disappoint, didn't make anybody second guess anything at all uh, in that return to go with Warrior. I thought he did a hell of a job. Well... I want to come back to that, but first I do want to mention, you've told us before that rude, well, a warrior wasn't his favorite person. And I think he may have even taken it personally, the way warrior handled him or maybe didn't handle him because I think you sort of alluded to the fact that maybe once before when warrior was working with Andre back when he was intercontinental champion. Out of respect, he would bring Andre a bottle of wine or something like that and thank him for the match. Meanwhile, Andre really didn't have to do much in those matches, but he did carry a lot of respect. But you compare the effort that Andre put out versus the effort that Rick Rude put out, and Rick Rude was doing cartwheels for the Warrior. And I think he commented to you something like, I never got a thank you. I never even got a Gatorade. Was Warrior... What was the warrior rude relationship like? Were they oil and water? Did rude have any respect for him? Had these guys fallen out of favor before the bell ever rang here at the pay-per-view? Rude knew what his job was and rude knew that he was there to get this guy over. That was his job. But did rude like him and or like, uh, like that? No, he didn't. And rude did feel disrespected and felt as if, I'm doing all this work for you and you're reaping all the reward. So I think, yeah, a little resentment might be accurate. Well, the thing that always gets me about this is, and, and Lord, we talked about this a lot when we, we covered Rick Rude, and I can't help but bring it up again, but why didn't get more opportunities like this? As far as I know, in a singles match, not a survivor series, you know, big team situation. This is rude's only pay-per-view main event with the company. Is it not? Yes, it is. Well, I, you know, I'm just fascinated by, and we've often heard that the company would be booked sort of year to year. It feels like a logical thing that warrior would have been, or I'm sorry, Rick rude would have been on the short list of potential main event pay-per-view attractions for WrestleMania. And instead of us thinking, Hey, maybe Hogan rude or warrior rude at WrestleMania, we need a heel Sergeant slaughter. I don't know. It just feels like Rick rude versus Hulk Hogan at WrestleMania could have been big money for seven. It wouldn't have been as controversial as the Iraq thing. It would have been hokey as Sergeant slaughter turning heel. And at the end of the day, who would have given Hogan a better match? Sergeant Slaughter in 1991 or Rick Rude? Like to me, Rick Rude would be the prototype of the type of guy who would sell his ass off and make everything Hogan did look incredible, but he never got that opportunity. Did Vince not see him at that level? I don't know if it wasn't seeing him at that level. I think that when you look at it, where it matched up, did Rude have better chemistry, proven chemistry with Ultimate Warrior? And to be able to give Warrior his first big win as the champion, which is just as important to the general audience in his first big profile match, I'd argue that that was more important than a WrestleMania match with Hulk Hogan. So main eventing SummerSlam with Warrior to you is more important than main eventing WrestleMania with Hulk Hogan? At that time for the warrior and for the business, yes, because it was a building process. 
Well, I'm not saying that Rude wasn't doing his thing to help make the Warrior. It just feels odd to me that we've got one of the greatest heels of all time. I mean, when you think about great heels of the 80s or 90s and just like your prototype heel, Rude and Hogan never crossed streams, and that doesn't make sense to me. I'm, it feels like there's got to be more to the story, and, and maybe there's not, but it at least feels like a missed opportunity. Especially when you think about how well Rick Rude did on shows like Arsenio Hall and Regis and Kathy Lee, it feels like in a, in a, in a little press tour to try to promote WrestleMania, he could have been fantastic. And if we had to freestyle the Hogan thing for a minute, what if, you know, Rick Rude were to try to do something with Linda Hogan? much like he had with Jake's wife before the whole laying the big kiss on him and rude awakening and the whole deal. Do you think Hogan was not cool with that? And maybe that's the reason that got pushed aside or, or, or we never saw it because man, knowing what we know about Linda Hogan now, it feels like she would have eaten that up the opportunity to be on camera and perform. I mean, 15 years from now, she's going to have a reality show. Yeah, but that was before its time uh, in that regard. And this time, at this time, it was this wasn't about Hogan. This was about Warrior. This was about a time of building the Ultimate Warrior to be the next guy, and you needed people for him to work with that would get him over in the right way. And Rick Rude was that guy. Well, I mean, I think Rick Rude does a great job. Here is my point. But Warrior's going to have the belt for two, one more pay per view. And then at the following one, he's dropping it. So it feels like we're pivoting away from Warrior because we don't think that we can really count on him for the next WrestleMania. I mean, Survivor Series sort of is what it is. There's going to be a bunch of teams. But his next singles match on pay per view is against Sergeant Slaughter. Of course, the Macho Man's going to interfere and crown him. And now we've got a new champ, and it's Sergeant Slaughter. But it is just fun for me to sort of fantasy book. What if that happened with Rick Rude? And same thing, just put Rude in the slaughter spot. I think WrestleMania 7 could have been badass. A lot of what ifs there. Here's another what if we don't have to think about. Three days before SummerSlam on August 24th, you met with a WCW wrestler who was working under the name Mean Mark Callis. We've talked about this a little bit before, but three days before SummerSlam, and then he's going to debut at the next major pay-per-view. Things are happening pretty quickly for what will become the undertaker here. Well, we had had, we'd had a, uh, meeting scheduled, I believe in July at some point, uh, whatever the hell would it have been the, the great American bash where undertaker worked with Lex Luger. Um, is that about right? Yeah. Okay. And taker had a dislocated hip Worked the match anyway, because the next day he was supposed to meet with, with Vince that didn't happen. And it, it didn't happen because Vince looked at the undertaker and thought, ah, just another tall basketball player with red hair. Don't say anything special in him. And I had, first of all, he's working with Luger. So come on. Um, that's like working with a broomstick that doesn't have any bristles and is nailed to the floor. Um, take her. That meeting was canceled, and I begged Vince to, to please meet with Mark Calloway because they were in a um, show in the Meadowlands, I believe, and I offered to get The Undertaker there. I said, look, I'll, I'll get this guy. Just meet him. I didn't know him. I mean, I, I didn't know him from Adam. But I, I'd spoken to to Mark, and I was a big fan of Mark's work. Plus, in my head, I had an idea as to what to do with him. So I had an idea, and that was the talent in my head that could pull off that idea. 
So I was pushing very hard to, to get the two together, and it, it finally happened. Something else with uh, some pretty notable names is going to happen here. Uh, Meltzer would write, in a surprise move, the WWF has hired Roddy Piper to take the spot vacated by Jesse Ventura as color commentator on its Superstars of Wrestling show. Piper may be starting at the TV tapings this weekend, although we've also heard he may not start until the following Superstars of Wrestling taping on the 28th in Hershey, PA. Piper won't be playing a heel role, but will instead play a babyface role and work with Vince McMahon. The split between McMahon and Ventura was because Ventura was offered a deal with a company called DreamWorks that is producing a wrestling video game for Sega Genesis. Even though McMahon had claimed that this would be competition for a WWF licensed video game by acclaim for Nintendo, someone familiar with the industry said that the two games are in no way competition for one another. In fact, McMahon's WrestleMania game is more than one year old. And in that business, that means it has very little shelf life remaining. A lot to unpack here. Let's talk about Roddy Piper first. Was Roddy looking to do something in a way to come back and just not be taking bumps and making towns, or is this something you have to go try to sell? Roddy was looking to come back in general, and I don't know that Vince necessarily was looking for Roddy to come back on a full-time basis in the ring. I went back to looking for color commentators and in 1981, maybe, maybe 80, 81, when Roddy Piper had gone into Georgia championship wrestling was introduced as Rod Piper, the color commentator for Gordon Soley. Roddy did color commentary pretty much as straight as you could do it. it. Was very entertaining, not not over the top at all, and then started very slowly interjecting comments about uh, Bob Armstrong and so on and so forth, and, and became this character. Aside from just being a wrestler, he was introduced as a color guy, not a wrestler, and you had to pay to see Rod Piper in the ring. You had to, you had to pay to see him in live events. And the idea was, I thought Roddy was a very good color commentator and could replace Jesse and we wouldn't miss a beat. So we kind of went after Roddy a little bit on that one to say, would you be interested? It's a uh, fascinating this relationship with Ventura and McMahon, just so we're clear, make sure everybody has the right timeline here. This is before Jesse is going to sue for royalties. This is a totally separate issue. I don't think a lot of our listeners sometimes confuse the two. What do you remember hearing about this Sega Genesis business and the fallout with Vince and, uh, and Jesse? I just, it was really nothing more than a contract dispute and Jesse wanted to do his own thing and Vince wanting to do his own thing. So they couldn't agree to do that and didn't necessarily want to work together on it. Got to move on. You know, what's crazy is <laughs> the game never gets released. I mean, there were lots of flyers in the video game articles and they had different cover arts and things like that. But this is a, a Japanese exclusive game that now they're going to rebrand for, you know, the American market and, uh, you know, the fire pro wrestling series wound up being released by Sega eventually, but the original game was thunder pro wrestling over in Japan. And they're going to sort of Americanize it and call it Jesse, the body Ventura's wrestling superstars. And then it never gets released. Uh, eventually, uh, something leaks online, but it feels like he winds up leaving really for nothing because the game never even freaking comes out. Um, shit happens. Meltzer would continue. In addition, the amount of money that game, even if new, and if it was competition for the Vendura game was, was negligible in comparison to Ventura's value to the company. 
In reality, this split up appears to be more stubbornness than business, probably on the part of both. It's simply McMahon told Jesse he couldn't do something and Ventura was in a position where he didn't want to be told what he could or couldn't do by McMahon. After putting his foot down, even though Ventura wasn't, uh, what he was doing wasn't competition, McMahon couldn't appear to back down. And instead this somewhat minor situation turned into a contract impasse since Ventura wasn't about to back down. I mean, that sort of hits the nail on the head. Does it not? I mean, you have two headstrong guys and Vince didn't want to set a bad precedent. Uh, and that's probably something Vince had to think a lot about back in the days. You know, the idea of, oh, if you give them an inch, they'll take a mile type thing. Give me that word one more time into a contract. What impasse? Okay. I don't think that's what you said. I'm just making sure you're awake, Bubba. Are you going to talk to me about Ventura and McMahon's stubbornness, or we're going to worry about the way the hillbilly pronounces words? I like worrying about the way hillbilly pronounces words. Well, I think that the old impasse. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> it, you. You know, it just came down to a difference of, of opinion, and it really came down to Jesse digging in and feeling that he should be able to do whatever he wanted, even though he was under contract to WWE and that's not the way that it goes. So Jesse dug in Vince dug in and Jesse had an opportunity here. Okay. You want to go quit, go quit. And I don't know that, um, at that time, I know that Jesse kind of, was having a little buyer's remorse there for a long time, but that was his choice, and that's what he wanted to do. He felt very strongly about it and moved on. What do you mean he was having buyer's remorse? Talk to me about that. I don't think that Jess, well, first of all, you know, what Jesse was promised was going to happen, and, you know, a lot of times people will, you know, shit, you and I have been through it before and, and uh, with some different talents and different people where, Oh man, I hear that I can make X amount doing this on my own, or I can make all this, all this money. If I was just over here and allowed to do that and then they get out there and they realize, uh Oh, well, either I have to work for that money or it's not really true. And I, in this situation, that's what Jesse found out that. Hey, maybe I should have, uh, should have stuck around a little bit longer. And now I'm, I'm looking for something else because he, his video game world and, and the, all the promises that had been made by his people, um, just weren't panning out exactly the way that he was promised at the time or that he thought they should have. When, when Vince starts to have an issue with somebody, a, a talent. Back in this era, you're sort of in the inner circle. The see ever say, Bruce, reach out to so-and-so and see if you can talk some sense into him. Does that ever something he asks for your help with or, or not so much? Not so much during this time frame, and, and especially, you know, with Jesse. Um Jesse was Jesse. And Jesse had an agent that we dealt with. So it, it made it difficult. Anytime that you have that situation, it, it just becomes a little, little difficult when the talent is removed from the actual negotiation process. It's hard to imagine that he's done here in August of 90. He winds up suing in November of 91, uh, for the royalties. So he's on the sidelines of wrestling. For well over a year, he's filling some time doing some, uh, some radio calls for the NFL, but I don't think he's doing much else, at least in entertainment, certainly not in the wrestling space. Do you think if this stubbornness about this video game thing, if, if this had went differently, do you think he still would have wound up suing? Uh, that's hard to know. Uh, I don't know if it just was that all of a sudden Jesse was on the outside looking in and 
things didn't necessarily pan out. So it's, well, shit, we've already lost this amount of money. Is there any way to, to go back and recoup? I, and I think that did have a lot to do with it. What's interesting to me is it's, uh, of all the people, if Ventura is going to be stubborn and, and wander off of all the people to think, ah, let's replace that with a more reliable guy. Somebody we know we can count on who we've always had great relations with. I know what to do. Let's call Roddy Piper. It feels like Roddy and Jesse were cut from the same cloth. Like these are two old school. We're for the boys. Screw the office personalities. It feels like they have a lot in common and could have both been, I don't know, a thorn in, in, uh, in Vince's ass occasionally. They, they did have some things in common, but they couldn't have been more different in a lot of respects. So, you know, while on the outside, I think someone that, you know, didn't have to work with them could say, oh, they're very much alike, but they were very different when it came to, when it came to dealing with them. Uh, very, very, very different. I could deal with, I could deal with Roddy one-on-one. That was never an issue. What's interesting is both of these guys, both Roddy and Ventura are trying to work on this new tag team series for television and Meltzer would even write Piper's contract with Disney for tag team prohibits him from doing any wrestling for the WWF because of the injury risks. I mean, why don't you think tag team was a hit? Why didn't we see more tag team? You ever see it? I saw that one episode. Well, there you go. Was that really? What's that? Was it that bad? Really? It wasn't good. It was pretty hokey. I just didn't think, you know, I think that people saw it and realized that, you know, oh yeah, this isn't good. Well, I mean, I think the original idea was it was going to be a series and it wound up just being a, a one hour deal. So it feels like, you know, maybe they did an hour long pilot released it on TV because they thought, well, we got a bunch of money in it, but it doesn't actually become a thing. I feel bad for Jesse. It was like everything he's touching here is coming snake bit. Let's talk about something Meltzer wrote here. He says to minimize the loss, McMahon hired Piper to fill the slot, even though many in the organization don't think Piper is the right person for the job. The thought was expressed to me that most announcers are there to get over the wrestling and the angles, but Piper's personality is such that he'll overshadow what they're trying to sell and just get over Piper. That may be good for TV ratings, but it won't help the houses. And listen, I got to tell you until, I don't know, I was an an adult man, maybe in my thirties, I didn't really understand what getting yourself over versus getting the talent over is. And I hear that all the time from old timers, like, oh, it's not about you trying to get over blah, 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 not trying to get yourself over. And now I can spot it. Sometimes you see on indie shows and it looks like the ring announcer is trying to get himself over more than the talent. So certainly I could see how that would happen on commentary. And now that I get it, maybe that makes sense. Did you have any concern that Piper couldn't help, but be in the Piper business? Or did you think he could do this very, very effectively? Both. I I had concerns about Roddy just wanting to get himself over and being in that position to grab that spotlight. However, uh, had quite a few chats with hot rod about that very topic and saying, look, here's the concern. I'd like to use you for this and we'd really love to have you on, but being on every single week is getting you over and will probably get you over stronger than if you were wrestling. So do what you do best because Roddy did know how to get people over. By talking, Roddy took that as a challenge is, okay, watch me get these guys over and did exactly that by talking about them in the right way and and being Roddy Piper and just looking at everybody that was in the ring as Roddy Piper and giving them the same treatment he would have given himself. Let's, uh, let's talk about the dynamic on air. What's worked for a long time, it feels like, 
is a baby face and a heel. So Gorilla Monsoon's a baby face. Bobby Heenan's a heel. Vince McMahon's a baby face. Jesse Ventura's a heel. That feels like that has been the formula and it's worked very successfully. But Jesse was a heel commentator. Roddy's going to come in as a face. Is there any concern about messing up that dynamic and that has, you know, proven to work so well for so long? You still had a heel and a baby face. going to say Vince was the heel. You said that <laughs> I'm not talking about real life. I'm talking about on camera yeah, in real life. Uh, one of the first times me and you hung out, we were watching a football game in the background and, uh, you don't even really watch football and you were yelling giga Maggie's and shit like that. When Alabama was playing Texas A&M. And you had no idea what was going on, but you just kept saying it. And I realized very well, quickly because you had them loud mouth bastards in your damn den over there screaming about some tide rolling or some kind of shit like that. And I just thought that they needed their clothes wash. And who's ready for the tide? I'll roll. Cause I just thought they were dirty. So here's the thing. <laughs> I realized in one of our very first meetings, our first times hanging out, uh, this guy's a fucking heel. Do you think Vince inside his own brain? thinks First time you met me, you thought Vince was a heel. Good morning, Bruce. Until you're back to normal. Do you think Vince considers himself a heel the way you consider yourself a heel? Well, I'm not a heel. First of all, yes, you are. That hurts inside where it counts. You claim openly and loudly and proudly that he's a heel. Yeah. And okay. Listen, you're not making this very fun because you're just being cantankerous right now. Let's do one more thing. Right now I'm being cantankerous at this very moment. I ain't buying that. The uh, interesting thing about the timing of all this, I, I got some more clarity as we're doing this show. Tag team only has two episodes, uh, and then it's canceled. And that cancellation happens just two days before Jesse makes his final appearance as a commentator for the WWF. Dude, you don't talk about bad timing. Well, again, everybody has choices in life to make. And if they are, look, again, it's Jesse's choice. Jesse had a choice. And yes, some things later on worked out for him. And in the short term, they didn't. But even in the long term, I think that people could argue, hmm, had he, had he stuck with it a little bit longer, uh, might have made the entryway into some other things a little easier as well, but that's Jesse. And, and I think that Jesse himself would probably tell you that his, his decisions and his career path were, uh, all perfect for him. So who's to argue? Here's some other news and notes about folks who are looking to do something else. Both bad news, Brown and Haku have had offers to leave and go to Japan. Meltzer would say, we've heard talk of Brown leaving from time to time, but he always stays. However, with Anoki back in power, the talk in Japan is that Brown will become bad news. Allen and work mainly in Japan, starting as early as September, all Japan, trying to get Haku back in December to become a new tag team partner of Jumbo Saruta and eventually turn on Jumbo and feud, uh, between the two of them for the next year. Bad news is a guy who we know has. Well, not always been happy with the WWE. What do you remember about him having an, an offer here? It does feel like this is going to be his last pay-per-view. What was, why was this coming to an end? I mean, I think on bad news side, he would say Vince had failed to live up to his promise as making him the first black champion, but you've often said here on the show, Vince didn't promise anyone. They were going to be champion there. He was never promising title runs. That wasn't something he did. What can you tell us about his unhappiness and why ultimately this is going to be his last major show? Well, 
from bad news perspective, I don't think that bad news felt he was getting paid the way that he wanted to get paid. There was an opportunity for him to go back to Japan and bad news liked Japan. He, he enjoyed it. So bad news was looking at this opportunity as one to have a little bit more independence and more freedom and do what he loved to do. And bad news loved going to Japan and working that different style and just having the freedom of not having to work every week uh, in a regimented system. So for, for Alan, I think Alan used the excuse, of, oh, I wasn't making the money that I feel I should have made. I think that the schedule and the work had a lot to do with that as well, that he, wanted, he being Alan wanted to go on and, and go do what he liked to do. That's wrestle. I guess the thing I'm always fascinated with about bad news is it feels like, you know, he had all the makings of a top heel and then, yeah, you're exactly right. I mean, we have heard over the years that he wasn't happy with the way he was being compensated. Who was, who was handling that for the company in this era? I mean, we know fast forward a few years, everybody knows that Jr. was you know, helping make payoffs and payroll and things like that. Who had that role here in 90? Well, same people had it when Jr. was says he was doing it. Um, Jr. did first pass. There, there were a few people that did first pass. Um, Pat was doing first pass at this time. I don't even know if JJ was with the company yet. Um, he was still probably, it was probably Pat and Vince. Vince had final, you know, final say. Vince would look over the payroll and make final approval. Was there some sort of formula, a WWF way? You've told us before that, you know, certain promotions said, oh, the champion or the main event gets this percent, blah, blah, blah. And we know the NWA champion used to get X percent, whatever. Was there a WWF formula that you knew of? I mean, I always had my formula, but my formula came from Paul Bosch in Houston, Texas. And then later on from Bill Watts, I could, and it's a, look, it's a feel. It it really and truly is. And you look at what the gate is, you look at your percentage of what's left over that goes to the talent pay and you start ciphering. So Again, I had my way. I had my way of looking at it. Uh, Vince had his way. JR had his way. Paul Bosch, Vern Gagne, Sam Mushnick, Bill Watts all had their ways. So it, it's it's different, and it comes down to um, a feel. And you've got to listen, and who, who's drawing, who drew the house, where does that money go and how hard they perform that night? So there's a lot of variables that go into that. It sure is remarkable to think that bad news was only around for two years. I mean, what an impression he made here. I mean, I know he was with the WWF before in the late seventies, but you know, from 88 to 90, he made quite the impression. It would have been cool to see what he could have done, but he like Jesse, uh, it's going to wander off for greener pastures or so he thinks let's talk about something that I found in the WWF magazine in 1990. There's an ad that reads professional athlete wrestler, successful applicant to wrestle professionally at various arenas in the United States and abroad participate in professional competitive wrestling events to entertain audiences. According to established rules. Applicant must be strong, agile, and possess great athletic ability. Must have five years wrestling experience, salary for a 40 plus hour week, $2,000 a week. Please send resume to job service, technical unit, Connecticut department of labor, 200 Folly Brook Boulevard, Weathersfield, Connecticut, 06109. Refer to job order number 306-2596. What is this? There was a, some kind of law that you had to post a, like for jobs and what kind of jobs that you were hiring for, whether they were independent contractors or for full-time employees. It was some kind of Connecticut law. 
I mean, did anybody ever actually take that seriously or was there any guy somewhere like, oh shit, here's my chance. I'll bet you any amount of money in the world that there were a lot of people that probably read that and sent in their homemade resumes. Say, look at me. I won this match. (laughs) So great. I think I could take that honky tonk man. I mean, he's just a honky tonk man. Oh God. Let's talk about, uh, the SummerSlam fever special. It airs on August 19th. It's taped four days prior on the 15th in, uh, Utica, New York. Draws a sellout and Meltzer would report on it. The actual best match on the nine match special was Mr. Perfect beating Ron Garvin in five fifty seven, And that would probably only be a star in three quarters match. And that's strictly for the performance by perfect. Actually for Garvin to have an effective match, he needed time. And this was a rush them in, rush them out type of show with most of the matches lasting less than three minutes. The remainder of the wrestling matches saw demolition smash pin Jim Neidhart when Neidhart tried a sunset flip, but smash held onto the ropes and sat on him for the pin. We gave that one star. The match itself was half a star at best, but a good post-match brawl in the aisle when all three demolition ganged up on Neidhart and left him laying made up for it. Kerry Von Erich, who will no longer be Kerry Von Erich very soon, pinned Black Bart with a tornado punch in two minutes and 41 seconds and a dud match. Warlord pinned Pez Watley with a power slam in 253 for half a star. Nikolai Volkov pinned Boris Zukov with a clothesline behind the head in 237 for a negative half a star match. Power and glory beat a couple of enhancement guys in 235 when they did their finishing move of Hercules doing a superplex from one turnbuckle and Paul Roma jumping off the top rope onto the other guy from another turnbuckle. Jake Roberts pinned Mike Sharp with a DDT in two minutes and 39 seconds, and they had to pipe in a lot of fake crowd noise for this match. Urine Express would beat Shane Douglas and Sonny Blaze in 208. Jim Duggan beat Earthquake by DQ in 620. When Dino Bravo interferes, Hulk Hogan would run in with a two by four to make the save and chase both away. And they finished the show with his posing routine. Lots of interviews with most of the top names on SummerSlam. Ultimate Warrior and Kerry Von Erich now look like the Bobsy twins. It surprises me that Titan changed Warrior's appearance. Even to the changing of the hair color and hairstyle, where they were pushing another guy as the top baby face with the exact same look. Talk to me a little bit about, you know, the, the strategy and the theory behind airing a television special, but it feels like the matches, which maybe you would think are all just selling the pay-per-view and maybe that's what this did. I don't know. The, the card just sort of feels thrown together. It doesn't feel like it's as focused on the actual card as maybe what you would present today. Was it just a different era? It was a different era. And the idea behind the card was to promote to SummerSlam. It, it wasn't to give them SummerSlam. It was a just bulked up syndicated show that focused strictly on a big last minute sell to, to get to SummerSlam. That's all it was. It wasn't meant to be uh, th- this ratings thing. It wasn't meant to be SummerSlam. It was meant, it was meant to be the show that got you interested in it for one last punch to take you home and let you have SummerSlam. What do you make of his, uh, his, critique of the ultimate warriors look changing a little bit. And that is the case. I mean, you look at him at WrestleMania and you look at him at SummerSlam, there are some adjustments. Was that something that Jim Helwig is doing on his own? Is that something that you guys are advising him to do? Talk me through that. The, the face paint, that, that was a change. That was a, um, structured, structured, change uh just trying to make him a little more relatable a little more human um good luck with that it did just trying to, to to get him to be able to identify with more people and not just be this crazy character and hulk has some human qualities to him 
that you could relate to. Same even with Savage. But Warrior being the madman, you had to, at some point, let them know there's a man behind there and that there's a human being. And that was that was the reason for it. It was trying to look at marketing him in a different way. Still can paint his face, just a little warrior symbol. He can still be the warrior, but it's not the the full flown face paint and everything. We got back to that, but well, it was an experiment to try and get there. Do you try the experiment because you feel like business is down and, and we don't have the right indicator? So maybe we do need to try something or do you try it because you feel like, well, this is what worked for Hogan. Because if it's the latter, I do question, you know, why wouldn't we have tried that before WrestleMania not after, because it felt, it felt like to me when you took his traditional face paint off and instead of it just being on the cheek, like the way I remember warrior is it covered his whole face and he had the big, the big bangs and the hair sprayed hair and the whole deal, like the crazy bouffant hair. And as silly as it seems, that's the way I still remember the warrior now. And I didn't, I didn't prefer this look. It felt like it was not my same guy. And I'm not saying it was a different human. I'm just saying, you know, as Kevin Sullivan once said, you don't change Mickey, Mickey Mantle's number. If this is working and and we feel like this is the character people have identified, why would we want to deviate and make him look like everybody else? Well, he didn't, but you couldn't have done anything to make him look like everybody else. It was just a, a tweak, a tweak in his presentation, trying to make him a little more relatable. That's all it was. It's just fascinating to me. It doesn't feel like we would have done that for Hogan, but let's talk about something else that he writes here. Uh, he being Meltzer pronouns. What's that? It didn't need to do it with Hogan. Why did you think you needed to do it with warrior? Well, because people weren't relating to him. Then, then why well, his fan base wasn't growing. It was, it was staying the same and it wasn't growing. I got you. So he had a, he had a big fan base, but it wasn't the phenomenal growth that Hulkamania had where it felt like a, a snowball rolling downhill. It wasn't getting bigger every week or every month. Yes. I got you. We didn't have the momentum. Well, you take a look at the, the way the warrior is dressed here at SummerSlam 90 and you look at him at WrestleMania six and it feels like a small thing on the surface, but then you look at it, the face paint. It's quite the change. Um, let's talk about something else though. Meltzer says for a promotion based on unique characters, it's number two and number three baby faces will be too similar. And he also says Sherry Martell had makeup to make her look like a monkey and brother love did a segment with Hulk Hogan in the middle of the card. And you can tell that's what drew the house because the place emptied out, even though the two main events were yet to occur. Actually, the best part of the show was commentary. A lot to unpack there. Uh, first of all, he's giving you a high five, saying that your segment with Hulk Hogan is what really drew the house. But people were leaving before the main events. And I got to think this was not the only time Hogan was in the middle of the card in this era. And if you start looking around as someone from the quote unquote office and you see well, they're staying to see Hogan and then they're leaving. doesn't matter what's on last and they have. Whoa, even... whoa, 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 Staying to see Hogan. Who's Hogan working with brother love. There you go. Big boy. So all those fans showed up to see you and Hogan just happened to be in your segment. Yeah. That checks out. Yeah, they left after they saw me. Talk to me a little bit, though, about when Vince starts to wonder, did we make the right call? I mean, I know Hogan has been adamant that you weren't making the right call, but he did business at WrestleMania 6. But I had to feel, I don't know, a little uneasy, a little unnerving. When you've got this great momentum, or so it seems, and you're doing these shows and Warriors, our main event, he's on last, he's got a great story. He's got a great opponent, but they're hitting the aisles when Hogan's done. 
uh, brother love. Facts are facts. You're going to give me anything here. Or are we just going to put yourself over. I like putting myself over, um, because it was me. I don't know, you know, if it's fatigue, even here that <clears throat> being a long show that maybe they didn't want to wait and they, they saw Hulk and for many, many years, the audience was conditioned in that way. Right. Hulk's and last Hulk's out. Yeah. Hulk's last and, and you move on. But, uh, more than anything, I, I think it was just the crowd was tired and the kids were there to see Hulk and okay, there he is. Okay, let's go. Not not a testament to anyone else. This is drawing and or lack of lack of drawing ability. It, but it does say something that you know you've told us before. When you first come to the company, you guys would do these marathon TV tapings, but you would keep people hanging around for three, four, sometimes five hours by in between you know matches, announcing to the live crowd. Stay tuned fans. Hulk Hogan is here and he's going to be out as your main event. And so you would think that the crowd was asleep by the time this taping is over, but they hit that music and they come alive in a way you've never seen before, but they're not for damn sure, but they're not doing that for warrior the way they did for Hogan. And that has to be worrisome. They were doing that for warrior. If warrior was the only alternative. You know what I mean? Yeah. But if you had both, there were still people that were in the pick them department. So they would just say, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to wait for warrior. I'm going to wait for Hulk. And, and they, they chose versus just staying for the whole show. And if you only have one, then you obviously, you have an obvious choice, right? Let's get to uh, SummerSlam, but before we do, I want to mention something Meltzer real here. Titan contacted Big Van Vader about coming in between Japanese tours as he does now with the NWA. This is significant only because Titan has never wanted to use anyone that wasn't 100% theirs or share with another group, which I guess shows how impressed some WWF people are with his gimmick and its ability to draw with the NWA. This is remarkable to think about what could have been here instead of him having that really historic run in WCW and then coming over. What if it would have happened in 90? That's something else, man. I mean, I think, yeah, and, that, and that's Meltzer saying that he was going to work in between Japan tours. Well, let's, let's mention, cause I, well, let's give some context to it. July of 90 is when we see big van Vader's first match for WCW slash the NWA. And here we are in August and it's been reported that you guys had interest. And we know you're talking to mean Mark fresh off of his match with Lex Luger. When you're watching that same pay-per-view, is it you? Who's like, God damn, we got to get this big guy. I think it was all of us just kind of looking at him and saying, holy shit, this would be a hell of an opponent for warrior. This would be a hell of an opponent for Hulk. And looking at it that way, because it was really nothing more than that. And the idea of only having Vader part-time was not something that we were interested in because we were looking for someone that could come in and work full-time. Why don't you think it wound up happening? What were you not able to give him some sort of a guarantee? Did you have some sort of money conversation with him? I'm curious why we didn't see Vader here at 90. I don't think that Vader wanted to give up his Japanese gig at the time. He was happy doing that and making good money and being able to be home a lot more. So I don't, I just don't think that Vader was interested in that at this point in his career. Let's get to the show. SummerSlam first match power and glory versus the rockers. Uh, everybody knows the rockers, are one of the best teams of all time. And I think power and glory are criminally underrated. Uh, let's remind you how we got here on the July 21st, 1990 episode of superstars. Paul Roma is attacked after a match by Dino Bravo. Then the rockers come to the ring for the following match. Roma accuses them of attacking him. 
The argument turns physical and Roma was backed up by Hercules. One week later, Roma and Hercules appear on the brother love show and form their new team power and glory. I love this tag team and I don't know why I love it so much, but the silly glasses, the cut off sweatshirts, tell me what you can about power and glory. Two guys that were, you know, Hercules was kind of coming off of a singles run. And I don't think that, that Paul Roma was, you know, setting the world on fire by any stretch of the imagination, but two good looking guys with similar physiques and similar looks, but more than that, similar attitudes of, of really wanting to break out of the pack. And let's try to take these two guys and team them up and make something out of it. To me, it was an opportunity to pool their, their talents rather than try to focus on each one individually, because each one individually, I think only had so much in them, but the, the team, they looked good together. They looked like a team and it was a way to kind of salvage and elongate both careers. What do you think of those silly, uh, red sunglasses? I mean, is that the most eighties looking thing you've ever seen? Those were awesome. I love them. I, I think me and you need a pair. I just need to find who's got them. Yeah, no, they're, they were great. They, they completed the look, man. You know, it is a very simplistic look, some silly sunglasses, some cut off, uh, sweatshirts that say power on one and glory on the other, throw a lightning bolt in the middle, and then let's throw them in some black trunks and black tights. seems rather simple. Talk to me a little bit about who would have, I mean, is this something you involve creative services or are these just the guys just like, Hey, what can we find at the fucking Walmart? I think, you know, I actually think that creative services may have done a draw up on these and the logo at least. And then the rest was okay. Here, here's a look, here's your stuff and let's go try this. Well, and I, I, yeah, I do think that creative services, Debbie Bonanzio and those folks over there that, uh, that they were involved in this. Talk to me about Shawn Michaels. He's coming into this match with a bad knee and, uh, there's going to be some stuff written about it. Do you remember Sean or can this show hurt? Sean was very hurt. Sean needed to get surgery. And this was during a time where, okay, if you were hurt and you need to get surgery, let's go out and make a reason for you to, to be out of action for a while where the audience can actually see it and not do any more damage to the injury, but it's already there and you got to have surgery anyway. So Let's do it. This is really the first time we hear about him having some sort of knee issue. We know he's going to have knee surgery in 97. And of course, famously, that's the same year where he talks about losing his smile, but he comes back and I don't know. It does feel like he's had a series of knee problems through his career, but this is the first time that it rears its head during his WWF run, right? Yes. Yes. And, and it was unfortunate. Shit happens sometimes, man. Well, power and glory are going to defeat the rockers in six minutes, six minutes and one second. Uh, Meltzer would say it was obvious that Shawn Michaels was hurting just walking fast down the aisle. The rockers usually run and he wasn't ready to work because of his bad knee. So the only option other than subbing him with Shane Douglas, as they've done on the house shows was to do an immediate angle where Hercules jumped in before the bell and nailed his knee with a chain. Because of that, Janetti worked the entire match. It's interesting that McMahon acknowledged Michaels was coming into the match with a knee injury and the guys did about as good as they could considering they were limited in time, fast action with Roma and Janetti and lots of double teaming as well. Hercules still stinks, but with a hot partner, they'll make one of the better tag teams in the Federation. Roddy Piper kept saying the rockers were like Mick Jagger and David Bowie. Showing he's kept himself only 15 years behind the times on hot rock artists. Janetti had Roma pinned and Hercules clotheslined him just before the finish. Hercules doing the superplex and Roma splashing him off the top rope. Janetti was probably the best worker on this card. The heels left both guys laying after the match. Michaels did a stretcher job and the way commentary went, I got the impression Michaels is going to be out of action for a while. Three stars. Lots to unpack here. 
What do you think of Meltzer's comment that Janetti is the best worker on the card? I think that Janetti is an excellent worker, and uh, I don't know if he was best on the card, but he definitely was an excellent worker. It's it's interesting that you know Janetti is held in such high regard as an as a bell to bell performer. But it's the out of the ring stuff that's always kept him in trouble. I'm sure me and you never talked about this, but I'm sure it at least came across your timeline and you saw some of the craziness that Janetti's name has been attached to this year. Yeah, you know, it's just a shame and I've never understood the the need to to share everything about your life out in public. Um as you know, uh, this is about as much as I'll do, and I, I don't, I don't subscribe to it. Don't try not to do it. And people say, "God damn, Bruce, you do a podcast <laughs> every week." Yeah, I do. I just um, try to keep personal things personal. Yeah, you always play, you know, with with Stephanie's particular challenges here, or there. You don't comment on it at all. You just, I mean, if it comes up, it's because I'm, you know, trying to rally some prayer warriors for you here on the show, but it's not like you're putting any of your business out there. Yeah. And then, so I just think that that's kind of on, on Marty's part. It's, it's, it's tough to comment on because you, you don't know, you don't know what's fact, what's fiction and what's just trying to get your name out, out there in the public. I hope that Marty can pull the nose up. I mean, he's one of all of our favorite wrestlers, you know, growing up, we grew up with him and I don't want to see him in a bad way. So I hope that he can get some things straight and, and it would just be great for him to have a second act. I agree. Let's talk about power and glory. You know, they're, as I said, one of my guilty pleasure tag teams. I absolutely love their finish. I think they had a cool look and presentation but they're only going to last like another year and then they're done. Why don't you think power and glory had a longer run? Was it just, were they a little, a little too late? Like if they well, would think that having a year run at that time is a pretty good run, frankly. And some guys didn't even get to have that. Right. But having a run at the, at the, at the time that they did and being able to go out there and people still talking about them today, I think is pretty and damn impressive. Uh, why, when they needed a manager, did you guys look to slick? It may have been as simple as slick me to someone to, to manage. And it may have been just as simple as, Hey, these guys work with Dr. Style. Um, not much more than that, really. Did you not think that Hercules and Roma were capable of doing a good promo or was it more heels have bad guy managers in this era? You tell me, what do you think? I, I don't think that, that Roma and Herc were a good promo and I think they needed help. And plus heels need managers. Well, yeah, that was sort of my, my thinking. I mean, I'm not saying that those guys were going to come out and cut, you know, rock and flare level promos, but it does feel like at least in this era, if you're not sure, do you, do you cheer this team or boo this team? Cause they kind of look cool and they're doing cool power moves and look, they just beat the rockers. It must be pretty good, but if you've got slick over in the corner, it's like a little reminder. Oh yeah. We're supposed to boo them because we don't like that guy. Bastards. Next up, we've got Texas tornado winning the intercontinental title, pinning Mr. Perfect in five minutes and 13 seconds. Meltzer would write tornado catapulted perfect into the ring post and then used the claw, which got a big reaction. So an awful lot of the fans must be familiar with watching wrestling from other promotions and pinned him with a tornado punch, pretty bad match. One star. Meltzer would note the match was originally supposed to be Brutus Beefcake challenging Mr. Perfect for the IC title. Beefcake, of course, had given Perfect his first pinfall loss right after or right at WrestleMania six. 
However, Brutus was involved in that parasailing accident on the 4th of July. Gary Von Erich, who had just come into the WWF about a month prior to this, was then put into the match. A lot to unpack here. Had Brutus been in the match, was he going to win the title or was Perfect going to get his win back from WrestleMania 6? God, I would hope that Brutus Beefcake would win the title. It's Brutus Beefcake. I, you know, I, I don't really even remember, but I know that it was the perfect opportunity to debut uh, Carrie, get Carrie out there and get Carrie into the a big name right away, make some impact, come on in and win the championship. So working with perfect is not a bad gig to be in as well. Oh, no doubt. It's just fascinating to me to think we may have actually had Brutus Beefcake as intercontinental champion. I mean, I think as it is, the only titles he won in the company were tag belts, you know, once way back in the day with, with Greg Valentine and then fast forward with Hogan, but yeah, Brutus Beefcake intercontinental champion. I don't see it. Ah, could have happened. Should have happened. Probably on paper. This feels like it could be a great match. You've got Kerry Von Eric, who's now wrestling here as the Texas tornado. What a look. I mean, he's compared to our champion warrior, incredible physique, natural charisma. Fans were popping for the stupid ass claw, dumbest finishing maneuver in the history of wrestling. And Mr. Perfect is freaking Mr. Perfect. My goodness. These feel like prime opponents, but it just doesn't click. Is it? Had Kerry lost a step? Did he not have it? Was Mr. Perfect slowing down? Was he not motivated to work? No, Kerry Kerry? lost a foot. Oh, gosh. What? Do you think his work changed that much with uh, when he lost the foot? I do. I think a little bit of his confidence was lost as well. That, you know, Kerry became, I don't want to say obsessed, but concerned definitely with his with his work, how he did what he did, um, at that time. So that people wouldn't think that he was working without a foot. Let's, um, I I don't, I don't know why this match wasn't better. I mean, do you have any, I mean, is is it really as simple as sometimes guys just don't have natural chemistry when you watch this back, do you think somebody had an off night because on paper, And I'm sure you've done this a lot where on paper, it feels like, man, this will be a fucking great match. I mean, we know one year later, Mr. Perfect with, with a horrible back is going to put on the performance of a lifetime with Bret Hart, but it's just not possible here with Kerry for some reason. It was a clash of styles and it was also a clash of, Hey, we need to get Kerry over in quick fashion here. And it just didn't, didn't necessarily jive. Sometimes the best in, in the world can't can't get a match out of somebody. And then that same somebody can go work with you know another guy and be perfect. It's been rumored that both uh, the British Bulldog and Bam Bam Bigelow were also considered for this spot before it ultimately went to carry. Is that true? The spot as in winning the championship? As in filling in for Brutus Beefcake. It was originally Beefcake perfect. Beefcake's down. Supposedly, there's three names considered. Gary Von Erich, the Texas Tornado. Davy Boy Smith, the British Bulldog. And Bam Bam Bigelow. I wouldn't shock me at all to, to think that they were considered. I just don't know if. You know, Kerry coming in, I think it was the perfect, perfect opportunity at that point to to put Kerry in that picture. So I just, um, God, I don't, I don't know that it would have been as good either. I don't know that Bam Bam in that spot or any, I don't know that anybody in that spot would have fit. Having Carrie there, I think it was the right thing for Carrie. It feels like, I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm wrong, but it feels like British Bulldog in this spot could have worked just as well. Certainly fans in the Northeast would have been just as maybe more familiar, but then again, 
we're in Philadelphia. These are the hardest of hardcores. And when he, when he slaps the claw and they pop, so they've been watching other wrestling. Were you surprised that the claw got the reaction it did? No, I think I would have been surprised if it didn't because of all the syndication that world-class had all throughout the area for so many years. And the audience in, in many ways, Kerry was one that you could look at and say he came in already over because of his world-class exposure. He's going to be with them two more years. He's going to leave in uh, August of 92 and, uh, even though it wasn't a super long run, there's a lot to unpack. I can't wait for us to talk about it. I've got all my notes ready to go. We do have a bonus show planned for adfreeshows.com. And as soon as Bruce gets awake one day, we're going to make that one happen. Let's talk about the 1990 Royal rumble. That's where we would see Sherry appear on the brother love show. Brother love would discuss the definition of a lady using Sherry as the example. He then discussed peasants bringing out Sapphire as an example. Sherry and Sapphire fight, which leads to Savage and Rhodes fighting. And then Rhodes and Sapphire would face Savage and Sherry at WrestleMania six Rhodes and Sapphire, of course, win the match with a little assistance from Elizabeth and leading up to SummerSlam, Sapphire had been receiving gifts from an anonymous benefactor. Sherry winds up winning her match with Sapphire by forfeit because Sapphire never comes to ringside. Meltzer writes in that way, this match was tons better than it was figured to be going in after the match. They did an interview with dusty Rhodes, who was trying to figure out what happened, which was the storyline for the night. What happened to Sapphire and Jim Duggan comes in and does a line and showed that he had no future in acting. Then again, if you watch Duggan wrestle, you'd think he had no future there either. So a little cheap shots here from Meltzer. Tell everybody the storyline here with Dusty and Sapphire and this mysterious benefactor. Miss Sapphire, Miss Sapphire, you in there? David, David, the American Dream, Dusty Rose. Hello, Miss Sapphire. Why ain't you there? Hello, baby, listen, listen. They looking for you for your match with Miss Sharon. I understand she whooped your ass in the shower not long ago. Where you at? Bitch, get out the fucking room. Let's go. Yeah, um, the storyline all throughout was that, uh, Miss Sapphire was being lured to the other side by that devious, nasty, despicable million dollar benefactor or the million dollar man, Ted Debussy. And I thought it was a fun little story, man. In real life was, uh, was Juanita Wright not enjoying her run. What's the, why's the decision to sort of phase her out here? It wasn't phasing her out. It was pretty good with DiBiase and it was just something that, uh, from the standpoint of we've done a lot that we could do with Dusty, and it was a way another personal issue that Ted DiBiase taken the common woman away from the common man and manipulate her with money. It's an age old adage. Everybody's got a price for the million dollar man. It is pretty interesting. Um, that this is going to be sort of the end of the Sapphire deal. I mean, I know you say that, oh, well, she's with DiBiase and she is briefly. We, we see a lot of vignettes of her ironing his money. She's doing favors for him and she's going to leave the company. Not too terribly long after Virgil does an interview in the WWF magazine, all done in kayfabe and says the reason she left is because DiBiase took all his gifts back, but I think she did or Sherry Martell did a, a shoot interview once where she says that Sapphire's admiration for Rhodes was legitimate to the point that she broke down crying when the office told her they were going to break her and dusty up on screen. And after that, she sort of lost interest and that's the reason she wound up moving on. Is that the way you remember it? Sapphire was tired. She was tired of being on the road and it took its toll on her 
to the point that she just was not happy being on the road all the time. I don't know that she was happy with Dusty either. It's just it was a lot of wear and tear. Sapphire was up there in years and just didn't want to do it anymore. Couldn't really do it anymore. It's a shame. I, I loved Sapphire. I, I know everybody piles on and says, oh, it was a rib and blah, blah, blah. But I'll be damned if they didn't make it work. I don't think Sapphire ever did anything to get ribbed and uh, have to, you know, I, I get it. They think that uh, she was put with Dusty to rib her and um, and things like that. But uh, no. Let's talk about uh, the next match. It's Warlord pinning Tito Santana in five minutes and 28 seconds with a power slam. This feels just like filler to me. Meltzer says Tito worked really hard to carry this to a worthless match. Warlord is a monster, but completely useless. Gives it a dud rating. This just feels like a waste of time to me. I think the rumor once upon a time was it was originally supposed to be Tito Santana versus Rick Martell, which would have made a lot of sense. The former tag team partners, but Martell has pulled off the show a few weeks prior because he's got an injury. And the storyline reason is he's got a modeling obligation in France. Do you remember this being the original plan? It was supposed to be Martell and Tito, but Martell was hurt. Big modeling opportunity in French. Uh, yeah, it, it just, the whole Martel Tito was a natural, just based off of their former relationship and the work style. Those guys could absolutely go, and that's an, that's an easy match and an easy angle. And Rick being hurt, had to have something for this, and, um, you know, by God, you got the warlord. Some people say, good God, look at his arms. Oh God. The next match is a two out of three falls match for the world tag team titles. It's demolition defending against the heart foundation. And this is actually a rematch from the very first SummerSlam back in 88, where demolition beat heart foundation on the March 31st superstars. The heart foundation challenged the WWF tag team champions after WrestleMania and the Hart Foundation would face the Rockers on April 28th, Saturday night's main event, number 26, where demolition would interfere and cause a double DQ. Fast forward to the July 14th superstars and demolition and the Hart Foundation are going to fight after the Hart Foundation claims demolition has three members, and this is an evidence of cowardice. The following week, a match between the teams was scheduled for SummerSlam, and the stipulations are... It's two out of three falls and only two members of demolition will be uh, allowed at ringside. Of course, that leads to the match here. I can't believe this is real, but the heart foundation captured the WWF tag team titles from demolition in a two out of three falls match. And here's what Meltzer has to say. The hearts have new gay looking ring outfits that look to be designed by Michael Jackson. My God. Uh, the, God, how can he even say, I mean, uh, but think, think about that. Th- think about that comment that Dave Meltzer said. And I mean, what is that even supposed to mean? That's disgusting. But go. I, I don't, I don't get it either. Uh, this was the best match you of the show. Subscribe to him. Yes. So you say dumb shit sometimes too. You don't subscribe to me. Motherfucker. I don't I, lie to you. I subscribed to you before anybody. I was subscribing to you and nobody was. I don't want to hear that. I was your first subscriber. Yeah, well, okay. But I've never lied to you. I don't lie to our listeners. Oh, God. You've lied on this show so many times. Nope. You're going to tell me that whole Booker T, Triple H thing? Just, I mean, let's move on. Uh, Meltzer would say this was the best match of the show both for the plot of the match itself and mainly for the ring work of Bret Hart. The first fall saw crush pin Bret after the backbreaker elbow drop finish at six minutes and 18 seconds. The second fall saw the heart foundation do the heart attack on smash, but crush jumped on the ref for the DQ in 328. And the third fall saw ax who was banned from ringside run and hide under the ring. Then ax and smash switch places. And they did a few more switches. Hey, these guys aren't exactly the twin devils. 
Anyway, the Legion of Doom comes down to ringside and pulls the guy hiding under the ring out. A melee ensues with Brett pinning Crush with a schoolboy in four minutes and three seconds, three and a half stars. Dude, do you want to talk about great tag team eras? 1990, my gosh. Rockers, Power and Glory, LOD, Heart Foundation, and oh yeah, Demolition. All- y, y los emelos diablos. Uh, is that twin twin devils? See, si. what'd you think of the match here? This is a, a guilty pleasure. I, I love the heart foundation. I love demolition. I love this free bird thing. They're trying as a kid. This is really one of the more prominent spots. You would see the road warriors It's the first pay-per-view they've done with you guys. I absolutely ate this up. Thought it was tremendous. Uh, I thought it was excellent. And I thought that, uh, it, it was fun. I forgot about the the finish on this. And I just thought it was superbly done because you had five guys that really loved to work with each other and had a very snug style. Everybody in there, they worked tight and Brett, Neidhart, Barry, Crush, Edie. Good Lord, man. They, they were tremendous. And I thought it was a great, great match. A lot of, uh, talent in the ring here. We know that, that Axe is probably looking to do some other stuff, smashing and, and crush are doing their thing here. Do you think the demolition thing is sort of petering out here by the summer of 90? I mean, they've been a top team for a long time, but it's not going to be too long before we reshuffle the deck and everybody looks totally different. Yeah. I mean, it was, was what it was and Demolition, I think that they had solidified their place as kind of like the top tag team in, in the industry at that point. And then you, you look at uh, the Hearts coming in. We had some great tag teams during this run. The next match is Bad News Brown and Jake Roberts. As we mentioned, this is going to be one of Bad News' last shows. Uh, this whole feud begins when Jake sends. Uh, bad news, a birthday present on the April 22nd wrestling challenge. Upon opening the package, Brown finds a rubber snake to which he reacts with horror on the May 5th superstars. They agree to a match. Brown later stated that his fear of snakes was cured. And that was quickly proven wrong on the July 28th superstars. A match between Brown and Roberts was scheduled for SummerSlam with big boss man as the special guest referee. And bad news said that he would bring 200 pounds of Harlem sewer rats to counteract Damien. So we've got Jake and bad news here. They're going to go to a DQ, uh, in, uh, four minutes and 43 seconds. Meltzer would say funny. The bad news did two leg drops during the match. It's supposed to be a no, no to use someone else's finisher. Bad news hit Jake in the ribs with the chair for the DQ. Then he goes to leg drop Damien, but the boss man made the save. Uh, news attacked boss man and Jake pulled out Damien and chased bad news away. The 200 pounds of ghetto rats, which was the only buildup was th- that was based upon this match never came into play. I'm, I'm kind of thankful for that, by the way, Bruce, thanks for not bringing out 200 pounds of rats. What'd you think of the match? This is old school, classic WWF stuff. Pretty, uh, pretty straightforward and simple. But it was pretty straightforward and simple. Not, you know, going back and watching it, it was slow motion. Not the not the greatest match in the entire world. But I had fun during the time with the with the sewer rats. You know, it started out with a big cage full of rats. Then we went to ah man, that's they're just rats. To we need bigger rats and. Then we went to possums, which are just big rats. And oh boy, those were some interesting times to say the least. Uh, next up, as we know, bad news is going to leave the, leave the company. And, uh, I alluded to it earlier. You didn't comment on it, but it's been said that Vince told him he was going to become the first WWF world champion of, uh, African-American descent. 
Was that talked about making bad news? The first black champion. Had you ever heard that? I had never heard that. And again, I go back to, I could absolutely hear Vince saying I could see you as WWE champion at one point, but I have never heard Vince say, look, I promise you, this is, we're going to make you the, the champion. Um, I've heard him lay out, Hey, we're thinking about doing this, no promises and it could or could not happen. So I think a lot of times, most times talent hear what they want to hear. After bad news winds up leaving, Akeem is putting his spot on the house show tours. So it'll be Akeem and Jake around the loop. And, uh, they're still billing the matches as Harlem street fights, which say what you will. Next up, we've got uh, bro. Is familiar with Harlem. Oh, of course. Yeah, he's a one man gang. Yeah. Uh, next came brother love with Sergeant slaughter. Meltzer would say this was reminiscent of the classic brother love with Morton Downey and Roddy Piper from WrestleMania in the way it dragged and how bad it was. Slaughter said things that should have gotten heat, but didn't. They're going to have a harder time with this guy than I thought, at least from the reaction here, the segment was a bomb. What do you remember about this? Well, I remember that again, uh, some people's opinions and views are completely worthless. Uh, I thought this was the greatest thing on the card and come on, man. Why are you being like that? You know, it wasn't the best thing on the card. Says who? Well, anyone watching. That's not true. Sergeant Slaughter was awarding a great American an award. And it was very touching. And by God, it was nice to be on SummerSlam. You still have the uh, Great American Award, don't you? Yes, I do. You think you got that handy and we could get a picture of that online somewhere? I'll put a picture of that online somewhere. I have to find it. Um, Because I I don't know where the hell I have it right now. It may be out there somewhere. I've had had Dr. Tom in my house going through all of my shit for the last week. So I have no idea where anything is or what the hell's left. Is he still there? He is still here. You know, what's funny is I, I came up with an idea for him yesterday and I pitched some guys in the office and they all loved it. And I was thinking, man, I should text Bruce about that. I was like, ah, I'll bring it up when we're talking on the show, but I thought we would do it off air, but, uh, I'm going to text you about an idea I have for Tom. See what you think. And well, you better do it. He's only here another day. I'll make it happen fast. Hey, I do want to talk about something else here. Since we're talking about brother love, there's like a postcard that I actually got from a listener. Once you and I started doing the show, it says greetings from Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love, but they scratch out the L Y and it just says the city of brother love. And it's got, you know, some, some stuff downtown in the background. And then there you are all swagged out with 48 rings. What was the, what was the, the gist of this? I, I'm, I'm not sure. Like, was this something that came to try to get you to order the pay-per-view or some sort of a coupon about getting a pay-per-view? You've told me before, I think that they gave it to, uh, people who worked in the building. What do you remember about this? No, this was, this was the pay-per-view reminder card that went out in all the cable systems. And so when you got your cable bill, you also got the postcard reminding you of SummerSlam coming up and be sure and order SummerSlam. So that would go out to all the cable subscribers. And by the way, it says Monday night, August 27th, 8 PM. Eastern 5 PM Pacific replay, 11 PM. Eastern 8 PM Pacific in a steel cage match. The WWF champion ultimate warrior trademark versus challenger ravishing Rick rude trademark with manager, Bobby Heenan, plus the return of Hulk Hogan trademark with tugboat in corner versus earthquake trademark with Dino Bravo trademark in corner. And you've got little pictures of uh, headshots of the warrior and uh, Hulk Hogan, both doing their best, their best constipated pose. This is, uh, interesting for a variety of reasons. I've always been fascinated with the way you would market your pay-per-view products and things like that. How far in advance would, would you have to have this to the cable systems in order for them to deliver this with the bills? They would have gotten it in May or June or something like that. No, for something like that, probably about a month ahead of time, six weeks. And it's also interesting that the show's on a Monday night. 
these days we're all conditioned that wrestling pay-per-views are Saturday or most of the time Sunday, but Monday night, you guys were very much experimenting. Of course, in this era, survivor series was usually on a Thursday night, but a Monday night pay-per-view nuts. I know what's the thinking. Back how, some how, of those and go, what the hell is that before you guys really identified your quote unquote best practices, or did you have research that said, no, Monday night is the right time or, or whatever. I think that we were still in the experimental stage of trying to figure out when, you know, when the best time was, and we weren't looking at, you know, for summertime, you didn't have to deal with kids in school. So you didn't have to worry about a weekday, but I think as time wore on, it was better to have one specific day that could be that pay-per-view day you could really promote to. Talk to me about, you know, when obviously slaughter is going to come back. I think after WrestleMania six, um, slaughter sends a, a letter to Vince saying he wants to come back and you guys come up with some sort of idea about, all right, we're going to do something, but this whole invasion situation in, in, in real life with Kuwait happens in August of 1990. So it's not like he came back explicitly with this idea. What was the original creative or hope with Sergeant Slaughter when he comes back here? I think that originally the idea was one of, from Sarge's point of view, probably come back as a baby face, but deep down, you know, Sarge really loved being a heel character and he played the heel character so well, you know, maggot. It was, it was easy to do and it was a lot of fun to do. So, uh, Sergeant Slaughter is, is the heel Sarge to me is, is a win-win every time. Then when you were able to add in the real life, uh, Iraq situation, which I don't know is, is good or bad. Uh, in the beginning it was all right. Hey, great. We've got something to sink our teeth into. And then later on it was, oh, wow, this is too much. So in, in the beginning, I think a heel Sarge was, was the right way to go. Was the, um, the original idea going to be, he's going to turn his back on America because he's, they've accepted the former Russian heel. And now, you know, he's a baby face with Nikolai. It was so easy. Yeah. I mean, it was so easy. How could you love a Russian? And how could you love someone that's done all these nasty things to our country that I fought for? So that turn in and of itself was easy. And then later on to get into Hogan, who represented everything that was red, white, and blue, it wrote itself. Well, up next, we've got Nikolai Volkov and Jim Duggan taking on the Orient Express. Uh, Nikolai would be begin the year partnered with Boris Zukov. They were known as the Bolsheviks, uh, after Lithuania Volkov's homeland declared its independence from the Soviet union on March 11th, 1990, the Bolsheviks split up hilarious Volkov became pro America and was presented with the American flag by Jim Duggan. And now they form a team. Uh, they go three minutes and five seconds with the Orient express. Uh, they pick up the win when Doug and pins Pat Tanaka after a clothesline that missed, it gets negative one star in the observer Meltzer would say the match was worth negative one star. Duggan and Volkov singing was worth a negative star, but I added a star for Tatanka's great bump from a move that completely missed at the finish. If they keep Duggan and Volkov together, they'll have the worst tag team in the business. What'd you think of the match and Meltzer's write up? Well, here's, here's the thing. You guys said that mine was the worst thing on the show a minute ago. And now this is the worst thing on the show. I, y'all got to make up your mind. Just saying. This stunk. This absolutely stunk. Really bad. And I felt, felt kind of sorry for old Pat Tanaka. And yeah. It wasn't great. Wasn't great. It was it was really really the shits, as a matter of fact. The next match is Dusty Rhodes and Randy Savage. We touched on the background for their feud earlier, you know, with the whole Sherry Sapphire match. 
Uh, Savage is going to pin Dusty in two minutes and 15 seconds. Meltzer says the whole King gimmick for Savage seems to be done away with. As the match started, Ted DiBiase and Virgil came to the interview area and announced that Sapphire was with DiBiase. Rhodes went up to the podium and Savage jumped him from behind in the aisle. Anyway, Sherry gave Savage the purse and Savage hit Rhodes with it for the pin. The angle may have been better if they had done the match with Sapphire in the corner and she double crossed Dusty herself, causing him to lose. And then they did the interview and that left with Dusty chasing them. Another bad match, negative one star. Yeah, but it was fun. It is fun. It is a moment, but we've seen these guys work together at WrestleMania and the mixed tag, but all around the loop. I mean, they were doing really, really well. And this feels like it's sort of the blow off in just two minutes and 15 seconds. Overall, you were happy with it. Yeah, I thought it was fun. I mean, it was a means to an end and it was a lot, an awful lot of fun to see Sapphire come out. Sapphire, Sapphire, what are you doing? All that? What are you doing that man? He's a million dollar man. That man is evil. Oh, Lord. No, what am I going to do? I love you for that. Let's talk about how we're getting to the next match. It's Hulk Hogan and earthquake as Hogan was being interviewed on the brother love show on the May 26 superstars. He's then attacked by earthquake earthquakes going to hit Hogan with a chair and then hit him with the big earthquake splash. And then Hogan was taken from the stage on a stretcher and he didn't appear on WWF programming for nearly two months. And the company's even going to tease his possible retirement. On the July 14th superstars, Hogan reveals that he is going to return against earthquake at SummerSlam tugboat is supposed to be in his corner during the match, but he's attacked by earthquake and Dino on the August 18th superstars and receives two earthquake splashes himself before being saved by his pal, the big boss man tugboat is also carried out on a stretcher and his kayfabe injuries are preventing him from appearing at SummerSlam and therefore Big boss man replaces tugboat in that role. Meltzer would say, here's the story on tugboat as best I can figure it. The TV injury angle that aired this weekend tied up all the loose ends and is the explanation. However, all inside the company publicity for not public knowledge is that tugboat is going to be at SummerSlam and at all these shows. So even though it's technically just an angle, it was not an angle planned out far in advance. Word is the tugboat's quick rise to stardom swelled his head and Vince was giving him an attitude adjustment and at the same time, building a grudge for tugboat versus earthquake matches in the fall tugboat is still with the company, but not making any dates, nor will he be at SummerSlam. In addition, boss man has been pulled as the special guest referee in the Roberts Brown match, which again shows that this is late improvising and not part of the original master plan. This is something I hadn't read before that tugboats quick rise to stardom swelled his head and Vince is giving him an attitude adjustment. You've told us before that maybe one of the original ideas was chic tugboat. Talk to me a little bit about what really happened here and why tugboat wasn't here at SummerSlam. Well, what really happened is we got into Sarge and Sarge being the heel and Sarge coming in as the Iraqi sympathizer. So the focus then had to move over there as earthquake earthquake tugboat just didn't, didn't fit into that equation anymore. I can't say that I ever heard that there was whatever the hell lies Meltzer was saying there about tugboat. I've never really heard that before. Why move away from that though? Like why do the injury angle and not have him here and replace him with boss man? I don't, I don't follow the the logic if what Meltzer's saying isn't true. Well, anything Meltzer says isn't true. Um, name something that he has said that's true. Uh, let's not get down that. Here's what I'm saying. Well, you just said what? It, why, why would it be if because uh, we're saying well, you, true? You haven't given me a logical explanation as to why tugboat. The logical not here. explanation is is that the idea behind the tugboat, if you continued along that road of being Hogan's best friend. And what have you, then what do you do with him? The idea was originally he's Hogan's best friend. He turns on Hogan to go to WrestleMania. Now you're not going to do that because you have a bona fide heel in Sergeant Slaughter already made that is a better attraction 
going into WrestleMania. So you need to get rid of the other guy at this point. And unfortunately for Tugboat, that's the situation he found himself in. He wasn't getting up to par and he was a big guy, impressive son of a bitch, and one hell of a nice guy to boot. So it was an unfortunate situation for him, but that's all it was. Let's, uh, let's, I'm having trouble with the timeline, I guess, is the thing. Like, we know that Sheik Tugboat is something you've told us about before, but just this month in August of 1990 is when the whole Kuwait thing happened. By the end of the month, he's not even involved in the situation anymore. Did That's the, how fast it happens. So the Sheik Tugboat thing was pitched in, in, in weeks later. Will you decide now we're not doing that. We're going to go with slaughter. I guess that's my point. I'm trying to drill down. You knew at this point, we're going to have Hogan slaughter at WrestleMania seven. That's what you're going to build to. Yes. Okay. That's the whole reason for bringing slaughter back as a heel. It's just, you know, I know we started the show talking about him, but I just can't help, but circle back to it. If I'm looking at my most marquee match for WrestleMania seven, my first idea wouldn't have been Hogan tugboat. My second idea wouldn't have been Hogan slaughter. I would have landed on the third idea that never happened. Hogan rude. Come on, man. You got rude going in and working with warrior and getting warrior over. I know. No, I'm not saying here. I'm saying at WrestleMania. Uh, I understand that. But rude was being used to build your new champion at that point. You didn't want Hogan going after somebody that Warrior had already picked. What did Brood do at WrestleMania seven? I have no idea. Nothing. He's not even there on the go. card. We got Earthquake and uh Hulk Hogan going to a double count out. Here's what I think you should do. This was seriously. You should buy a wrestling promotion. <laughs> And you, should, and you and Dave Meltzer and Wade Keller and uh, Dave's little uh, sidekick, you can make him your world champion. And y'all all book all the shit, and, and I want you to put all that Conradison money into it and, and let Meltzer put all of his money into it in his extremely genius mind and have uh, uh, everybody come over from Japan and y'all just, uh, God, from the sounds of it, shit, he, he's a genius. So he could book and you would be printing money. You know, let me just apologize right now for being a fan of Rick rude. That's my bad. I didn't realize it was going to piss you off so bad today. I'm a fan of Rick rude too. I love Rick. Okay. Well, that, I mean, uh, you're hot about me being a fan of Rick rude. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. I'm not. Yes, you are. Not. Earthquake beats earthquake by count out. Earthquake beats earthquake. Let me try that for the third time. Hulk Hogan beat earthquake you by must count be reading out. You're the observer again. I'm not. Observer. Jesus Christ, can we fucking stop? Why are you so cantankerous about anything with Meltzer? Because I can't stand him. Then what are we going to do on the goddamn show if you're just. Being a petulant child. Well, I know I'm going to set the record straight is what I'm going to do. By the way, if you want to hear what really happened at WrestleMania seven from Bruce's side, that's available in the archives. It's a hell of a story about security issues because this Sergeant slaughter business with a terrible buy rate and ratings was just so hot. Uh, Hulk Hogan beats earthquake by count out 13 minutes and nine seconds. Hogan appeared to be 270 pounds. And at that weight looks small next to earthquake who is deceptively tall at six, six compared to Hogan six, five, given the two guys in the ring, the match was booked and worked smart, not a good match, but not a bad one either. And actually very predictable all the way through quake did earthquakes, but Hogan kicked out and did the Superman comeback foot to the face body slam, which he had failed to slam him twice earlier and then a leg drop. Jimmy Hart interferes and they both wind up outside the ring. Hogan ducked. So Hart hit earthquake with the megaphone and slammed him on the table. And then he jumped in to beat the count after the bout earthquake was choking Hogan and boss man hit quake hard three times in the back with a chair before quake would finally sell the chair and, uh, 
Quake's back was pretty cut up from that chair. Good spot there. After the match, Hogan did an interview, which basically guaranteed he would wrestle Warrior at WrestleMania two and a quarter stars. A lot to unpack here. Why a count out? Is this because you still want to do half shows with it on top? Yeah, you had Hogan and uh, Earthquake going all around the horn, wanting to protect that attraction and keep Earthquake alive here, but also be able to slide Boss Man into the that role when Hogan wasn't able to make those live events. And here you go. I am Long interested. There. Why not tugboat there? I, I feel like I'm beating the tugboat drum, but it's been established that tugboat is his best friend. What was wrong with just paying that off? And then moving forward as Hogan moves on now, uh, tugboat and earthquake could have been opponents. Instead, it looks like it's going to be boss man earthquake. Why not just well, keep the original version of tugboat in there? I think that the CDRF, uh, needs to, needs to book that match. Well, I mean, some of these guys are dead now, so that's going to be hard. Well, I don't, I think that the CDRF would, would be the perfect place for all that to happen. Well, I think you can F U C K off. Hey, that, that's rude. Well, yeah, we're talking about rude next with ultimate warrior, but slow down. You're getting ahead of yourself. After the match, Hogan does an interview where he basically guarantees he's going to wrestle warrior at WrestleMania. And I think that may have even been the original plan leaving six because the, the poster you guys released, that's pretty rare that I'm lucky enough to have one of, and I know you've got somewhere it's got the LA Coliseum and it's got a series of flags on the Coliseum, the WWF flag, the WrestleMania seven flag, a Hulk Hogan flag and an ultimate warrior flag was the original idea thinking, Hey, we'll do these guys at six and then come back with it at seven. But the buy rate was disappointing. Did the, did warriors run? Not really meet expectations. Why the pivot? Because it still feels like that's at least there there was no pivot. It was never the plan to do Hogan and warrior two. There was no pivot. You take your two biggest stars and you put them on the poster. Okay. But then the guy that thinks that he knows it all, well, this is exactly what they're doing. So the clip from Hershey can say, oh, well, they figured it all out because they had them on there. So that's exactly what they're going to do. And if they do anything different than that, then it must be a scandal. No, it's two biggest stars in the company. That's why their logos were up there. What do you think of Hogan's promo after? You didn't think that was uh, a tease for the Warrior? I think it was Hulk Hogan being Hulk Hogan and talking about what he would naturally talk about. And when you look at exactly what happened, it all comes, it all comes to fruition because it was Hogan in his quest for the WWE championship. Next up our main event, it's a steel cage match for the world title. It's ultimate warrior defending against Rick rude. We mentioned earlier how Rick beat Warrior at WrestleMania 5 for the Intercontinental title. A few months later at SummerSlam 89, Warrior would win the belt back. But this is technically the rubber match one year later at SummerSlam 90, but not for the mid-card belt, for the big belt. And leading up to the match, as we said, Rick has cut his hair. We see all these great training vignettes with Rick and his manager, Bobby Heenan. You told us about shooting those in Tampa before. Believe it or not, this is Rick Rude's final pay-per-view match. His final record is six, four, and one. He's zero and two at the rumble. He's two zero and one at WrestleMania. He's one and two at SummerSlam and three and zero at survivor series. Of course, we know he's going to wind up coming back in 97 after a successful run in WCW and briefly appearing in ECW. And we've done a whole show on Rude in the archives, really a tremendous show. Go out of your way to check it out. You can get it ad free over at adfreeshows.com. The match itself sees the ultimate warrior keep the WWF title, beating rude in the cage in 10 minutes and one second. Meltzer would write warrior had the complete face paint back on and a different hairstyle once again, to make him look nothing like Kerry Von Erich. No matter what anyone says, the company is obviously unhappy with how he's getting over when they make these weekly changes in his look and character. 
They both juiced within three minutes to get the cage gimmick over, but the match was really slow paced until the end as they had to pace themselves for the long match. Rude came off the top of the cage. What a spot that was in 1990, but didn't try, didn't try to escape as Bobby Heenan went berserk. Rude came off near the top of the cage a second time, but warrior punched him. Then warrior tried to escape at seven minutes. He didn't hits him with the cage door. The finish would see warrior do the Superman come back three clotheslines and go over the top for the win. Two and a half stars as a little kid, man. I love this. I love the way warrior was slinging the belt around over his head. Uh, and I even liked the idea that Bobby Heenan was furious that rude didn't just finish the climb over because this would have been the first time that somebody in Heenan's quote unquote family was world champ. And I guess that could have even been a tease that there was going to be some sort of split down the road between Heenan and Rick rude. We didn't see that exactly. what do you think of the match watching it back? I thought that look, as far as warrior matches, it has to be in the top five and rude always was able to get a lot out of ultimate warrior and be able to carry him to a decent match. And in this case, it was no different. It was a good match. It was a different style match for warrior. And you believed that, Hey, warrior I mean, our uh, rude is good adversary for the ultimate warrior. And I can believe that rude could beat him. So that, that to me is what made the match so good and that you looked at it and you believed it and felt that, uh, it just wasn't somebody in there for warrior to beat. It's remarkable to think that this is really it for rude here with the company. I mean, he is on a lot of the promotional materials for survivor series, but he winds up being replaced by Haku. Do you think that the big dispute ultimately just came down to, I mean, Jr. famously says it's all about cash or creative. Was he unhappy with his SummerSlam main event payoff? Was he not happy with the creative of not being put in, into one of those spots? What really is the root of his unhappiness that, that leads to him leaving? It's been rumored that it's all about the paycheck he got for this particular match. I think it's a combination of both. I don't think that Rick liked being second fiddle in, and that's my words, not his, but from the standpoint of not being the top heel and having everything focused around him, Rick really wanted to be the guy. And also it comes down to money and, uh, for Rick Rude, Rick kind of felt that, and I'm, I can't really argue this in, in a lot of ways is that Rick felt he brought warrior to that point and then took the next step with warrior to, to get him over even stronger to the audience. So he felt that he should have been paid equally, if not more than what the warrior was making now how anybody knows what anybody else is making. I think a lot of times that's just speculation and hearsay and innuendo. And I wouldn't put it beyond any of the boys to stir that pot. Oh, so-and-so made this when they never really know or have any clue whatsoever. And I think that a lot of those factors played into Rick leaving and just being fed up to the point where he said, okay, I want to move on. In real life, Rick Rude and Bobby Heenan were not exactly best of friends. I'm not saying they disliked each other, but it's been written over the years that Rude probably would have preferred to have just been by himself and not with a mouthpiece. He didn't think he needed that. And And that that was perpetuated uh, a lot by Warrior, who felt that Bobby, in their matches stole their heat and stole their reaction by Bobby doing what Bobby always did. And that was help enhance the match. I guess my question is who, who is sort of Rick Rude's? who can he confide in here and get little big brother advice? Does he have any, I mean, it's not like he can call Bob. I mean, I guess he could, but if they're not really close anyway, he's not going to call and say, Hey man, what should I do? I mean, does he have any sort of, friends in the company to sort of bounce things off of in this era. Yeah. Kurt Hennig. His friend of his and, and Rick had 
you know, different friends all all over the business. Percy Pringle being one of them. So yeah, Rick Rick would confine in other guys, but Rick was also his own man. Rick was a man's man. It's just remarkable to think that after such a, a bright spot in the company, he's not long for this. And it, it definitely felt like he had tried to recreate himself to your point with these training vignettes and the new look and the change in his hair and the whole deal. And he gets the main event spot. And I guess it's be careful what you wish for, because he's not with us much longer. I love this show. This is the first SummerSlam I remember watching live. Uh, I was so excited for this particular show. It was a, a big deal of my wrestling fandom as a kid. So this is uh, one of the more important SummerSlams to me. Where do you rank this SummerSlam to you? Well, again, selfishly, because I was on it, I, I did love to perform and being on a pay-per-view still was special at that time. So for me, it ranks up there. And being a part of the Sergeant Slaughter stuff, that was a lot of fun. And so for me, selfishly, yeah, it's it's up in my top five because – not only was I a part of it, but there was also some good story in the card and going through and reminiscing that was, was a lot of fun. Scale of one to 10, what would you give this one? Scale of one to 10. Yeah. 10 being the best. I, I'd say a solid seven and a half, eight. I think so too. I mean, just because of the nostalgia, I don't know. It just takes me back in time. I'm not going to say the quote unquote in ring work, the matches, but the actual characters and storylines were just larger than life. And it is a bit of a departure. You know, this is the second pay-per-view now in WWF history that doesn't end with Hogan must pose. Was that a little weird for you? I mean, Hogan's in the, at least in the last match in the main event at WrestleMania six, was it weird to have a pay-per-view? And I know they're both on the poster and featured prominently both Hogan and warrior, but is it still a little weird to end a WWF? pay-per-view and Hogan's not doing the big pose down. Believe it or not, not really. It, it was, it was different. Definitely different, but you know, we were looking at times changing and, and having to do different things. So you just accepted it and moved on. ABC seven seventeen wants to know. Is it true Shawn Michaels was injured in a motorcycle accident prior to the event, and that's why he was attacked in the aisle? I, I think that is what happened to him, yes. Yeah. Uh, Rajiv wants to know, why did some wrestlers get an entrance and others didn't? Was this just to better time the show, or was there another reason? No, it's just a timing thing sometimes, and it's just the flow of the show. Lots of people love the open of this particular pay-per-view. Uh, and they love just the, the opening video packages of pay-per-views in this era. Who was putting those together for you in this era? We know years later, it's going to be Sahadi, but probably not 90, right? God, I think that, uh, that I might've done this one, which is the, the edit one crew. Wow. So uh, probably would have been Kevin Dunn and Quinn and Larry. Sydney wants to know, was there any discussion of sweet Sapphire being aligned with anyone else after DiBiase? No, because we knew that it was a way to get Sapphire out and let her get back to her life. Sapphire was never going to be a long-term character for us. Uh, William Helms wants to know why has WWE never brought back the blue bar cage, the old big blue cage. Because it hurts. <laughs> well, let me just freestyle that damn elimination chamber. Probably don't feel that great. No, it hurts too. It's brutal. It's better than it was. Holy shit. It was like, can we just work on concrete instead? I love you for that. Adam has an interesting question. He says, what was the reaction to Roddy Piper pointing out multiple times that Rick Rude should have won the match? I mean, is this sort of what you were talking about that he's not getting the talent over because it does feel like Roddy was really harping on the fact that Rick Rude could have already won, but he didn't. And I don't know if it was a heel commentator, maybe he wouldn't have been doing that, you know, but he was in his way. That was getting warrior over. Okay. 
Charlie Thrower wants to know who made those sweet jackets that the Hart Foundation wore to the ring. I'm guessing that Michael Jackson, which was Dave that Meltzer's was, guess, was probably not accurate. Uh, no. Well, M- Meltzer made other derogatory comments towards those jackets as well. That would have been probably Julie Youngberg and her sister Terry. Uh, somebody wants to know where did Hercules get the chain that injured Shawn Michaels? The chains are us. Lots of people are uh, annoyed at the Ultimate Warrior swinging the the WWF title around. They want to know what you thought of his "quote unquote" disrespect of the championship. You know, I'm I'm never crazy about it. I think the championships are something to be coveted and treated special. So I, I've never been a fan of anybody to do it, even Rock and Steve, when they would walk walk to the ring and kind of throw the belt in and things like that. However, it was during that era that I eased up on it because I thought it was from Steve's point of view, it was one of, Hey, I'm the champion. Here's, here's the championship. This is what we're fighting about. Let's, let's start to fight. It was, it was different. Um, I don't know. Everybody's different. I, I just was not ever really a big fan of it. Chusler 1976 wants to know why didn't Legion of Doom wrestle on the show? Surely they, their pay-per-view debut would have been a big draw. Probably would have been, but they, you know, one time. C Spanta has an interesting question. He says, this is the first SummerSlam of the world title match. Even 91 would be a special attraction tag match with warrior Hogan. Is there a reason why summer slams were typically tag team main events with the champ involved early on? The, it, you know, early on, it was a different attraction and kind of looked at well, like the first one in general was, Hey, this is going to be a one-off. So it's got to be different than WrestleMania and everything else that we're giving you on a national basis. Mike Eldridge wants to know, can Bruce tell the story of the origin of the blue steel cage and why Vince was such a big fan of it? The origin of it in general was dates back to Bruno and the Sheik and having a big cage that they were able to work with to escape and that made it easier to climb where a cyclone fence is not the easiest thing in the world to climb as we've seen over the years. Uh, Ben green wants to know why was anvil never given an intercontinental title run? Was he not viewed as being reliable as a singles guy? Cause he never won the championship match. (laughs) And and on that note, we'll wrap things up. Ladies and gentlemen, SummerSlam 1990 is in the books. We're so grateful that you stopped by and had a little fun with us. Uh, Stay tuned. You can get these shows early and ad free over at adfreeshows.com. I've got some bonus shows headed your way as well. Next week, we'll be back with The Rocks 1999 and 2000. Until next time, he is at Bruce Pritchard. I am at Hey Hey, it's Conrad, and we are out of time. We'll see you next week right here with The Rocks 99 2000 on something to wrestle with Bruce Pritchard. Did you say rock? Rock on! That was lame. I'm glad you're awake now. Enjoy your English. Oh, yeah, well, why don't you go? Why don't you go get busy on the old C D R F? If you think I'm not going to have t-shirts That's the for Conrad that. Dave wrestling federation. What about Alvarez? I thought you wanted Alvarez involved. Yeah, he can go under any, he can be under the F. Okay. All right. Goodbye, Bruce.